May I have your attention, please? Can everyone please find their seats? We are going to begin the program. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum organized by KS Relief, the King Salman Humanitarian Aid and Relief Center. Thank you for prioritizing humanity by choosing to be here today. We are going to begin our program now. If everyone can please find their seats. Everyone, please find your seats. The program is going to begin now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for prioritizing humanity by choosing to be here today. This room is full of humanitarian leaders, donors, practitioners, researchers, journalists from all over the world, a convening of some of the brightest minds in your fields. In an increasingly polarized world, thank you for choosing to come together setting aside any differences and engaging in dialogue with a commitment to finding solutions to some of the world's most pressing humanitarian issues. Some humanitarian crises are the unfortunate byproduct of politics, manufactured by people. Others, a result of natural forces far greater than us. The recent earthquake devastating Turkey and Syria has brought into sharp focus some of the challenges we need to address together during this conference. How to build capacity, how to improve data collection mechanisms to get accurate numbers in disaster zones, how to streamline multilateral efforts to alleviate suffering, how to keep the world from falling into a pattern of crisis fatigue and turning away when the afflicted are most in need. In the news media, we're often guilty of perpetuating doom and gloom, focusing primarily on the problems and not the solutions. But sometimes we find the stories of hope, like the smiling baby bathed and fed after being found in the rubble, surviving the unimaginable. In the face of disaster, always look for the helpers. That's each and every one of you. And your work gives the world hope. It is my pleasure to introduce our first panel today. We're going to be focusing on the evolving humanitarian landscape for 2023 and beyond the state of the humanitarian systems, challenges of 2023, and a look into the future. This panel will be moderated by Juliet Foster, and it's my pleasure to introduce her now.
Thank you very much for that introduction. Can I ask you please to take your seats because we are running slightly behind schedule. We have quite a lot of ground to cover. So please do take your seats so that we can actually get proceedings going. But um, Susanna has very kindly introduced me. She's also told you about the session, the panel that I will be chairing. But what I want to do now is to briefly take you back to December last year. Now, December last year is when the Global Humanitarian Overview, or the GHO, was launched in three cities. Those cities were Geneva, Riyadh, and Addis Ababa. Now, I was lucky because I was invited to the kingdom for the launch, and not only did I meet some extraordinary people, many of whom are with us here today, but I also had the opportunity to witness the energy drive and commitment that led to the GHO initiative. Can I just be clear as well, can you all hear me? Because there's been a slight adjustment to the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, so <laughs> I think that means that I need to speak a bit louder, is that correct? Okay, well, I, th I think you can hear me, so that, that's good. But um, let me go back to what happened in December, because as I said before, everyone who spoke that day, they spoke with passion, eloquence, and optimism. Now, if you're a cynic, you might ask, what was there to be optimistic about? And it is a reasonable challenge or a reasonable question, given the many challenges that humanitarians are actually facing. This year, 339 million people in 69 countries will require assistance, and that in itself is an increase of 65 million compared to the same time a year ago. Now, the cost of helping these people, many of whom will be displaced internally or externally through conflict, climate change, and a scarcity of resources, has been put at $51.5 billion. So, going back to the original question, what was there to be optimistic about? Well, the good news is that more people are being reached with aid and humanitarian assistance. The UN and its partner organizations set a goal of helping 216 million people through 35 country plans and eight regional plans. And this equated to an 18% increase in the original number of people targeted for help at the beginning of 2022. Now, of all those targeted at country level, 157 million, we're talking 79%, actually benefited from at least one form of aid in the year. Now, I can give you plenty of other reasons why we should be optimistic, but let's save that for the panels which will happen today and tomorrow. But the real point is that change is happening. However, there is no room for complacency. The outlook for 2023, as we heard, is challenging, and innovative methodologies are necessary to deal with the growing number of crises. And that means bringing vulnerable communities on board as stakeholders, giving them a voice in strategies that will lead the way to a better future. It also means finding and engaging with new and current partners, regardless of whether they're from the private sector, governments, or foundations. It also means addressing the funding gap so that when disasters happen, everybody gives their fair share rather than those with the biggest pockets actually picking up most of the tab. Contributions should not be influenced by geopolitics or the view that perhaps some victims are more deserving of help than others. No matter where they're from, be it Turkey, Syria, Haiti, Pakistan or Ukraine, they are everyone's responsibility. So, honoured guests, I ask you to hold those thoughts, which will be explored in due course. But before then, we will be hearing, hopefully in a few moments, from His Excellency Mr. Adel Judbert, who is the Saudi Minister for Foreign Affairs. He's going to give us our keynote address of this session. And afterwards, we will then dive into the panel, The Evolving Humanitarian Landscape in 2023 and Beyond. Just a heads up, that panel is divided into two parts. Many of our panelists is here, can I say, it's wonderful to see you, some familiar faces there amongst the crowd, always very, very welcoming. So can I confirm that our keynote speaker is actually here? Is our keynote speaker here? He is here, it's wonderful, it's good to see you, so can, so can you please give a big warm welcome to His Excellency Adel Judea for that keynote speech. Excellency, the stage is now yours. If you would care to join us, please come and join us and please welcome him for that keynote speech.
Good morning, everybody. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with you today for this very important event. I just want to make my comments brief and say a few words about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, contributions and commitment to humanitarian assistance and to working with international institutions and in particular United Nations institutions to try to alleviate the suffering of many people around the world. The uh, issue of charity is not new to us. It is part of our faith and it is incumbent upon us to help those who are less fortunate. Saudi Arabia has a long history of uh, exceeding United Nations goals for the percentage of uh, developmental assistance it provides to uh, less developed countries. We have in the past uh, exceeded that number by, by several factors, the 0.07%. Uh, in, 19, in 2021, Saudi Arabia was the number one donor to uh, less developed countries in the, in the world. We uh, provided over $7 billion of humanitarian assistance, most of it through uh, international organizations such as those represented here, and mainly also through the King Salman Center, um, which has uh, operations in over 88 countries. We, uh, try to uh, uh, ensure that the assistance that the kingdom provides uh, has transparency and that there is uh, oversight to make sure that we minimize any kind of uh, uh, waste or administrative expenses and focus on getting the maximum amount to those who uh, need it. And so we, uh, we welcome all of you to Saudi Arabia and we look forward to broadening and deepening our relationship with you. I think the uh, world is changing. Um, we uh, know that the priorities are changing in terms of uh, the areas that need uh, assistance and support. Uh, we look at the situation that we're facing with regards to climate change and the devastation that that has wreaked on a number of countries, including the recent flooding that we saw in Pakistan, which resulted in uh, damages to more than 30 million people. The, uh, we saw the issue of food security that has caused tremendous hardships across the world. And we uh, are trying to work with our partners and our friends and organizations such as yours to see how best we can not only provide for the assistance that is required, but how can we anticipate problems before they emerge so that we have a, uh, the ability to manage them or hopefully avoid them from happening in the, uh, in the first place. So anyway, I said I would not speak very long and here I am talking forever. I will try to stop here and I hope that uh, during the um, conversation I can, be, I can address more specific issues that you would like me to address. I could have gone into what we're doing in the African continent. I can go through what we're doing in terms of um, issues involving climate, in terms of food security, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, the list is very long, unfortunately. Um, but what is fortunate is that there is a, a realization and a commitment among the international community and among donor countries that we have to work together in order to uh, deal with these challenges that we face. And it is not only uh, doing it for the sake of charity, because that's not what it is. It is doing it for our own sake. We inhabit a very small planet, and what happens in one part of the planet has an impact on the rest of the planet. And if we work together, as we have during the COVID pandemic, we can overcome the challenges that, uh, that we face, and we can help the maximum number of, of individuals around our planet. So I will definitely stop here, and I'd be happy to continue our conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Leighton, His Excellency, for those remarks. OK, so we can now begin our panel. Part one, in fact, of a panel, the evolving humanitarian landscape in 2023 and beyond. So please, can you welcome the panelists, 
First of all, can you uh, please show your appreciation to Dr. Abdullah Al Rabia? Now, he is the advisor to the Saudi Royal Court and Supervisor General of the King Salman Humanitarian Aid and Relief Center. So, please, could you welcome Dr. Abdullah Al Rabia? And let's sustain the welcomes and extend it to His Excellency Martin Griffiths. Martin is the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator for the United Nations. So please, sir, come and join us on the stage. Please welcome him. His Excellency the Right Honourable Andrew Mitchell MP, Minister of State for Development and Africa of the United Kingdom. It's very good to see you, sir. Please join us. And Diana Yance, who's the State Secretary to the Minister for International Development, Cooperation and Foreign Trade, Sweden. Diana, please come and join us. Diana, are you here? Excellent. Are you here? <laughs> She's just on her way. Excellent, excellent. You were hidden away. We couldn't see you. But, yeah, please, someone will guide you to your seat. It's good to see you. And let's keep it going by extending that welcome to His Excellency Mr. Yanis Lenarcic. He is the European Commissioner for Crisis Management. And finally, His Excellency Filippo Grandi, who is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Okay, so a lot of ground to cover. We had a sense of that, of course from the presentation from His Excellency and also the general overview in my opening remarks. But let me start first with you, Dr. Arabia. Somebody has to draw the short straw, and it's you today, I'm afraid. But look, so many things are happening in a humanitarian landscape, which is very complex. Is there any one particular thing that bothers you, that keeps you awake at night? Well, there are many things that uh, keep me awake at night. Uh, but uh, honestly, in the arena um, of... Uh, can I interrupt for one moment? Because apparently we, we have a few problems. Is it a little bit further down? You can't hear. No. Yeah, can, can we have our technicians on the stage, Can please? you hear me? Yeah, I just think it's amongst our, other pan our fellow panellists. They can't hear. Is that correct? Yeah. So if we can have an engineer come to the stage, please, just to... Is that better? That's fantastic. We can all hear each other. So I, I'm so sorry to interrupt you in your stride, Dr. Arabia, but you were saying in answer to my question. Well, I, will, I would say that many things will keep me awake at night, uh, but I would uh, talk about the humanitarian arena. And for me, uh, a, a small child who lost his uh, parents and his body is full of blood uh, and crying for food is something that will keep all of us uh, awake at night. A woman in tears who lost, who lost her children and spouse due to conflict, I think it will keep all of you awake at night. People shouting for help under the ruins of a building will keep us uh, awake at night. But more so, I think what keep all of us as a group is the huge gap that we are facing between the needs and the funding and also the inequity of priority that we should Pay attention to it. I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, and let's pick up on that. I'd like to know as well from the other panelists, so I'm going to throw this out. Are these concerns that you have as well? Dr. Arabia was talking about um, children wanting food, people who have got, who've got nowhere to live, they, they, they do not have shelter. But at the end of the day, the funding gap, is that the main concern that, um, that most of you, the other panelists, also share as well? Or is there a concern, for example, about compassion fatigue? It's, I, I'm throwing this out, but, but Martin Griffiths, if you'd like to pick up on that, please feel free. I think I'm, yeah, thank you. I, I, was, I was thinking exactly along the lines of Dr. Al Arabia said that the funding gap is hugely significant, and the direction of travel is going to almost guarantee that it's going to get worse. So we have a roughly a likely funding this year for humanitarian programs of probably just a little below. 50%, despite the generosity of a lot of people on, on this panel and elsewhere. And that may become even more difficult next year. What that means is that we have to engage, again, not just with 
member states and donors, but with civil society, and we need to have the passion and the activism that we see in the climate community imported into ours to give, bring back to the humanitarian enterprise the kind of ruthless passion that we have seen in the past and that we do need to see again, telling those who make decisions about money, this is money well spent. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Felipe and Diana, can you hear me? I know we have a few sound problems. Okay. Basically, what Martin and Dr. Arabia have been talking about is their concern about the funding gap. And what I'd need to know from you is, is that one of your main concerns? It's a very complex humanitarian landscape, but is it the funding gap issue that really stands out for you? So, so either of you, if you could respond, please. Uh, are you asking me to? Yes, if you wish to respond, Andrew Mitchell, please do. We have a few sound problems. We, we, we will get through this. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody, and it's uh, wonderful to be back in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, the, the, the acoustics aren't working terribly well up here, but if I've understood correctly the question, I want just to take about two minutes to make some general comments about the international system, and particularly uh, the, uh, the, the, the points we've uh, just heard um, on, my, uh, on my right here from Martin uh, Griffiths. I think that the international system and its humanitarian arm are more challenged than at any time in my political life. I've just come uh, last night late from uh, Turkey and seen the impact of the earthquake on the lives of people there, but also the international rescue effort, which seems to me to have been remarkably well coordinated on this uh, occasion with all the different elements within the humanitarian system uh, pulling their weight. So that at least is signs for optimism. But uh, more generally, we live more generally, we live uh, in a time of uh, greater nationalism, less international cooperation, but also at a time when all the major problems in the world do require more international cooperation. Whether we are talking uh, about climate change, humanitarian relief, the, uh, the challenges of migration, the challenges of pandemics, all those things require much greater cooperation across the international system and it also comes at a time when 30 years of progress from 1990 to 2020 have stalled. We finished a period of enormous humanitarian progress and over the last three years going uh, very fast backwards. Um, Covid and many other factors of international security are uh, causing that, not least Russia's appalling activity in uh, Ukraine. And also the position of women in the international community. It's impossible to understand these humanitarian crises unless we see them through the eyes of girls and uh, women. And we face limited budgets, as Martin was saying. I think I'm right in saying that across the humanitarian system, some of these uh, calls for urgent funding are only 57% uh, met. And on the other side of the coin, we also have very constrained resources, so we have to satisfy our domestic taxpayers in terms of accountability, transparency, and the efficiency of the use of their resources. And so, you know, in answer to this question, I would say there are three key things. The first is to focus on the people most at risk. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a marketplace, in a humanitarian situation where the numbers are rising, uh, to anticipate, to anticipate some of these uh, awful crises that are coming. We know all too well, for example, in the Horn of Africa, where I was before Christmas, that uh, anticipation over recent years, we've been able much more accurately to anticipate the crises before they come. And secondly, to focus on, and thirdly rather, to focus on more imaginative ways of boosting the finance so that Martin and his colleagues have the resources with which to make the system work better. So, so people most at risk, anticipation and resources seem to me to be the three most important aspects today. Thank you very much. Humans 
Ah, I've got my sound back. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. So, Andrew Mitchell, thank you there for nailing down the concerns that you have. And I'd like to get the response as well from Diana and Felipe, because I do believe that we have conquered the audio demons. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I, I would like to thank the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for organizing this conference. And uh, thank you also to KS Relief and Ocha for inviting me to this panel. Uh, um, as we heard already several of times, the humanitarian needs across the globe are constantly rising. And uh, well, last we we seen this devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and before that we had the war in well, we still have the war in Ukraine ongoing, which is not only causing a lot of suffering and destruction in Ukraine, but has also triggered a. A, a global uh, global implications so it's triggered food insecurity and uh, also contributed to this uh, cost of living crisis that are uh, affecting the poorest the worst uh, for us a major priority is to given this funding gap between the increasing needs and uh, and the limited resources one important um, priorities to, to broaden the donor base. Uh, there are too few donors in, in more or less 10%, no sorry, the 10 top donors uh, contribute with 90% of the humanitarian funding and that is just simply not sustainable. So we, we need to uh, we need to include more partners into this and more countries should follow the example of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that has in, in a few years become a, a very important international humanitarian partner. A second priority to bridge this gap is of course to increase efficiency. We need um, clearer priorities. We need a lot of flexible funding. We saw how important it was in, in Turkey and Syria. Uh, for Sweden, we uh, we are a, a core don donor, of core support, and we we see the the flexibility that provides and the importance that has for the humanitarian system to to work as efficiently as as possible. Uh, but we need more uh, we need more states and and more actors to step in to to provide this kind of core funding. Well, the third priority would obviously be also to uh, see how we can decrease these ever-expanding needs. I think uh, making sure that Ukraine wins the war will uh, be a very important contribution in that respect. It will mean that the Ukrainian farmers can yet again plow their fields and become a major uh, exporter of wheat and other products across the world. Um, but it also will, uh, w will be an important act in defense of, of it, the international uh, system and the respect for international borders, which right. I think is immensely important because if we don't have that, we will have more and more and more conflicts and more and more human suffering. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and Felipe, can I hear from you? Because I do want to expand the discussion in the time that we have available. Yes. I, um, it's a little bit odd to be in a panel where you don't understand the question, but, or don't hear the question. The but basic heard, question was, what, 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 the, is it, what are the concerns that you have? Yes, what keeps yes, you awake I heard at night? The previous speaker. <laughs> so I think I can build on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rabia, for having us here. Uh, I, uh, and uh, if the question is, on resources, yes, of course. Uh, this is a challenge, although I think we have also made progress in some areas that I think need to be flagged, like linking up better with development partners and so forth. But it is a problem. I would add one point, and I'm glad that I have the Swedish State Secretary on my right, because they are the champions of that. What we also need is not more resources, not only more resources, but more flexible resources, because the situation we as an organization faced last year is that we were well-funded in some parts of the world, say the Ukraine response, 
and terribly funded in many other parts of the world where the crises are forgotten or marginalized. So unless we have flexible funding, we cannot make those decisions and allocate resources to respond to where it is more difficult to mobilize. I want to add one more point, if I may. This is, of course, linked uh, to very protracted crises. They are the ones for which it is more difficult to mobilize resources. And in my area, the area of refugees, of displacement, unfortunately, there are many such crises. I'm, uh, and the problem is that many of them suffer from long period of time because there is no political solution. My best moments in the last few months were being in Côte d'Ivoire, where we closed, after 20 years, the refugee situation. We declared the cessation clause for refugees because a political solution was found. And I had a very good moment, I have to say, in spite of the challenges, also a couple of weeks ago when I finally managed to fly to Mekele, to Tigray, and uh, displaced people told me there is a peace agreement now. F it's far from perfect, we don't know what's going to happen, but we have a space. If you give us money to rebuild our house and to start again agricultural activities, we will go back. So a big shout out for more resources to be put where political solutions are open because that's the only way to move on from humanitarian responses to more sustainable solutions. Okay, thank you so much for that, Felipe Grande. I want to um, expand the topic by looking at humanitarian reform. And this is where, Janish, you come into the conversation because we've been talking about um, flexible funding, the problems, we've had allusions to the problems that are happening on the ground. But surely part of it is structural, because what we have is a humanitarian system which is designed to react to crises when they happen. So we agree that there needs to be a change. But if all or part of that system is reconfigured to be proactive, then what sort of transformations do we need to prioritize, given the problems that our, our panel has outlined and also things which people themselves here have witnessed on the ground as the foot soldiers? We need a voice, so. <laughs> yeah, we're going to pass along. The, oh, here it comes. Here comes a microphone. That's fantastic. In fact, if we can have some more microphones Thank in case you. the, mic the other the Well, I would fail. like, uh, first of all, to underline that the increasing humanitarian needs are not because of ineffective humanitarian aid. Uh, yes, and aid most often is response to problems created by others, I will be very blunt. We have to understand that more than 80% of humanitarian needs in the world are a consequence of conflicts, armed conflicts. So it's the failure of politics, diplomacy, and those responsible for maintenance of international peace and security, and we know who they are. It's, they are mentioned in the UN Charter. Uh, they sit in the Security Council that are obviously not doing a very excellent job at the moment because the conflicts proliferate, the old conflicts persist, we have new ones. One recent one was actually, was actually triggered by a permanent member of the UN Security Council in gross violation of the UN Charter and in violation of international peace and security for which the Security Council itself is responsible. So, it's for the humanitarians to pick up the pieces when this happens because people need help, we need to save lives, we need to alleviate suffering. Uh, the second major cause of humanitarian crisis is uh, a situation where development action is not possible because of bad governance, because of the military coup d'etat, because of things like that, because of negligence of whole swaths of country's territory. We see that in parts of Sahel, we see that, uh, for instance, in Afghanistan, where even though we found a way for development actors to address the needs of the people, the basic needs of the people, the most recent decision by the Taliban to ban women from large parts of the humanitarian work has made our work much more difficult. But yes, there are possibilities to be proactive, 
uh, to anticipate, as we say, and we try to do that, especially with regard to natural disasters that can be foreseen, like droughts, like floods, like tropical storms and the like. And we are supporting uh, efforts by our humanitarian partners who try to conduct anticipatory action, foresee what is going to happen, and help people in advance of that. Also, we have set up what we call European humanitarian response capacity, which basically is large stockpiles of humanitarian goods that we have pre-positioned in several parts of the world, including here in the Gulf, by the way. And we have used that, for instance, most recently in response to the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Okay. We have about 20 minutes left, still quite a bit of ground to cover, so let's see how far we go. But Andrew Mitchell, come into the conversation now, because there is a tendency among humanitarian agencies to consider doing more development work for various reasons, including aid conditionality as one, for example. So given that, is it perhaps time for aid agencies themselves to morph into providing basic services or development activities? Well, you'll have gathered from my first uh, uh, contribution that I don't think that uh, there should be that sort of mission creep in, in what happens. I think it's very important throughout the system that people stick to their knitting and do what they're best at and account to their funders and taxpayers for the effectiveness uh, with, of what they're doing in a very transparent way. But I, I, I do think there is a crossover, and the best example of that crossover uh, I saw for myself before Christmas in the Horn of Africa in Somalia, where uh, you see a crisis coming from a long distance away. The international community react, and they deal with the humanitarian crisis. And uh, you know, it's the Americans. Let's let's face up to the fact the Americans did the lion's share of the work in terms of feeding people who were starving in the Horn of Africa and in Somalia. And uh, as a result of that, the immediacy of a famine was uh, pushed back. But when you look at the spending in that area, what, what you see is this, that if 20% of the humanitarian spend that was being made was used to build resilience, was used to build adaptation, uh, to mitigate the next crisis, mitigation and resilience particularly, then of course the next time the same humanitarian crisis hit, there would be much greater resilience and much uh, better value for the money spent previously on humanitarian relief in terms of, uh, of building up a resilience which meant less money had to be spent again. So, so my answer to your question is we need to focus on what the different parts of the humanitarian system can do. We need to show why they need additional resources and we need to demonstrate the expertise and effect which they are putting into place on the ground, um, rather than uh, involve the sort of mission creep that your question suggested. Okay, Felipe Grandi, you, you, you want to respond to that? I could tell by your enthusiasm. <laughs> yes, but Felipe Grandi, yeah. So I, I, yeah, sure, go for it. So I, I, I could sense that you wanted to respond to that. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll just build on what Andrew just said. I think it's very important. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the again, the refugee displacement perspective. You know, I often say, and you know, my lawyer colleagues get a bit nervous when I say that, but let me say it again. I always say that the best form of protection for people that are displaced refugees is inclusion. And is inclusion, for example, in national education services, in national health services, is access to the labor market for people that are refugees and displaced. And to promote those approaches, those policies, you need developmental funding. Mm. Humanitarian funding can bring people to safety and keep them there, but then inclusion requires another type of intervention. And this cannot wait anymore for years, as we've done in the past. It needs to happen right away. And uh, even in situation of extreme emergency, this needs to be looked at. You know, the, the policy of the Ukrainian government is not only uh, to give space for humanitarian assistance to those affected by the war, but also to ensure that recovery for them starts even as the conflict goes on. 
you know, to build their resilience, as, as Andrew said about the Horn of Africa. So I think that this uh, joined up approach, which as I said many times, we should not speak anymore theoretically about because it's already happening, needs to be really looked at, built, and reinforced because it is essential for the, uh, for the sustainability of what we do in both humanitarian and development. Mm. There are quite a few themes there, in fact, um, inclusion and also the joined up approach that you reference, which takes me back to you, Dr. Al Rabia. But I want to look at those themes within the context of localization because there have been pretty numerous calls, both within and outside the aid community, to bring more actors into the sector. We're having this debate now. And you could argue that this is a, a phenomenal example of multilateralism. In other words, the decision-making process is no longer in the hands of a handful of donors. So from Saudi Arabia's point of view, what is it doing to enhance the system, also transform foreign aid, and empower those local actors? In other words, putting them at the center of things, the inclusion that Felipe was just talking about. Well, uh, thank you, Juliet. I think what you have mentioned about uh, uh, bringing uh, fewer actors and expanding the actors to be more global is something that uh, we have to look at it uh, uh, with actually support. Uh, the humanitarian community is now becoming uh, international, uh, many regions, many continents, and we used to forget the local actors and, uh, and the uh, host community and local NGOs. I think with the uh, expansion of the, of the actors from few countries who are controlling the scene uh, in humanitarian work has added value to how we look at things. And let me give you an example, which you alluded to uh, Juliet, which is uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia has invested uh, in uh, KS Relief uh, to uh, bring uh, this model to an international benchmarks. And in a few years, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, with its uh, international and regional partners and local partners, has managed to uh, bring an added value to the humanitarian uh, community. First of all, this forum is one example. And now Saudi Arabia is chairing also the Ocha Donor Group, which is also an added value. And also we have invested in the uh, host communities and, and local NGOs by building their capacities. Uh, nobody knows the needs better than the target countries or target communities. And unless you invest in those communities and try to build the capacities, invest in women, invest in youth, and try to maximize the impact of the funding. Now we have a huge gap between the funding and the need, and unless we maximize the, the impact of that work and, and uh, uh, build the capacity of, of regional and local uh, players, uh, I think we will continue to have inequity of how the, we, do we understand or deliver aid. Again, it leads me to you, Diana, talking about um, creating resilience, enhancing what we have, empowering local actors. And when you discuss that, you cannot exclude women. You touched on it earlier. But my question to you within the framework of accountability to affected populations, we know that gender equality is a crucial priority. So how should humanitarian actors better recognize and indeed respond to the needs of women and girls in this very difficult landscape? In other words, what is the shift that the aid agencies need to consider if they're going to prioritize the, the, uh, the, the needs of women? We're talking about an intellectual and approach shift effectively. Thank you. Well, women and girls' participation is central to Human, uh, humanitarian response. We heard earlier from uh, Commissioner Grande that the best uh, protection is inclusion. And women's participation makes the humanitarian response more effective. That's well established. It leads to concrete results as more equitable food distribution, better sanitation facilities, 
and quick resumption of education and livelihood uh, activities. Uh, it is also known as a fact that uh, women and girls are being disproportionately affected by humanitarian uh, emergencies uh, as victims of sexual and gender-based violence as a mean of, of conflict, for, for example. Uh, and Ukraine is a vivid and horrifying example, but it's far from, from uh, the only way or the only example. To, to be frank, I think for the time being, it's not so much of better recognizing uh, or better recognize. I, I think now the discussion is very much about holding the ground, uh, given the, the developments in Afghanistan, for instance, uh, where we see a tendency to want to exclude women and, and girls and women completely from, from being uh, part of delivering the humanitarian response. And I think even if a lot of focus has been on the edict by the Taliban that was issued around Christmas, if we go back to the earlier one, uh, the one, the ban on education, that of course will have long time consequences for, for, uh, for delivering any kind of services. If there are no women nurses or midwives or doctors or teachers, Afghan uh, w women uh, educators or health care workers, there will be no uh, education and no mm. health care for, for women or girls. So, I mean, we, w our priority now must be to push back and never accept uh, a response without women. We need response by women for women and girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in fact, listening to all this very patiently has been His Excellency Al Jubair, because obviously these, these themes, many of them are familiar to you. And from my perspective as the outsider looking in, Saudi has really taken a very important step, and a pivotal role in fact, in promoting some of the ideals that we have, have been discussing so far, particularly the role of women and empowering them in local communities, because they are key drivers, particularly when communities have suffered disasters. So what's your take on this from what you've heard so far? Sorry, I heard a lot of things, whether it involves uh, humanitarian assistance in general, whether it involves uh, donor fatigue, whether it involves mission creep, so we can address those. But on the issue of women's Algeria's is view is that uh, you cannot develop and progress as a society if half your uh, population is chained to the kitchen sink. It doesn't work. Women empowerment is very important. It leads to um, greater economic prosperity and it leads to more social stability. We are promoting this and we have been for many years. Uh, the majority of our students and universities are women because we believe education is a pathway towards uh, success. We have, uh, we're promoting recruitment of women in different sectors and different government positions and we're providing incentives in order to achieve those objectives. We, uh, in, in different parts of the world, we have uh, taken the position, made it uh, and encouraged people to be inclusive when it comes to the issue of women. We take exception with the steps that the Taliban, for example, took to ban women from attending universities. We believe that was a wrong decision as well as an unjust decision. There is nothing uh, incompatible with uh, between women's education and, and the Islamic faith, as they argue. Quite the contrary, the first sure. word that was revealed in the Quran was read, oh. read in the name of your God. So it is important that everybody has access to that. So that's on, on this issue. But I wanted to say a couple of things about what uh, the distinguished panelists mentioned in the beginning. I think there is donor fatigue. There is fatigue with mission creep. I think it's very important to focus the humanitarian efforts on helping people, period. Um, going into expanding into other areas like governance or trying to change the nature of the society or having conditionalities that go beyond transparency and beyond efficient allocation of resources really stretches things too thin and causes confusion. The objective is to fix a problem, try to uh, alleviate suffering, work together uh, in a cooperative spirit, pool resources, and then go in and help those most in need, not lecture them, not try to engage in, in social engineering or political engineering. That's the purview mm -hmm. of the areas. Focus on helping those that need help the most. 
Yes, so, so the, and that's a key point as well. Focus on helping and don't lecture effectively. Martin Griffiths, this is part of the problem, isn't it? Because one of the complaints that we sometimes hear is that, yes, the system is doing its best. It isn't perfect, but then what system is? But um, there is the accusation that those delivering the aid are sometimes guilty of not asking recipients what they want or indeed need, which probably seems a bit strange, really, doesn't it? Well, I, th I think this is perhaps the central priority and challenge that we have for defining what a priority is. It was very interesting, to me at least, that the other day when the United Nations teams, for first for many years, visited local partners in northwest Syria, the message consistently from those local partners, from the frontline Syrian organizations was, please make sure that the aid you bring here is aid that we prioritize and need and understand. And this is, this is, this is hardly surprising. Um, in all walks of life, it is the consumer who decides what is important and what is priority. Now, as Dr. Al Arabiya started this discussion, where we have uh, insufficient funds for growing needs, that conversation becomes important in terms of prioritization. But it's more important than that even. This is about respect. This is about changing the power dynamic in the relationship that we have, that the deliverers have at the front line between the humanitarian agencies and workers and all of us on this panel and those people we serve, and we say we serve rather blithely, but it is actually the fundamental, the fundamental issue for our relationship. Now, nobody should be under any illusions as to how difficult this is going to be to make this work and to make this real, but it's long overdue. It's an aspiration that all humanitarian agencies have. It's also something which many, many donors, again here present on this panel, also have. And we should be clear, if we genuinely start listening and adopting the aspirations and priorities of the local people, we will need to adapt the way we deliver assistance. It's not just listening, but it's being able to take a more a la carte approach to then delivering. And that's not simple, that's not easy, especially when the, the need for speed is so urgent, as indeed now we see in North Syria. But for me, and I know from many, many others, this is the current overwhelming generational challenge for humanitarian operations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have five minutes left, panel, so if I could ask you to be brief in your responses to my questions. So, Andrew Mitchell, following on from what we just heard, I want to look at this within the context of climate change, okay, because look, it is a huge issue, it's impacting what humanitarians are doing on the ground. My question to you is whether the system as it currently stands is properly geared up to respond to threat multipliers. They are numerous, especially when you've got countries which are in conflict and climate change is compounding the conflict and the other hybrids coming off that. Very briefly, please. Well, thank you. I think that is an extremely interesting uh, point. And I was in Niger last week where every day climate change is eroding the equivalent in terms of agricultural land of 500 football pitches. And you see very starkly there all these things we've been talking about coming together. You see uh, enormous uh, insecurity in terms of food, uh, insecurity economically, a, a region of the world that is very insecure politically. Indeed, Niger is the probably the last man standing in the Sahel. And also, all of this compounded by incredible difficulties for uh, girls and women in Niger, where 72% of all girls are married when they are 18 years old, and most of them are pregnant. So, so all these things come together. And in terms of the point you make about climate change, um, I, would, I would say that the Bridgetown agenda, in other words, trying to uh, put flesh on the bones of the COP promise this year, to 
turn billions into trillions is absolutely pivotal. I think that the Bridgetown agenda has the capacity to achieve that over a period of time. But, but, but uh, if, you, if you had a magic wand and you could produce today those trillions, you would not, I think, have enough oven-ready projects to proceed to absorb anything like that. I think the pipeline of, of, of climate change projects is not as strong as uh, it, it should be. And what you see uh, finally in Niger and Somalia is that the poorest countries have an inability to access this international climate finance and very strongly need to have access to it. They need uh, to have the experience and support to gain access uh, bureaucratically and in every way and in terms of capacity to get access to these, uh, these funds. And I think the World Bank under new leadership may well do a great deal in that space. Uh, we in Britain are doing everything we can to help uh, provide the necessary expertise to poorer countries which, which lack that access. Um, but I think in terms of, of, of making, uh, of your question and making the system work, we need to look very hard at the uh, supply of projects as well as the demand for money and how poorer countries get access to that money through building up their capacity and expertise. Okay, thank you so much for that. Let me take it back to the subject of money very, very briefly, Janusz Janacic. ODI, the famous uh, global affairs think tank, it says humanitarian assistance is the tip of a huge iceberg compared to climate adaptation, Islamic social finance, private funding, ODA remittances, all that sort of stuff. But listen, given that, very briefly, how can the aid community itself access the iceberg and not just the tip? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, several dozen billion dollars question. <laughs> Which you can answer in 30 I seconds. I have some ideas, yes. <laughs> First of all, this tip of the iceberg, as you call it, is far too narrow. I think Diana and others already spoke about it. There are too few donors out there. The 10 biggest humanitarian donors in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is one of them provide more than 80% of total global humanitarian aid. aid. That's, that's unfair. So I think that we should understand that humanitarian aid is a global responsibility, should be shared globally and equitably in accordance with the capacity of um, UN member states to contribute to it. The second uh, potential source is climate funding that you mentioned. Yes, there will be a lot of climate funding uh, available in the years to come. There already has been from the European Union uh, and its member states alone, about 25 billion US dollars per year is already made available. Uh, but I'm not saying that, you know, we should take these funds from the climate agenda and put it into humanitarian agenda. No. What I'm saying is that when we allocate the climate funding, we should not only provide funding for green infrastructure, for uh, renewable energy use and so on. These are important things, but we should not forget about people. People need to build their resilience and for that they need support and we should provide this support also with the climate funding. Like for instance, for the small farmers in the Sahel, to increase their resilience against the droughts that keep and keep repeating uh, themselves. And finally, the biggest chunk of that uh, under the surface iceberg is private funding. And when I talk to the private funds um, institutions and uh, individuals, what I see is that the one reason why they don't invest in humanitarian settings is risk. You know, capital is a shy bird, as they say, and it's uh, reluctant to go into crisis situations. So we want to show them that things can work. That's why we have launched a couple of pilot projects uh, supporting small and medium enterprises in serving the refugees, for instance, in Uganda or Jordan, or employing refugees, or investing into the water uh, systems. Uh, if we can show the private sector that it can work, that investing in such settings can work, 
I think we will be on a good way to tap more of that um, pool of funding. Okay, thank you so much for that. Now we have two minutes left because we are going to change over the panel. So the final, final question to all of you, and if I can start it from the end with you, Felipe, and then we can move it along the rest of the panel. If we meet here again in Riyadh in two years' time, what sort of um, changes are likely to be already implemented? What will you guys be telling me? Felipe, then let's move it along. If you could be brief, please. I would... I would say one is the centrality of climate action. Uh, Janis just mentioned that, and I think that will grow as a key issue. And second, if I may, we are here, and we, not, we must be grateful to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and to the King Salman Center for bringing together here lots of aid actors from this region, from the, from the GCC region. So I hope that every next Riyadh Humanitarian Forum, uh, awareness grows in this region of the importance of these themes that we have mentioned today. Nexus with development, accountability to affected population, flexibility of funding, and uh, the importance of resourcing also forgotten crises. Okay, thank you. Diana? Well, I hope we have broken this vicious circle of uh, ever-expanding needs. Uh, but I also hope that we have uh, a better response through a broader donor base. If Sweden, a country of 10 million people with no oil, can be a top donor, I'm sure more countries can, can join in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Andrew Mitchell. Uh, th uh, three things. First of all, more, uh, more financial resources. Uh, the success of the Bridgetown agenda. Secondly, greater clarity of responsibility. And thirdly, uh, an emphasis on localism and partnership and clarity of anticipation of events. Thank you. Martin Griffiths. Thank you very much. Uh, two things. Uh, first of all, that I'd hope this hall, and thank you very much, Dr. Arabia, for convening us. I hope this hall of over a thousand people in two years' time would include a third of the climate community, a third of the development community, a third of the humanitarian community, and another third, because my mathematics is so good, of the political, the solutions people. And that leads me on to my second point. I hope we see peace in Yemen. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Arabia. Well, in two years, I will probably echo solving all conflict so we have that we will be able to do that and expand donor community, government, private, and also charity, and also enhance digitalization and artificial intelligence in data collection and improve prioritization based on evidence. Thank you. Janusz Inacic. Thank you. I wish for one thing, that the funding gap humanitarian funding gap would shrink and disappear. And this can happen in two ways primarily. First, that we increase the funding available, including by attracting other donors. And second, by reducing the humanitarian needs, chiefly by preventing the conflicts and the stopping of the existing ones. Thank you very much. And the final word to you, Excellency. I hope uh, we will see more focus and we see uh, more cooperation because the challenges are huge, the resources are limited. Mm. But at least we've got some tools and some ideas to actually meet that challenge. Can you please show your appreciation to the panel for an excellent contribution <laughs> and also for conquering the sound demons. I said we would get there in the end and we almost certainly did. Thank you so much. If I could ask you to leave the stage so that we can begin the second half of our panel, please. But thank you so much for your contribution, please. Do show your appreciation. They have been absolutely marvellous. Thank you. And whilst we clear the stage, let me introduce our next panel. They're getting ready to take over. So please, can you extend the welcome to Ambassador Dr. Abdul Aziz Al Wasel, who is the permanent representative of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to the United Nations in New York. So, Ambassador, please join us on the stage. 
Can you also welcome Her Excellency Ambassador Dyka Potzel? She is the Director General of Crisis Prevention, Stabilization, Peacebuilding and Humanitarian Assistance at the Federal Foreign Office in Germany. So, Ambassador Dyka Potzel, please, I'm sure you're in the room, if you could join us, please do come and join us on the stage. Ambassador Potzel. Can we also welcome Ms. Susanna Moorhead? Now, Susanna is chair of the OECD's Development Assistance Committee, otherwise known as the DAC. I'm not hearing much applause, please. Can you welcome our guests, please? Show your appreciation. I always get a little bit nervous when there's an absence of applause. Can you please also welcome Ms. Pramila Patton? Pramila is the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. Pramila Patton, please come and join us. Pramila? And also, finally, can we welcome Felipe Lazzarini? Felipe is the Commissioner, the, the Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East. So please do come and join us. Everybody's together. Please come, come and join us. Panel, thank you so much for being here. And let me kick off with uh, Dr. Abdulaziz al -Wassel. Now, Dr. Aziz, Saudi Arabia has an extremely progressive, robust, and ambitious agenda for the future. That is encapsulated in Vision 2030, and that in itself is built on the idea of a vibrant society that has a thriving economy. Now, in October 2021, the Kingdom also announced the Middle East Green Initiative. So, in the context of what is happening and what is planned, what, is planned, what do you see as Saudi's future as a humanitarian leader and as a visionary, not just for the region, but also beyond the Middle East? Where is the journey taking you? I think the, oh, right, uh, that's it, fantastic. <laughs> uh, it's great to be in Riyadh, actually, and it's an honor to be in the Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum. Uh, the, the interconnection challenges require, actually, a wide and uh, inclusive collaboration among all of us we cannot basically tackle the humanitarian needs, especially, and other crises without acting collectively. And in Saudi Arabia, in fact, we uh, launch many initiatives, you know, targeting uh, uh, climate change, tar targeting also food security, energy security, and among these initiatives is the uh, Saudi Green Initiative and Middle East Green Initiatives. These initiatives launched by His, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince and uh, with the aim to advance uh, environmental protection, uh, sustainable energy transition, and also a cleaner future for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with the, a very ambitious uh, target uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2060. Also the two initiatives are important in the sense that they will provide uh, not only uh, pro uh, environmental protection but also uh, energy, clean energy uh, projects. Uh, the, we, we have, uh, the the uh, Saudi Green Initiative aims to plant 10 billion trees and additional 40 billion trees in the region in the upcoming decades. In fact, the uh, vision Saudi 2030 is uh, full of initiatives that will help not only the kingdom, but the region as a whole. Okay, thank you very much. And let me bring in Ambassador Potzel, because internationally we know that Germany has actually been the, the second biggest aid donor for the last five years. 
And what I want to know from you is it's really a comparison because are there differences that you see in the crises of 2022 and, of course, the ones which are happening now and looming further forward for this year in comparison to what we saw happening four or five years ago? What are the key differences that you've been able to identify? Yeah, thank you so much and thank you for having me and uh, thanks to Saudi Arabia for organizing this conference. It's really a pleasure to be here. Germany is indeed the second largest bilateral donor um, in assistance for uh, humanitarian assistance, but we've only had this position for a couple of years now because, um, obviously, because of the rising urgency and intensity of crises. And that has uh, a number of reasons. Um, obviously, conflict and displacement um, has reached really new records, very disturbing records. And plus, and it was said before, the extreme weather uh, changes and uh, climate change, of course, uh, have a huge impact on what is happening in terms of humanitarian needs. So yes, there is a change in crisis, and if you look ahead, um, it doesn't look good. Um, it doesn't look as if we are going to see a, 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 an improvement very soon. So um, we have a huge responsibility. This is also what we as Germany feel, that we do have a responsibility to help people in need, to help the most vulnerable. Um, but we have to be frank and, um, and honest, and it was said in the other panel, that uh, the international community needs to do more. Oh. So we have to step up our efforts to help more people, um, to give more, um, to distribute more fairly, and my Swedish colleague has said before um, how thin the layer of donors is really. And if you look at the, the top three, that's the United States, that's the EU, and that's Germany, pay for 60% of the humanitarian assistance. And that is, again, not sustainable. So this is also an opportunity to plea with others to do more because the people in need, they are not responsible for what has happened to them. And they need our, our dire support. So we need to be better also in what we do. Um, and uh, of course, we first and foremost need to tackle the root causes. We have to help to solve uh, conflicts and increase stabilization efforts. And what, I, what we feel is very important, to get better in bringing together humanitarians, development actors, stabilization efforts, and the peace pillar. Um, and so we are working uh, hard to do that because, as I said, we don't see crises uh, getting less, uh, but uh, unfortunately, rather um, the contrary. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that. But I mean, I, I like this, the, the point which you made as well, as well about having an honest conversation, actually recognizing what it is that has to be done to actually fulfill the goals going forward. And this is what we've been having here, an honest conversation, because we certainly kicked kick that off with the, the first part of the panel. But Susanna Moorhead, last December, the UN launched the Global Humanitarian Overview for 2023. It happened here in Riyadh. I was lucky enough to witness this. But the point is, they asked for $52 billion to cover humanitarian needs during the year. That is a big ask, especially given what is happening on the global stage economically. But what should the aid community itself be doing to influence the DAC club to provide better funding for humanitarian responses? Are there certain things they can do better? And I guess that um, there's an urgency to do this. The clock is not going to stop ticking for anyone. Thank you. I, I mean, I don't want to repeat what others have said, but you say 52 billion. I mean, total uh, official development assistance is about 185 billion. So you're talking about over 25%. Um, now, DAC members have tried to increase odor levels in recent years, but it hasn't gone up anything like as fast as demand. And in a more or less flat odor climate, every dollar that you spend on, on humanitarian is one that you don't spend on development. So I'm afraid there's no way around the need to get more people into the club. Um, and as we've already heard, the, there are three DAC members who are providing well over 60% of humanitarian aid. Uh, overall, including the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, there are perhaps 10 donors in the world picking up 80% of the burden. So it's pretty simple. It's where is everybody else? Um, and, and please, please don't tell me that we can't afford it. 
I mean, I would argue that we can't afford not to. Uh, we managed to afford our own quantitative easing for, for uh, domestic financial crises. We managed to afford massive uh, investments to, to deal with the COVID pandemic. We managed to afford huge increases in defense budgets. We can afford this. Uh, and this is not about charity. It is about investing in everybody's future. So you can ask the question any way you like, but there is no getting around the fundamental need for more resource and more people, more nations, uh, more of the private sector, more philanthropists to contribute. A very powerful point as well, because again, one of the points which emerged in the first panel, and we're going to hear a lot more about this, is this feeling that some countries are carrying more of the share than others. And as you've rightly said, we can afford it. You know, there was a COVID-19 response. There is the ability to respond to internal crises. We find the money. So that means there's no excuse for saying we haven't got it, which is why the burden has to go elsewhere. But Pramila Patton, when we talk about funding as well, we cannot dissociate it from gender. Now, among other forms of GBV, Conflict-related sexual violence, we know it impacts the lives of survivors, but worryingly, it disproportionately affects women and girls in conflict zones. So my question to you is how can humanitarian actors and the donor community strengthen that collective response to meet the specialized needs of CRSV and GBV survivors? There is a moral imperative attached to this. Yeah, I think we have a few microphone problems. Can you... Right, we have a few microphone problems. So whilst we resolve it, what's going to happen is that a microphone is going to get passed along the line. And hopefully once it reaches Pramila, we will be able to hear her because I know that um, this is a subject which, which she holds very, very dear to her heart and that she wants to expand on. So can you, uh, can you, can you tap the microphone, Pramila? Can you tap the head of the microphone just to make... It's on, is it? That's fantastic. Do you need me to repeat the question or are you okay? No, 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 I'm, I'm okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for the question, actually. And even in your question, the way you framed it, that you are actually recognizing that victims of conflict-related sexual violence have specialized needs. And I think that is my very first message to both the humanitarian actors and to the donor community. It is true that women and girls are disproportionately uh, impacted by all forms of gender-based violence, including conflict-related sexual violence, as a result of structural gender-based uh, discrimination. But victims of conflict-related sexual violence suffer a violation of both their individual rights and collective peace and security. And, and I think it's, it's critical for the donor community to understand uh, that the, the devastating impact of sexual violence used as a tactic of war on women and girls significantly, but also against men and boys, uh, and that uh, sexual violence is plaguing uh, conflict. With every new wave uh, of, of warfare, we see a rising tide of sexual violence. And I can tell you that the sexual violence is also becoming more and more brutal. I only hear about gang rape. I mean, if we look at Ukraine, only three days after the Russian aggression, the first reports of brutal sexual violence surfaced and the Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine raised the alarm bell. So it is, it is important to, to, to understand the specific experience of victims of CRSV and their specific needs. For example, the psychosocial support that is provided in general to victims of gender-based violence, whether it is domestic violence, is simply not adapted to victims of sexual violence in conflict where the impact is devastating, whether it is their health, their sexual and reproductive health, and their mental health. Mm -hmm. I, I have seen in DRC and in South Sudan, babies of eight months old, victims of sexual violence. Every year, 
The report of the Secretary General paints a harrowing picture of sexual violence being used as a tactic of war, of torture, of terror, a tool of reprisal and political repression. And we see men and boys where there are no services tailored to, to their needs. Children with no tailored services. So that's, that's my first message uh, to, uh, to both uh, the international, uh, international uh, the donor community and uh, the humanitarian workers. The survivors need more than our solidarity. They need sustained and adequate investment of resources to build shattered lives and livelihoods. Since I took office, I have noticed this lack of awareness about the drivers and dynamics of conflict-related sexual violence. And I have been advocating for a survivor-centered approach because it is the only approach that can ensure the recovery of survivors. And yet, as humanitarian needs increase across the globe, gender-based violence programming remains chronically underfunded, generally accounting for less than 1% of humanitarian assistance. And I just want to give you one number. One number. According to the Financial Tracking Service, only 18% of GBV funding that was requested for humanitarian operations was received for the year 2022. While we know that annual military spending continues to increase dramatically. So my message is that if we are serious about fulfilling our obligation to survivors and affected communities, we must reverse this trend. And another important message for the humanitarian community is that you will not meet the needs of survivors of CRSV if these needs are not articulated in your programming and funding request. And again, one example, last year, the Central Emergency Response Fund allocated 735 million US dollars, including 27.6 million for the response to GBV in emergencies. And believe me, out of these allocations, CRSV was mentioned in only one project proposal, namely to support the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to investigate crimes of CRSV within Ukraine for an overall budget of $2 million. And this equates to just 0.27% invested in the need for victims of sexual violence. So I just want to say that this is happening at a time of multiple crises characterized by acute sexual violence from Ethiopia to Ukraine to Haiti, as well as an epidemic of coup and unconstitutional shifts in power in settings such as Afghanistan, Myanmar, Guinea, Mali, and Sudan, which have reduced civic space and turned back the clock on women's rights. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was very powerfully expressed. and. I want you to come into the, the conversation, Felipe Lazzarini, because look, what we've heard from our panelists is that more money is needed because of the crisis which uh, humanitarians are, are currently facing. We heard there from Pramila that it's really important that we get the funding to the victims of, of sexual violence in the conflict zone and concerns that perhaps, or the, the, the sense I get is, is a worry that maybe their needs might not necessarily be as much a priority to some as it is to others. But look, any initiative is going to need funding. We heard earlier from Suzanne that we can make the money happen if we want to, and yet the irony is that you represent the UNRWA, you're facing a growing debt crisis. So my question to you is what other sources have you pursued or even considered using so that you can augment the dwindling amount of direct international aid that you're receiving? Because from my, my perspective, I would imagine that you need more money given what is happening now and what lies ahead. Yes, sir. <clears throat> thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Rabia, for hosting us and organizing this uh, conversation. And the short answer is, uh, yes, I agree. If there is political will, we wouldn't be in a financial uh, crisis when it comes to an agency like UNRWA. Just to understand the context, I often describe our agencies as being the only one providing 
public-like uh, services to one of the most underprivileged community, being the Palestinian refugees in the region. We run, in fact, the Ministry of Education. We run the Ministry of Primary Healthcare. And in addition to that, we are also asked to respond to any new emergencies, like, uh, for example, the latest uh, earthquake. So in total, our budget is $1.6 billion in 2023. Now, when you run an organization of this size, of this scale, of this scope, you need predictable funding. And as we heard this morning, we have a, a very loyal, strong uh, uh, donor base, but uh, it's a very limited one. These are always the 10 same the state minister this morning uh, referred to. Now, the impact of that is that the quality of our services has decreased, the trust of the refugees vis-a-vis -vis the agency is uh, waning, and also our ability to implement the mandate is becoming more and more difficult because we still need to keep these services in a region where needs are increasing at the time the funding is uh, stagnating. So over the last uh, few years, we have looked at different avenues. The first one, there is absolutely uh, 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 no, no, no magic behind it. We need predictable, reliable funding. We know exactly what the public services we are providing will cost to this population. We have a budget we can prepare long in advance. For this, we need the political will for this agency to continue to provide this prospect to the Palestinian refugees. If I look at the region here, the region here has traditionally been very generous vis-a-vis -vis UNRWA, but it has been uneven from one year to the other one. We had better year, up to 25% of our budget, but we had also years, like two years ago, which was less than 3% of our budget. And I do believe that more can be done to increase the predictability of the funding coming from this region. We are also looking at diversifying the donor base. We keep hearing about diversifying, though it's not an easy one. We are now looking at, uh, when it comes to countries, to expand uh, to Asia, where we have indication that some countries want to show their solidarity to the region. But we are also obviously looking at uh, the private sector, and not just the corporate, uh, but also the philanthropic uh, charities. An area where we have to invest, but do not have yet the resource to invest, uh, is uh, digital trans uh, uh, fundraising, which seems to be one of the fastest growing uh, fundraising uh, tool nowadays. Now we can, be, we can dream a little bit uh, and say, let's say we have a platform with a one million subscriber, they give $10 a month each, uh, that would certainly solve part of the financial crisis the organization is in. We have also looked over the last two years to increase partnership with other UN agencies, but this has its own limitation because it's also looked through a political lens. And we have also tried to increase the regular budget of the United Nations, but here also political considerations show their limits. Okay, it's, it's, it's an interesting point that you raise because Saudi has been extremely generous. The Middle East has been very generous in coming forward and, and, and assisting. And I guess my point to you is that um, other countries may feel, well, actually, there's a global economic crisis and, and we're, we're under pressure. It puts you under pressure because I guess the danger is that you will not be in pole position in the... The, the, in, in the pecking order, shall we say. And again, as you've, you've expressed here, your worry is that by not being, getting the, the level of funding that you need, it means that you're not delivering the quality of service that you're capable of giving. I mean, b beyond the services we are providing, we are also providing a sense of uh, safety and a sense of prospect to one of the most underprivileged community mm. in the region, and you're, you're which, happy today, to give more. which today feels totally abandoned sure. by the international community. And you're having to give more as well and because we of the crisis. And we have to give more, and the less we can give because they expect uh, more, the more they feel abandoned by the international community, and the more there is also a risk that this is fueling an already tense uh, situation here in the region. When young uh, uh, Palestinians have nothing else uh, to lose, what do they do? 
we have seen that many of them in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Gaza are tempting their chance to cross the sea knowing perfectly that they might not uh, succeed, but out of despair they will do this. Or in other places, out of despair, they might be tempted uh, to be taken into cycle and spiral of violence. And I'm sure that this is something none of us here wants to see happening in this region. Mm. So again, it puts pressure on you because you're, you're, in, in terms of the services you're, you're providing, it's just to, to give people hope so that they, they don't go in the wrong direction. But Dyke Potts, so let me come to you because when we're discussing aid strategies, again referenced here, anticipatory action, it's always going to feature, and again, Germany is one of its biggest, most powerful advocates. Now your country, in fact, was one of the first donors to invest in the concept before the usage became so common. So how how do you see it now? Does it still have the ambition? And can it be realistic given that, yes, it is predictive, but you can't predict combat, you can't predict war? And should the model be replicated when we're dealing with not just the crises of today, but also the future? Or would it have to be altered, mutated in some way, shape or form? Thank you very much for the for the question, um, we are very much convinced of uh, the potential for anticipatory action. It seems to me um, like really something that is so clear um, that this works, acting ahead of a disaster uh, simply is more effective. It saves money, but it is also much more dignified for the people in need. So we really feel as Germany that there, it is a moral imperative to act before disaster strikes. And we can see that like in a lot of developed countries, of course, if we know that a storm is coming, we go and prepare shelters and we uh, protect our houses and what have you. And a lot of people around the world are not able to do that. Now we know that uh, in, in at least 20% of the cases for weather-induced uh, disasters, um, we, we have that data, we know that it's coming. But we only, uh, for the time being, spent internationally 1 to 2 percent of the humanitarian assistance budget for uh, uh, anticipatory action. So there is much more that we can do, even if we're only talking weather-induced uh, catastrophes. Now, we have uh, uh, pledged that we are going to spend 5 percent of uh, this year's budget, at least for humanitarian, uh, for um, uh, you know, anticipatory action, uh, and that would amount to 135 million. But uh, I think there is much more scope. We need to uh, scale up those efforts. We have also pushed within the G7 during our presidency for more anticipatory action, and the G7 have committed to put more money in it. But I think it's something that everybody should look into. And as we have talked about the funding gap, this is a way to spend money better. And just to give you one example, again, weather induced, but the uh, FAO has spent 230 million to prevent uh, or to go in early to prevent uh, the effects of a desert locust plague. Uh, now, if they hadn't done it, it would have cost 1.7 billion dollars to care for the consequences. So I think it is like in terms of, of funding gaps and reduced funding, it really is uh, a matter of, of um, sort of uh, normalcy to, to invest in it. And yes, I also fear that given that we have data, given that we have uh, the intelligence about like also other crises looming, it is much better to go in early and it is not only better, but as I said, I think it is really a moral imperative to help people um, upfront and not to wait till the catastrophe happens and again lives are at stake. Of course and the, that means changing the, the, the response model itself but look it, it, anticipatory action the various strategies they're only really going to work I guess if we form partnerships and this is where you come into the conversation Ambassador Abdulaziz Al Wasal because what do you see as the importance of multilateralism to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and how do you prioritize your global partnerships among not just member states but also UN agencies? Uh, yes, actually, uh, um, Saudi Arabia is uh, very much committed to, multi, uh, uh, to multilateralism, and we believe that uh, uh, engaging and cooperating with the members of the international community and with uh, international organizations, civil society, is uh, very important for the world peace and security. In fact, we are in the kingdom have a very unique experience uh, to share with members of the international community, especially 
uh, under our vision uh, 2030 and the transformation journey that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia has been going through in the last few years. Uh, it is well known that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, has uh, one of the largest economy in the Middle East and also uh, the largest donor in the region and therefore we act uh, uh, and also blessed with uh, a very strategic location uh, we're basically uh, uh, in the heart of the world and therefore we could provide uh, uh, our uh, partners with, with uh, uh, assistance and also with expertise uh, and also Saudi Arabia was and still is a mediator uh, for peace and we seek to uh, uh, assist uh, countries uh, to reach uh, peace in, in, in situation of uh, conflict and when it comes to the United Nations, in fact, uh, Saudi Arabia is a founding member of the United Nations. And uh, also we have a strategic partnership with uh, humanitarian agencies and also other agencies, including, of course, OCHA. Uh, and uh, one of the important issue that we always focus on is the fact that uh, the creation of the United Nations uh, was based on maintaining uh, peace and security. Therefore, we uh, strive to, re to uh, have peace in our region and beyond, uh, believing that actually armed conflict is the main cause for humanitarian needs. Uh, and also, we, 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 we try to uh, do our best to uh, uh, have uh, food security, uh, in affected regions uh, and as we know that uh, armed conflict uh, mitigates uh, you know a negative uh, uh, effects uh, on people especially when it comes to food and the danger of hunger uh, and also at the regional level uh, uh, we are very active in uh, hold, hosting events and also uh, having major uh, initiatives that will uh, uh, be in the benefits of uh, members of uh, the region and also the uh, world as a whole. Uh, as we all know that uh, in the uh, in last year, Saudi Arabia hosted two major summits, Jeddah Summit for Security and Development and also Riyadh Summit for uh, Cooperation and Development. Both aim and to strengthen our partnership uh, and also to uh, make sure that what we do is basically in the benefit not only uh, to our citizens but also to uh, the people of the region and the people of the world as a whole. Uh, and also we, we try to do uh, our best to partner with uh, others in, uh, uh, in the grain uh, uh, the export of grain and food stuff to uh, needy people around the world. Uh, we understand that uh, Africa has been very affected uh, by uh, uh, the uh, uh, situation, the current situation of the world, and therefore we try, we uh, uh, trying to uh, work together with uh, our partners to uh, uh, make sure that uh, food security. Uh, and availability uh, of food is is there for for everyone, and uh, not right. only in the in the African continent, but in, in all countries. Okay, so that's very 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 comprehensive response to that question, and thank you so much. It really has placed everything in a very powerful context. Let me go to Susanna Moorhead because I'm conscious of the fact that uh, we have just under 10 minutes left. So let's see what we can actually squeeze in in that time. But from your perspective, do you think there will ever be a time when all DAC members will effectively raise their official development assistance to 0.7% of their national income, seven-tenths of a percent. Is that target still realistic? And crucially, if it is, how do we get there? Well, I mean, look, I wish that would happen. Uh, but what I, what I wish or want isn't really the point. Um, I, we can continue to lobby for that. But, I mean, as I said earlier, this is essentially a political choice. 
not an economic one. Uh, and it's a political choice, certainly, that the members of the Development Assistance Committee have to make, but also many, many more countries in the world have to make. Um, so what I would like to see is, is, a, is a, a coalition of the willing to, to make the strong political case that this is an investment in everyone's future. And to be clear that it's public money, which is critically important, but also the private sector, philanthropy, and that the public resources that we do have are made to work as hard as possible. Uh, so the previous panel, um, Andrew Mitchell mentioned the Bridgetown agenda. Now this is a, an innovative agenda to look at the quantum of financing for humanitarian and development and is saying that we, you know, we can't leave anything off the table. We've got to look at debt. We've got to look at the reform of the multilateral development banks. We've got to look at bilateral assistance. And we've got to make the case to citizens, to taxpayers, to the next generation, that what we're doing already works reasonably well. I think we've got to really avoid this idea that we are throwing good money after bad. We're not. Mm. I mean, the humanitarian crisis is a combination of just the quantum of crises, uh, but also the, the, the laying on of COVID and then natural disasters, climate, famine. Uh, it's just the scale is beyond anything that the system was designed to cope with. So 0.7 would just be the starting point, but actually there's a far more existential question to answer, which is how do we reform the international architecture and how do we generate the political will in all our countries to say this works, we're actually, we've learnt a lot, Certainly we could do better on gender-based violence, we could do better on, on the efficiency of the system, we need to invest far more in peace and security. Uh, we need to really deliver the humanitarian development peace nexus. We need much more diplomacy, but it's not just about 0.7 and it's not just about the very small number of extremely generous donors we have at the moment. And this needs political leadership at the very highest level. This is, this is heads of government uh, okay. who need to, to make the case. Uh, and I think the media needs to step up. Don't, don't let uh, people in, in poorer countries be the, the hidden victims of Russian aggression. Um, you know, we need to collectively redouble our commitments to consign famine to the history books. We thought we'd done that in the 20th century, and there are people starving to death now, in 2023, and it is a blight on humanity, it's a blight on all of us that we mm. let that happen. Absolutely, I don't think you'll get any, any disagreement on that one. We have five minutes left, so I want to squeeze in three questions. The first of these goes to you, Felipe, because um, you said in a recent talk that when we speak to refugees, all they want to do is to live with dignity, to use the Arabic word, and apologies if I have mispronounced it, Bekarama. So given the challenges that you're facing, how can you maintain your promise to those that you help that you will give them that dignity? which they crave. Well, we, we, we heard this morning also the importance of uh, social and economic inclusion. And this is what I mean when we talk about giving back some uh, dignity and making sure that uh, all these youths who have uh, aspiration for a better future can become economically self-independent. Now, just two weeks before the earthquake, I was in Aleppo. I met a group of uh, 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 young people who basic uh, at the vocational training center of UNRWA, they asked me training for coding, for photovoltaic, and also English courses, so that can, they can stay connected with the rest of the world. The reality today is that our vocational training, what we are teaching is not anymore in line with what the economy needs. But we have the potential. We had an extraordinary success story in Gaza recently, where 100 coders working for the organization are providing solutions for the broader UN system worldwide. And we can do much more with this IT hub. So our commitment to that is we need to invest in the future employability of the young Palestinian. And this starts even at school, at the primary school, where we need also to bridge 
the digital divide by providing uh, labs and uh, ensuring that uh, issues of connectivity or tablet be also addressed. Okay, thank you so much for that. Pramila, we only have about a minute left, so very, very briefly, I'm so sorry to have to rush you on this because time is the enemy. Can you share with us at least one of the key achievements of UN Action and CRSV Multi-Partner Trust Fund supporting humanitarian operations so that you can meet the needs of those you serve? Well, thank you uh, for the question. In fact, task we've a mandate by the Security Council to provide strategic leadership uh, and also to strengthen existing United Nations coordination mechanism in order to foster synergy of action and to ensure that the UN delivers as one. I'm like pleased to say that since 2017, during my tenure, the network itself has grown from 11 entities to 24 entities. And today we are working, for example, very closely with the Office of Counterterrorism to address the impact of sexual violence uh, as a tactic of terrorism, with UNEP to focus on the uh, nexus with climate insecurity, with the International Trade Center to focus on empower econ economic empowerment of, of women. In terms of the most recent flagship initiative of UN Action, uh, we launched last year during the General Assembly a first prevention framework for conflict-related sexual violence because it's been widely recognized that sexual violence in conflict is preventable. It's not collateral damage. It's not a byproduct of, of war. And having 24 UN agencies converging and working on that prevention framework was quite, was quite remarkable. And now we're trying to roll it in country. It's intended to be a roadmap for all actors and stakeholders, but especially member states and UN agencies to expand their prevention, early warning, and risk mitigation uh, measures. Okay, thank you so much for that. We have one minute left, so please, all of you, be very, very brief. Can, Br Pramila, hold on to that mic. Once you've answered, please pass it along. In the, in the last minute, okay, what would you like to see implemented when we meet again here in Riyadh in two years' time? Pramila, then please move the microphone along, please, very briefly. Well, I would like to say that uh, right now we are unfortunately failing and leaving behind many victims of, of sexual violence. Uh, I would like to ensure that we reach many more victims uh, and that we give them more than just solidarity, that there is dedicated, flexible funding, like the point that uh, Filippo Grandi made this morning, flexible funding for us to be able to deliver on our mandate, and that the funding focuses also on prevention. Okay, thank you very much. If you can pass the microphone to Susanna, please. Very briefly. Peace and get women involved in the peace process, political leadership at the highest levels, and share more of our prosperity. Thank you very much. Ambassador Dr. Abdulaziz al wassel please, very briefly. I believe we, we hope and we wish that we will be able to uh, have more mechanisms to, uh, tackling uh, the causes of humanitarian uh, needs, namely better mechanism to control armed conflict and also natural disaster. Thank you very much. And Ambassador Dyke Potso, please. Thank you. I wish to see far less conflict better reaction to um, climate change and uh, more people joining in humanitarian assistance, i.e. a broader donor base. Thank you very much. Final word to Felipe Lazzarini. Yeah, I would like to see Palestinian news more valued in the future and less pushed uh, to the brink. And we have the instrument here collectively. We can have partnership with universities, institute, uh, Ministry of Labor to bring this uh, social economic inclusion in the region for them. Thank okay. You. Panel, thank you so much for your contribution. Please show your appreciation to them. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And we're going to clear the stage to make way for the next panel, but please do stay with us. And um, I'm sure I'll see most of you later today, but thank you so much.
ممتاز وصل السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بعد قليل سيبدأ بإذن الله الحفل الرسمي نرجو التكرم بالعودة إلى مقاعدكم شكرا لكم Prince Faisal bin Abdelaziz bin Bender, the, the manager of the, uh, the governance of Riyadh.
In the name of God, most uh, merciful, and peace be upon uh, the Prophet Muhammad. Your Royal Highness, Prince Faisal bin Bender bin Abdul Aziz, the Governor of Riyadh, your uh, Royal Highnesses, um, your Excellencies, dear honored guests, our honored guests from outside the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. And good evening. Under the, uh, under the generous patronage of the custodian of the two holy mosques, King Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, may God preserve him, we uh, start the uh, uh, activities of the uh, third humanitarian international um, forum, which is honored by His Royal Highness opening Faisal bin Bandar bin Abdulaziz, the uh, governor of a Riyadh region. The forum, the International Humanitarian, uh, third uh, humanitarian forum is first thing we start the activities with a uh, recitation of uh, Quran. The International Humanitarian Forum in Riyadh comes in a period where the world is passing through extremely unprecedented humanitarian aid, earthquakes, and wars. May Allah protect us, uh, and, and we are so sorry for those who lost their lives, and hopefully a full recovery for those who are affected. The uh, opening uh, ceremony, uh, the speech is given by um, uh, Dr. Abdullah bin Abdullah al Rabia, the general supervisor of uh, KS King Salman Relief uh, Center. In the name of God, and peace be uh, your uh, royal uh, highness, Prince Faisal uh, bin Bandar bin Abdul Aziz, the governor of Riyadh region. Your royal highness, Prince Faisal bin Farhan uh, Al Saud, minister of foreign affairs. Your excellency, Mr. Martin Griffiths, under secretary general for humanitarian affairs and emergency relief, Coordinator, Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, peace be upon you and greetings. I welcome you all to Riyadh, the humanitarian capital, and greatly appreciate your presence at the third Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum, which is being held under the generous uh, auspices and care of the custodian of the two holy mosques. And uh, follow up by his 
um, uh, Crown Prince and the presence of uh, Your Royal Highness on the behalf of the custodians of the two holy mosques. Distinguished guests, as we meet today, the world is experiencing many disaster, crises, conflicts, and other events which have expurgated the global humanitarian situation and multiplied uh, its challenges. The latest are the catastrophic earthquake that struck recently in Syria and Turkey, killing tens of thousands and rendering millions homeless. We uh, seek um, may they rest in peace, and we wish uh, help for those who are homeless. This forum will may uh, focus on enhancing global aid efforts, increasing donor funding from countries, organizations, and individuals, and raising the levels of coordination and impact of humanitarian assistance to make our work more effective and responsive. Your Highness, ladies and gentlemen, this forum is receiving a great interest and includes uh, the effective participation of the United Nations and other international, regional, and local organizations. Nearly 60 organizations and humanitarian leaders uh, from countries will participate in this forum, and the world looks forward to the solutions and recommendations that will come out of this high-level gathering. Over the next two days, we will discuss a number of uh, uh, urgent issues, including the growing number and urgency of humanitarian needs, the widening funding uh, uh, gap, the unfiction uh, and aid efforts, mechanism for developing humanitarian work, finding su sustainable and practical solutions, adopting technology, digital transformation, and artificial intelligence in collecting and analyzing data disturbing aid and monitoring its impact on the ground and enhancing control, transparency, and impartiality of aid provision. The forum will also focus on the role of women and youth in a humanitarian response and ways to raise the level of protection for the world's most vulnerable groups. We will also focus on issues of food security, displacement, and migration strengthening partnerships and supporting field studies and research aimed at increasing the impact of humanitarian action. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the custodian of the Tuli Tahuli Mosques, uh, King Sulman uh, bin Abdelaziz uh, Al Saud, and His Royal Highness the Crown Prince for their support and guidance. Uh, and I extend my sincere thanks to you, Your Royal Highness, for attending the forum today. We are honored by your presence. I also extend my sincere thanks to His Royal Highness, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Your Highness, Excellencies, and distinguished guests. We sincerely appreciate the efforts of all those who contributed to the success of this forum particularly the United Nations and its humanitarian agencies and my exceptional KS team, KS relief team. May this form result in successful outcomes that lead to identifying innovative and sustainable solutions to the humanitarian challenges that face the world today as we continue our commitment to bring relief light and hope to those who need us most. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Abdullah ibn Abdullah al Rabia, the advisor uh, in the Royal Court, uh, the sup General Supervisor of um, King Salman uh, Relief. Dear um, guests, who please, uh, we will watch now a short movie about the International Humanitarian Forum uh, Riyadh. Only those who are starving can truly savor a single bite of food. Only those who are suffering from thirst will appreciate a single drop of water. Only those who have been forced to sleep without shelter 
will see a tent as a palace. Only those who have been forced to leave their homes understand the burden of alienation. Only those who are ashamed of their ignorance fully realize the importance of education. Only those who are sick will consider good health to be the greatest blessing. Only those who have suffered from weakness can rejoice in finding empowerment. Only those who have lived through disasters can truly understand their horror. Only those who have lived in fear can truly value even a single moment of safety. Only those who have put aside their sorrows can see the beauty in a simple smile. Only those who understand the need for others can fully recognize the value of solidarity. Let us not only truly appreciate the importance of things after we have lost them. Facing humanitarian crises has taught us that we need to provide rapid response, work in full solidarity, have sufficient resources, and create innovative solutions to achieve sustainable outcomes. Effective humanitarian action brings light and hope to those who live in darkness. صاحب السمو أصحاب السمو والمعالي أيها الحب الكريم الكلمة الآن His Excellency, uh, General Secretary of uh, United Nations, Antonio Gorovich, given by uh, Mr. Martin Griffith, please. very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start by warmly thanking the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for your invitation to the UN Secretary General who I'm here to represent this morning. We thank you for your support, for your leadership, and for your engagement with the United Nations humanitarian work around the world. Excellencies, the humanitarian landscape before us, which I will speak about today, is a rough and rugged one. Needs, as we have already heard, are spiraling across the world. Crises are piling one on top of the other. And desperate people are looking to us, all of us, in their hour of need. The world is facing the largest food crisis in modern history. And as David Beasley reminds us, famine is knocking on many doors. Human rights, especially women's rights, are under vicious attack in many places, punishing entire societies as a result. Tensions are high where injustice has been allowed to fester for decades. In Ukraine, a brutal war is this week, is about to enter its second year. And today marks two weeks since the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria claimed tens of thousands of lives, and the count continues and caused indescribable destruction. Allow me to share. Excellency, some of the global numbers that we have. More than 350 million people around the world, 350 million people around the world currently need humanitarian assistance. That's equivalent to the third most populous country in the world. We need almost $54 billion this year to meet the basic needs of the worst affected among them. 
But experience shows, again, as we have earlier discussed, that we can expect to raise barely half of that amount. And each year, our count of people in need and dollars to raise takes another jump. The trend is clear, and there are three main reasons. First, old wars don't end as new ones start. Conflicts linger on and become protracted, as I have had direct experience. Second, the climate emergency is hitting the most vulnerable people worse. We are in a constant race to mitigate that impact, to focus on that aspect of the impact of climate. And third, economic collapse, fueled first by the shock of COVID-19 and then by the war in Ukraine, is pushing millions of people across the world to the brink. And while these mega crises mount, the resources needed to respond to them are not keeping up, despite the generosity of many in this room. As humanitarians, as we all are, our solidarity will always be with the people we serve. Our role is to listen to them, to the local communities and organizations who are the first responders to their needs, and often, indeed, the only responders on the front lines. Our mandate and mantra is don't give up. But to discharge this mandate, we need your help in practical and tangible ways to end the wars and conflicts we know and to stop new ones breaking out. We urgently need a surge in diplomatic efforts. I thank all those pushing for peace at all levels. And the kingdom is indeed one of those. We also need to address climate change head on because every flood, heat, drought, superstorm, and we've all seen that in recent months, all seen them in recent months, leaves a crisis in its wake. Decisive action to reduce emissions, of course, is long overdue. And of course, the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy needs to be accelerated. But right now, for us, for this community, here in this room, a doubling of financing for climate adaptation is required. And we must ensure together that that money, those billions, we hope, goes to the right places and meets the needs of the right people. It's unacceptable, simply unacceptable, that most, the most vulnerable countries, those contributing, of course, the least to climate change, receive almost no climate money. This must be reversed, and I hope this year's COP28 will indeed be a turning point for this, as I know many seek and many pray for. Excellencies, it will come as no surprise that we need more resources to save lives today. Globally, more than 222 million people don't know when or even if they'll eat another meal. 45 million people around the world are on the brink of starvation, most of them, of course, women and children. These are statistics, but they are heartbreaking. In response to this emergency, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, has just announced an unprecedented $250 million from the UN's emergency fund, SURF, for those suffering the potential and the actuality of famine and hunger. This money will enable early action, getting ahead of crises in the making and including famines. And I thank all donors, many, many here, who have contributed to the Central Emergency Resolving Fund. You have made this massive allocation possible but we will need you to replenish that fund and the other pooled funds we operate. And we need to scale up anticipatory action, as others have said. Finally, Excellencies, 
It is indeed the theme of this extraordinary forum and the collective nature of the people in this room that humanitarian action cannot stand alone. Hands on deck. By working together with a political will, with other communities, with other governments across the world, with a political will that is the currency that we need to expend, yes, indeed, we can stop conflicts. And yes, indeed, we can address the climate emergency. Yes, indeed, famines can be fought and defeated. And then we could be ready, of course, for the next emergency that will lurk around the next corner. Thank you very much. Shukran Sayyid Martin Griffith, الذي ألقى كلمة الأمم المتحدة نيابة عن أمينها العام. صاحب السمو أيها الحفل الكريم يسرني الآن دعوة صاحب السمو الأمير فيصل بن فرحان آل سعود وزير الخارجية. آل سعود حفظه الله ويطيب لي أن أرحب بكم في بلدكم الثاني المملكة العربية السعودية وثمن حضور الذي يجسد أهمية تضافر الجهود من أجل مواجهة التحديات والاحتياجات الملحة في ظل الأزمات والصراعات والاضطرابات الجيوسياسية التي يشهدها العالم حضور الكريم انطلاقا من القيم المستمدة من ديننا الإسلامي الحنيف فقد دأب ملوك المملكة العربية السعودية Vision, a kingdom of Saudi Arabia since it's established by the founder, uh, uh, His Royal Highness King uh, Saud. Uh, um, may his soul rest in peace and his efforts uh, continued by uh, King uh, Salman in order to devote all the efforts for the humanitarian aid and uh, help uh, those who are in need whenever it's uh, calls uh, regardless of ethnic or uh, religion um, and uh, our uh, help was received by 160 countries over the past uh, seven, uh, 70 years. In the light of the geos challenge, geopolitical challenges, the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia carries on the advances uh, in humanitarian and um, uh, aid for those countries that are medium and low income, uh, which is around seven um, uh, around seven billions uh, dollars, and then um, with under the directives of King uh, Salman, uh, they have um, we have made uh, an air bridge to help all the Syrian and Turkish people under the earthquake which has been um, uh, helped, uh, has been uh, heavy on the hearts of everyone and was so painful for everyone around the world. And now we respect everyone for those who helped in protecting these lives and saving lives and helping other people. And this uh, happening um, disasters reminds us that of how to uh, avoid uh, conflicts and wars and crises in order to face uh, crises and give all the aid to those who deserve in accordance with the uh, international uh, human aid principles. Dear Eastern Distinguished Guest, uh, 
humanitarian aid doesn't only uh, uh, stand on the financial and uh, aims, but also um, cooperation international and uh, expertise and training and also mitigating from logistic challenges uh, in order to deliver the aid uh, to, the, to those who are in need. Dear Anard Guest, our um, our uh, our world is um, is watching a lot of challenges, uh, especially those climate change that had made uh, refugees, displaced people that are beyond the capabilities of the available uh, uh, capabilities of the United Nations, and which will cause us to uh, have a proactive actions in order to mitigate these and also implement uh, innovative solutions um, that will accelerate the fulfillment of sustainable goals, as well as to uh, enhance the cooperation uh, to, for uh, peace uh, efforts. This also again um, uh, reminds us of the importance of facilitating dialogue uh, among those who are working in AIDS using the expertise, the uh, technologies, advanced technologies in order to find solutions. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia worked uh, in proactively in order to find uh, a, a practical uh, solutions through a national, regional and international cooperation. And there has been so many initiatives that exceeded the national levels, and it has an air, a huge impact on the international um, on the international level. We have announced uh, of. Um, uh, establishing a center for reducing the emanation of carbonic uh, of carbon uh, gas uh, with uh, with its location in Riyadh, in order to uh, support balance uh, peace and uh, reduce uh, and fulfill international peace. In the end, I pray to God that we could be able to uh, help those who are in need in all crises. And I wish that this forum will come up. Uh, the outcome is scientific and practical recommendations uh, in order to uh, find practical solution and also to enforce the role of scientific research in meeting the uh, humanitarian aids. Thank you, uh, Your Royal Highness, Prince Faisal uh, bin Farhan bin Saud, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, for this important speech. We would like to uh, honor. Um, uh, we would like to honor honoring uh, Salman Relief major donors and sponsors who were competing to uh, give more and more. Ehsan platform. The black is received by His Excellency the Abdullah bin Sharaf Al Ghamdi, the chair uh, of um, of Sa Saudi Intelligence Authority, Saudi Artificial Intelligence and Technology Authority. Would you please come up to the floor in order to take a group photo? with the blacks. Aramco received by uh, the by by Khaled Belhim, the vice president of Aramco Affairs. The al Institution for Philanthropy, Philanthropy. Sheikh Mutlaq bin Damug al Salam bin Mahfouz Institution. Received by the board members, uh, Mr. Ziad bin Mahfouz.
عبد الله بن تركي الضحيان اندونتمنت The endowment uh, Turkey Al Tayan is received by CEO uh, Mr. Shalan Al Shalan. May God bless you. Those honored from the sponsors. French Saudi Bank. Mr. Badr bin Hamad al Saloum, COO, please uh, come to the floor. Al Bilad Bank. We call the CEO, uh, Mr. Abdelaziz bin Mohammed Al Onaizan, to receive the black. And finally, Al Rajahi Bank. We call uh, Dr. Abdullah Al Jabir, um, Chair of Marketing and Customers Experience, to receive the black. These are samples of those who gave um, donation to the projects uh, and programs of King Salman Humanitarian uh, Relief Center. Your Highness, Your Excellencies, dear distinguished guests. Now, the advisor at the Royal Court and the general supervisor of the King Salman Humanitarian Aid uh, Relief Center, Dr. Abdullah bin Aziz al rubeya will sign uh, the, uh, the agreement in order to assign different uh, uh, different agreements for those who are affected in the uh, with uh, an amount of uh, 183 million Saudi rials for those who are affected in Syria and Turkey. This project uh, directed by those affected in the earthquake in Syria and Turkey with more than 1 million 800 uh, uh, billions and this it it includes um, composing 3,000 housing units for those who are affected, uh, 75 million uh, rials. Also, orphanage um, with an initiative of their smile or best home for uh, 100 million Saudi, billion Saudi. Third one is performing a volunteer program uh, for those affected by the earthquake, um, uh, 18 million Saudi rials. Fourth project, providing health care for saving lives, exceeding 7 million, uh, 800 uh, Sau uh, million Saudi rials. A fifth project, uh, interaction uh, uh, intervention of sewage and water saving life with six million uh, five uh, hundred uh, uh, millions six project supply change of food food supply change six million uh, five hundred million Saudi rials seven project uh, urgent response medical urgent response for uh, saving those people affected by the earthquake in Syria 19 million something exceed 9 million 800 this is kingdom of Saudi Arabia
This is the land of the two holy mosques led, uh, led by His Royal Highness King Salman bin Abdulaziz. Thank you. Thank you. And here, as well, three agreements signed by uh, His Excellency um, Dr. Abdullah Rabia related to volunteering, volunteer and affairs of volunteers and other affairs specialized by King Salman uh, for humanitarian relief in order to extend uh, a hand for those who are affected by the uh, those in need which is the center that has become the umbrella for all the volunteer and philanthropist action presented by uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, Dr. Ben Abdulaziz Al Rabia offering uh, um, a memoir gift for honoring this event on behalf of King Salman, the uh, custodian of the two holy mosques. May God preserve his health. The efforts continues in the country of growth and prosperity is Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. On this landscape that is, uh, on this, uh, we close the events of the official ceremony of the International Humanitarian Third, uh, Third International Humanitarian Form of Riyadh. Million thanks to you, uh, Your Royal Highness. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highnesses and peace be upon you.
يعطيك Check low, check test one, check three, two, one, check, check, check test one, check hello, check three, two, one, Bismillah, check three, two, one, test hello, check Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, check three, two, one.
Check. Testing. Hello. Test. Test mic. Check. Hello. Okay. The mic is second. Check. Three, two, one. Check. Test one. Test. Three, two, one. Check. Hello. Check. Testing. Why? Okay.
Yeah? Ready? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you please find your way to your seats? I hope you enjoyed the delicious lunch. But no food comas allowed because we have a really interesting session coming up next, moderated by Mr. Khalid Khalifa on conflict, force, displacement, and exploitation. Uh, just as we were coming into the room, uh, the news broke that President Biden has, taken, has made an unannounced trip to Kyiv. And as you know, the one year anniversary of the Ukraine war is coming up. And in 2022, the UNHCR announced that the number of people forced to flee was estimated to have reached 100 million. So today we have a panel of our esteemed colleagues who are expert in this space. And I, it is my honor to introduce them now. And the panel will be moderated by Mr. Khalid Khalifa. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If I may ask everybody to take their seats, please. And I hope the acoustics are better in the back. Do you hear me? Good? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, partners, friends, good afternoon. My name is Khaled Khalifa. I am a senior advisor to the High Commissioner for Refugees and the representative to the Gulf Cooperation Council. And I am deeply honored to be moderating this session. I would like first to extend my gratitude to the organizers, King Salman Humanitarian Aid and Relief Center, for convening us today, for bringing us together in this important gathering. As the title of this session indicates, conflict, forced displacement, and risks of exploitation, the discussion will be cross-sectoral. We will be speaking about different topics related to those three themes. Hello, hello. The title suggests complementarity and collaboration in humanitarian response. It highlights the critical role interagency coordination plays in meeting the needs of the most vulnerable. As we gather today, emergent and protracted crises and worsening environmental conditions have further exacerbated suffering and increased humanitarian needs. I am humbled and honored again to moderate such a panel of global humanitarian leaders who need no introduction. I will uh, only mention the names and the organizations the speakers lead because 
anything else, I would say, will not really do justice to the functions they are doing. I would like to invite to the stage first Ms. Maimuna Mohammed Sharif, the Executive Director of the United Nations High, uh, the United Nations Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat. Ms. Sharif. Then allow me to call to the stage His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Al Jasser, the President of the Islamic Development Bank. I would also like to invite to the stage His Excellency Filippo Grandi, the High Commissioner for Refugees. Also, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Vitturino, the Director General of the International Organization of Migration. And Mr. Robert Mardini, Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And finally, last but not least, an organization that supports humanitarian work around the globe, Mr. Michael Kohler, Acting Director General of European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations. This panel will be about an hour and 15 minutes. And I will be uh, asking the speakers two rounds of questions. And if time allows, we will take a couple of questions from the floor. And since the panel is very unbalanced in terms of gender, so I <laughs> allow me to start with Her Excellency Ms. Maimuna Mohammed Sharif the UN Habitat uh, Executive Director <laughs> and to ask her about the relationship UN Habitat has with UNHCR and other organizations working for the displaced around the world to improve <coughs> assistance and uh, support most fragile communities. Your work extends to national and local governments as well. You work with mayors and chiefs of villages in many uh, places. And my first question to you is, uh, how can UN Habitat contribute to solutions of forced displacement in urban contexts? Noting that most displaced people live in urban settlements rather than in camps and rural areas. Thank you very much, my friend. I save you, yeah? Yes, you saved the day. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum uh, Very good uh, afternoon to all uh, excellencies and distinguished delegates. I'm very uh, happy to be here and I'm be honored to discuss uh, with amongst the, the leaders in humanitarian. And as you know, that is um, most of the uh, crisis happen in, in cities and especially on the climate change and humanitarian uh, crisis as, and uh, the greater challenges of uh, climate change uh, and, and so crisis is how to build resilient for 3 billion people living in highly vulnerable areas and out of these 3 billion 1 billion live in slum and out of this one billion are mainly refugees and IDPs. And UN Habitat is uh, one of the UN agencies together with my colleagues. We are dealing with human settlement, with cities. As you know, that is urban crisis uh, mainly happen in cities. Very seldom happen in 
outside cities unless it's a very, very big agriculture areas or anything that is uh, um, happened or available outside the cities. So when you talk about the, the IDPs and refugees and climate change, it also include migration. Migration, very seldom we heard about rural, uh, urban <coughs> rural migration. But I think during COVID it happened. But mostly migration is to the uh, rural and urban areas. And this was stress. Was stress the capacity, the infrastructure and resources in the cities. And as you see, that is especially in terms of housing, very basic services. I start giving you the background before I share with you what are the UN habitats is doing. So basic services like water, electricity, sanitation, employment, health. And this is very, very important for us to see that the challenges been taken into account when we do the planning. So there are many failures and at the same time cities are adequately or inadequately manage these challenges. And how can we respond successfully? I think as a UN Habitat, we put very clearly in our strategic plan to provide a better quality of life for people in the urbanizing world, for all in the urbanizing world. We cannot stop urbanization. And at the same time, we are very happy. My colleagues, one of these people, when we started doing the draft strategic plan, if you remember, we sent to all the USG or the, the, the head of the uh, UN organization. And one, the, 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 the uh, colleagues were dealing with humanitarian. He said, Maimuna, you are dealing with urban crisis. Can you put in, in your strategic plan that is urban crisis? That's why the fourth domain of our strategic plan is that to manage, to prevent if possible, and to respond to urban crisis. And how can we include the refugee and IDPs to integrate with the host community? And we did this through four pillars. One pillar is that we look into the strategic and spatial plan. This is also true working together with UNACR. This one example that we had in Kenya, Kolabie, Trukana. It's, to me, it's a very successful example where we managed to integrate <coughs> the IDPs, the refugees, into the host community together with the with the stakeholders and also the member states. Second is one of the areas that we are proud of is that in Iraq, the Jazidi. We worked for the past 15 years and I'm very happy to share the good news that in end of last year, the cabinet endorsed the decree to recognize the Jazidi and giving them the certificate of occupation for the IDPs, for the refugee. Second is we are, through the spatial and the, uh, and the development plan, I think what we need is that we, have, we need an immediate response. Immediate response what we work together with uh, UNACR, OCHA, and at the same time, the emergency response. I think that is, is very, very important. Second is we need the short term plan, medium-term plan, and the long-term plan, and I want to add another plan, sustainable plan. Mm -hmm. Not only the long-term, but it's sustainable plan. Yeah. This one through the data collection, innovation. I think this is very important for us to have the data in order to do the planning. And this is what UN Habitat is doing at the moment, the, um, the putting up the normative part of our work, collecting data, assessing data, and assessing also the damage, and how can we use this data to rebuild and to regenerate the urban resilience. Second is how can we, as a moderator said just now, the multi-level governance. We are working very closely with the local government because whatever happened, the local government is the frontliner. 
either it's COVID or crisis or, or climate change, we are at the local. So we work very closely with the local government and also to help them to provide some expertise for them to handle uh, this crisis. And the third is, I would like to end, the third is on the finance. I think this one is not that you inhabit that giving finance to, to, the, to, the, to the stakeholders or to the, to the mayors, but we fundraise together. And one of that is I would like to, 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 um, to uh, share with you here. We work very, very much with the Saudi fund on and, uh, and work in Iraq and also uh, in the philanthropies um, uh, in the, our work in Yemen. So we work together with other UN agencies, not only us alone. Mm. And I hope that... Uh, we can collaborate further with all of you, not only with the UN, but also with the private sector. We have a lot of programs with uh, Islamic Development Bank uh, yeah. and also with the CRC. And uh, I would like to see the opportunity for us to collaborate further and strengthen our um, input yeah. and our uh, contribution to the people who need our service. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Madarita. you, uh, Ms. Maimouna. And, uh, the last point is a very good segue to my next question, uh, which will be addressed to His Excellency Dr. Mohammed al Jassi. He spoke about finance and the importance of finance, the importance of complementarity also between the humanitarian track and the development track. Uh, Dr. al Jassi, the Islamic Development uh, Bank is working to improve people's lives by promoting social and economic development in member states, as stated on the website of the bank itself. Noting that more than 50% of the displacement caseload comes from Muslim countries. How can development and humanitarian aid be combined to achieve sustainable impact taking into consideration that we are seeing more and more protraction of crises that can take several decades to be resolved. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, and uh, thank you to the uh, King Salman uh, Center for Humanitarian Relief uh, for the invitation and for holding this uh, wonderful conference where all parties engaged in the development process and the humanitarian aid process are gathered. We in the Islamic Development Bank are primarily engaged with the issues of development, which is a medium to long term concern. Nonetheless, the short-term issues cannot be escaped when you have, for example, what we have witnessed in Turkey and Syria uh, and in other parts uh, of, of the world, in Afghanistan, there is a need for this immediate relief. And this is the short-term part of the process. So in our development work, we are not oblivious to the short-term needs of the membership. For example, with the food crisis that happened recently, we in the Islamic Development Bank put together a package of $10.5 billion uh, to be made available to finance uh, the uh, response to the food shortage and the food crisis. But what the first one-third of it was to address the short-term issues, which is the relief issues, which is the immediate humanitarian needs of those countries. The other two-thirds are to address the medium to long-term concerns, which is basically to get the development process take place so such crises do not recur. And if they recurred again, they would be much more mitigated. Let's take an example of agriculture. Most of these countries, if they had good agricultural policy and good agricultural uh, sector, then a lot of these problems would not have happened. So we go and we finance projects for agriculture. And let's remind ourselves that in our member countries, 
of which 21 are least developed, least, not less, least developed countries. Agriculture is the, the bread and butter of people. 85% of the population live in rural areas. So if, if we enhance the, uh, the, the agricultural sector, then people will have employment on the land, so they don't have to migrate, they don't have to uh, move out. They have food on the table because they are growing their own food. They probably are producing more, so they're sending to the urban areas, and again, enhancing the livelihoods of people in the urban areas, and maybe even a surplus will go to finance industrialization and other issues. So in all of our programs that are development-based, there is a short-term humanitarian side. And, and this is, if we were to borrow the parable where they say, if you find a, a hungry person, don't give him a fish, give him a, a, a fishing rod. That's the same thing here. Help them build their agricultural sector, and this will be feeding them for the long haul. We have, in the Islamic Development Bank, been very well focused on the developmental aspect of, uh, of these uh, countries. And we have noticed that if we address those, then the recurrence of these humanitarian crises is reduced significantly. And this is something that is very important for us at the Islamic Development Bank and we will continue to cooperate with other agencies that have primarily a short-term concerns, CRC and, and, and others, for example. They are there to alleviate the human suffering in the most immediate uh, term. But we are working with them, we're collaborating with all of the organizations to address the short term while we are working diligently on the medium and long term. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Vitorino, uh, Dr. Al Jasser and Ms. Maimuna spoke about the movement into uh, developing countries and rural areas and poor uh, areas. And the movement of people uh, happened because of many reasons, because of conflicts but recently more and more because of climate change mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, how does IOM, as the UN Migration Agency, address displacement and protection risks of displaced people, especially in the context of climate change? <coughs> Thank you so much for the invitation from UNHCR and the King Salman uh, Foundation. I would just like to say that uh, in our view, climate change is a multiplier of uh, other drivers of mobility. It cannot be isolated. Out of the 15 countries that are more fragile from the environmental point of view, you have conflicts in 12 of them. And you cannot distinguish if people move because of climate change or because of uh, uh, conflict. People move because of the interaction of the drivers and then we need to find solutions to them. We work according to three main work streams. The first one is that uh, because of climate change, people are forced to be displaced, but they do not want to move. So, building resilience in the communities, adapta adaptation of the communities for the impacts of climate change is a top priority. And the, the president of the Islamic Bank spoke about agriculture. There you have a very good example. There is a lot to be done in the rural areas where the communities need to prepare the traditional productions to the impacts of climate change. In many places that will be possible, in other places most likely that will not be possible. And then we have the second work stream, if people have to move. But if people have to move, then they have to move in a safe, orderly and regular manner. They need to be assisted, they need to be protected, and uh, in our view, they need uh, to uh, move in a way that keeps the communities together. And last stage, the last stage is when they settle in another place. And then we have two options, whether the conditions are met for them to 
go back to the region of origin. That's one solution. The other solution is that we need to create conditions for them to settle in a new environment, to have a future life in the place they have moved to. And here we are talking about development. Here we are talking about creating the conditions for those communities to strive again. Access to public services, access to basic uh, facilities, water, electricity. And that's where Mamuna comes in. Because this movement from the rural areas to the urban areas is massive. And the cities are not prepared to cope with this challenge. So this requires to call on urban planning, organization of public services, in order to create conditions for the communities that have moved to strive again. So it's very complex. It interacts. But from our side, we are working with the entire UN system in addressing this challenge. Great. Thank you very much. And now, I have a rare chance to ask my boss a question. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's always, it's usually the other yeah. way around. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Filippo Grandi, the High Commissioner for Refugees, we are witnessing unprecedented numbers of people forced to flee their homes because of conflict, because of violence, because of different reasons, including climate change. Uh, the number has exceeded 103 million uh, people, and we are anticipating uh, another increase by the end of the year, major challenges. The Global Refugee Forum uh, spoke mainly about burden sharing and how the world can share the responsibility of responding to displacement crises. Uh, we are planning for another round of the forum by the end of this year. My question to you, High Commissioner, is about uh, what needs to be done until then, and what are you hoping to achieve in this second uh, Global Refugee Forum? Thank you. Thank you, Khaled, and thanks to all other speakers. <clears throat> well, I, I want to somehow build on what the previous speakers have already said. Uh, because, as you pointed out, forced displacement is at unprecedented heights because of the world situation. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the trends seem to be going in the wrong direction. Of course, uh, my organization, our organization, um, has a double mandate. Sometimes uh, this is not very well known. You know, we are known as a humanitarian organization and one that has a specific protection mandate in respect of, especially of refugees, but also in the UN context of internally displaced people. And that is, of course, an important aspect of our work. Uh, protection means ensuring access to safe countries or safe areas, means uh, um, attention to the vulnerables, means um, um, good policies, good legislation, good practices on the parts of those hosting. So this will continue to be an important part of our work, supported by uh, uh, our partners. And of course, improving uh, burden sharing in all those areas will remain an important focus of uh, our work. The Global Compact on Refugees, that is now four years old, uh, stipulates very clearly, or rather, offers um, states in particular a toolbox on how to better deal with all these challenges. But the other part of the mandate of my organization, which is explicitly in, the, in, in its statute, is to help governments, in particular governments, find solutions to force displacement. The best solution is naturally that people go back to their homes, 
voluntarily, in an organized manner, well supported, dignified, safe. Uh, that, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, depends on a, a, a favorable political environment, in a po on a political solution. This morning, I mentioned in the other panel Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire went out of decades of civil war, re-established peace internally with the support of the international community. There were 400,000 Ivorian refugees, 90% went back home, and by mid this year, together with the president of Côte d'Ivoire, we declared the end of refugee status for Ivorian refugees. A rare event, but one that we wanted to highlight because we said it's possible. If there is a solution, people can go back. It's not always doom and gloom. Sometimes it is possible. Through uh, peace efforts, through development, uh, Cote d'Ivoire is on a path <laughs> to prosperity, not to uh, increase poverty. So it's a combination of positive factors. But uh, uh, most of the time, unfortunately, these optimal solutions are a distant target. We should always think about them, but they're not for tomorrow because the wars are raging, the conflict are not resolved. In the countries of origin, often there are difficult economic social conditions. So what to do in the meantime? Because that's also a solution, you know, what to do for the next 10 years. Can we afford that kids do not go to school or refugee patients do not have access to health services? This is why this morning I spoke of the importance of inclusion for those that are displaced. And the inclusion, inclusion even on a temporary basis for 10 years, for five years, requires investments that are not humanitarian, are development. Uh, and I have to say that in the last few years we've made a lot of progress because inclusion is the core of the Global Compact on Refugees. At the first Global Refugee Forum, which you mentioned, Khaled, in 2019, we got hundreds of pledges uh, for the inclusion of refugees and displaced people. And I hope, to answer your question, that for the next uh, forum, which will take place this December, we will review the implementation of the pledges made and fresh pledges will also be made. I want to make a special point on the forum. What we are trying to achieve is not simply countries saying we want to do this, we want to do that, or institutions, not just countries, institutions as well. We want to match, as we call it, good practices good policies by countries, for example, hosting refugees, for example, allowing refugees to have work permits. I give you an easy one. So these, we want these policies to be matched by good contribution by either donor governments or financial institutions or other partners that can support that good policy, good practice in a given country. The more we match, the more we hopefully encourage these policies and these practices to multiply, to become the norm, and to be well supported. Until, of course, in those countries, conditions are created for people to go back to their homes. So this is really, in a nutshell and in simple terms, what the forum wants to achieve. And I'm very encouraged. This morning, uh, 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 Dr. Mohamed El Jasser and I signed an agreement between the Islamic Development Bank and UNHR, a, a, a framework agreement somehow we can call it. And uh, uh, this is very promising. Ten years ago, this, we would not have thought of that. But I think the context is moving and a very humanitarian organization like ours, like ICRC, the fact that we can partner with a very development organization like the Islamic Development Bank is a good foundation for the approach that I have described. Thank you very much, uh, High Commissioner. <laughs> Indeed, we keep uh, repeating what you uh, teach us always, that inclusion is the best type of protection. And this requires a lot of policy development and working with uh, the legislation sector uh, as well. My next question is for Mr. Michael Collar. 
And when we speak about policy development, we also think of ECHO and the, the importance ECHO uh, gives to policy development in view of the protracted emergencies and the added triggers for displacement like uh, climate change. Uh, how does ECHO change their policies to adapt with such developments in the world? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Khaled. And thanks, of course, in particular to the Kingdom and to KS Relief for having us here. It's wonderful to be back after three years uh, at the Riyadh Humanitarian Forum and to discuss these topical issues. Now, um, it was said this morning in the panel that humanitarian aid today intervenes in eight out of ten cases in man-made conflicts. Does that mean that we are discussing the wrong issue here? Unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. Because obviously, and it was said by my uh, honorable co-panelists, very often a man-made conflict is just the consequence of climate conflict. When the resource base uh, diminishes, when there's no more water for a pastoralist society, for example, when there is drought for five, six years, this leads to displacement, it leads to conflict, it leads to instability, sometimes to war. So let's not be mistaken. Uh, there is a lot of climate impact even when you don't see it at first sight. But on top of that, you also have, unfortunately, the kind of direct impact of climate. And just if you look back the last six months, these devastating floods in Pakistan, 33 million people impacted, 10 million forcibly displaced by the floods. Or think of Somalia, 1 million people displaced because of the drought. They simply have to move elsewhere because they can no longer feed their cattle, they can no longer feed their families. Or even in Europe, we had a devastating wildfire season this summer. In countries like France, like Spain, like Greece, 150,000 people that were displaced because of fires in Europe. A totally new, a very bad experience for us. That means we need to gear up to it. We have to factor this in, in our response, in, in our anticipatory action. What is important to understand is, is when there is climate-induced uh, displacement, this is not only about the destiny of individual people, people who lose their homes, their livelihoods, um, basically the possibility to nourish their family. It also destroys communities. It destroys communities, which, has, which means it destroys resilience, it destroys economic basis, sometimes even cultural civilization. So there's a community and there is a macro uh, financial impact and macroeconomic impact beyond the sheer humanitarian dimension. And that means we need to address the issue on all fronts. First, humanitarian aid needs to be there, if possible, already before the event. Anticipatory action, training, preparedness, um, stockpiling of, um, of uh, goods that are necessary to help in such a situation. And there, I think the humanitarian sector, including DG ECHO, is really very much gearing up to that. Secondly, the way how we then deploy our aid needs to be multipurpose. It needs to address the various needs that such people have. They do not only need food, they do not only need health care, they do not only need schooling, they need everything. And that means we should have very flexible funding and we should have fungible funding. And that is one of the reasons why we go more and more for cash support. Because the persons that are involved, affected by such a crisis, need money to buy drugs, to buy food, to buy for example, the next uh, blanket or tent that they need. Uh, so you need to put them in a position to really cater in a dignified way for their needs. Uh, about 32% of our aid now is cash support in that context. And obviously, uh, I can only join Dr. Jasser, we need to come with a comprehensive response. Humanitarian aid does not do it all. Humanitarian aid helps immediately and buys time but buys time for other forms of aid to come in, like development aid, to rebuild, to resettle people. So we need to think from day one uh, in a nexus context. This has become a very, very marking feature for uh, humanitarian and development aid. 
and we're spending huge amounts of money on this, and not only uh, on the response, also on the anticipatory action. In more than half of our projects, we have today a disaster prevention component, mm -hmm. because uh, you better intervene before the uh, an ugly event than rather responding to it. So I think for ECHO, but also for other major agencies, um, disaster reaction and reaction to disaster displacement has become basically a new normal. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> Mr. Robert Mardini, when we mention ICRC, one immediately thinks of international humanitarian law, of the humanitarian principles, of what we used to call complex emergencies. But now I was just thinking, what do we call an emergency where people face an added emergency on top of their situation? So a complex emergency like Syria, and then you have the earthquake on top of that. So a disaster on top of uh, a disaster. How does ICRC plan its work, especially in uh, such uh, situations where armed conflict is a factor, and then on top of that you have something that compounds the uh, situation? Well, thank you, Khalid. And, uh also on my side, words of gratitude uh, to the KS Relief for organizing the third Riyadh International Forum. At this very important time where unfortunately uh, we see more conflicts happening, coming on top of old conflicts with no end in sight. And most of those conflicts are uh, compounded crises. Uh, there are conflicts on top of which comes uh, more and more visibly the consequences of climate change, uh, the recent uh, socio-economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, more recently the, the global knock-on effect of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which is affecting the, the, the very same people in the Horn of Africa, in the Sahel region, in the Middle East, in, in Afghanistan, who are bearing the brunt of those poly crisis or compounded uh, crisis. And you mentioned, Khaled, the ICRC and IHL, and I, I dare say that uh, as uh, guardians of IHL and international refugee law, respectively, so ICRC and UNHCR, have the responsibility to ensure respect for those very important bodies of international law. And this is why uh, ICRC and UNHCR, we joined forces on the same advocacy messages about ensuring international protection for people on the move uh, affected by conflict on uh, durable solutions for the di displaced uh, uh, and also uh, protecting the displaced uh, from returning to harm through the principle of no refoulement, which is absolutely critical. Um, and we see that uh, climate change is exacerbating uh, displacement of populations in many places. You mentioned Syria, uh, which is now uh, being devastated by um, uh, uh, an earthquake of an unprecedented magnitude coming on top of 12 years of devastated conflict, where today I think in Syria it's even hard to capture the size, the scope, and the depth of suffering of the people being killed, uh, being maimed. Uh, and Syria is also a place where water scarcity has been driving some tensions, even before the conflict started. So uh, th the very same people in the northeast of Syria are, and the northwest uh, are really carrying the brunt and the, and the, and the challenges of those compounded crises. So, uh, what should happen, and I think all humanitarian organizations have uh, been investing more and more on projects helping communities build their resilience to be able to absorb shocks beyond uh, delivering food and water trucking in the immediate hours of an emergency. We have to pivot to projects to uh, ensure the sustainability and the continuity of uh, water supply, 
uh, provision of health care services, uh, and also supporting the livelihoods of people uh, for farmers and herders in, uh, in places like the Sahel and Mali. Uh, our projects at ICRC aim really at uh, helping them uh, rehabilitate their irrigation projects because this is their most valuable asset to be able to produce food uh, for herders, also helping them um, uh, store uh, animal uh, feed in, 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 in community-led uh, fashion. And I think this really makes the case for humanitarian organization joining forces with development actors and we had the opportunity to discuss yesterday with Dr. Al Jasser on how we can join forces not for humanitarian organization to the work of development uh, agencies but just ensure or pave the way for development actors to maybe increase their appetite to risk in order to invest in those very communities um, affected by the intersection of conflict and, and climate change. In places like Gawa, for instance, uh, in northern Mali, it's a place that is not controlled by the government of Mali, and yet there are communities in need of dire water supply schemes. Uh, and you cannot do it by water trucking and with the money of ECO and other um, traditional donors. Uh, you need to encourage development actors such as the African Development Bank to maybe be more daring and engage and find solutions with local actors in order to help communities exit from this vicious cycle of conflict, violence, and climate change exacerbating uh, the stressor on, 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 on communities. Very much so. Thank you very much. And uh, another good segue to my next question to uh, Ms. Maimouna. I, I think there is an agreement amongst the speakers that we need to invest more in local capacities because <coughs> that is what makes the difference. The first responders are always the locals. The first responders are always local uh, officials and local communities. Uh, how does UN Habitat work to strengthen the capacities of mayors, of municipalities, of local communities, especially in areas <coughs> that are prone to disasters? Thank you so much uh, for that question. Uh, as a former mayor of the uh, city of uh, Penang, Malaysia, I faced the type of uh, crisis when in, in, in 2017, where the whole city was flooded. And I also s faced the same crisis where during the 2004, the tsunami. And, uh, and at the same time, the refugee, um, Rohingya, who you know, arrived at our coastline. And as, as a mayor, and as, a, as a, your question, to answer your question, as a mayor and as a frontliner, sometimes we are faced with very unprepared situation. And uh, one area is that, as I mentioned earlier, we really need to establish the response, emergency response procedure. What shall we do? Because the first, time, the first thing they will do is they will call the mayor. What shall we do, mayor? So I think this is very, very important. Now I am in the, the as a, in UN Habitat. First thing that is, and we are also a lot of my colleagues down there, they are looking at me, actually, Mr. Moderator, they said that you are last time part of us, but now you are there, please walk your talk and please help us. So I think what is the, the capacity here? We are facing with the four C crisis. One is COVID-19, one is climate change, third is crisis, either is it natural or man-made, and fourth is the capacity. The capacity here, it can be the human resource capacity, the knowledge, the technology that is in the, in the local government or the actual capital of funding. So UN Habitat work very closely with the um, 
through the network of uh, mayors, for example, Global Task Force, C40, uh, um, ICLE, and then uh, the, um, the Global Parliament of Mayors, through sharing of the best practices, through sharing a, a, a better practices that the cities that we work with. And then this is the, the sharing is can in many, many platforms. We have uh, um, during our World Habitat Day, World Cities Day, World Cities Forum. Last year, the World Cities Forum in Katawise, we have around at least 10 urban crisis track. We discuss in Katowice during the World Urban Forum and with all the stakeholders, we are putting the vertical and horizontal integration mm -hmm. from the global, from the regional, from the national and also from the, the uh, private sector, the, from community, from the NGO and also from the youth and women. So these are the platform that we can help the, uh, the frontliner or, or the mayors. Second is that we also include in terms of our work training, capacity training. I think now we develop online training. Last time we are before COVID, we have to go to the city to do the training. Now we have the online training. We came up with the syllabus online training in terms of the capacity, how to handle. And we have the um, the program, the flagship program call, I uh, just want to share with you here that uh, hopefully that we can have more partners to join us. Flagship program called Inclusive Cities, as what people said just now, Inclusive Cities Enhancing the Impact of Migration. We are working together with UNACR and IOM uh, on this matter and, we in, and the stakeholders, the partners are the local government. The partners are the mayors. So I think this is an area that we need to strengthen together. And at the same time, in terms of the helping them to come up with the plan. Because without the plan, for example, I have the opportunity to go to Mozambique during, after the Cyclone E Day. And you can see a lot of uh, uh, displaced persons. And the mayor who was there talked to me, and now he's already passed away due to the COVID. And he said that, Maimuna, please help us to come up with the master plan, where I can hold to the master plan. We have the legal backing to say that the people cannot build the house in that area because they are below sea level. And I know that it's below sea level, but I don't have the tool to say no or to take action because there is no plan. So please help us to do the plan. So we are also lo looking to do the national urban uh, 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 plan and at the same time the action plan and help them to do the, um, the uh, uh, financing through the city's investment facilities because sometimes they have the plan but they don't have the funding to implement the plan. So through the city's investment facilities where we launched during the World Urban Forum 2020 in Abu Dhabi, there are now already 64 cities with us. It started only with 34, 64 with us that we pair them with the, uh, with the uh, partners and the donors mm. for them to, to implement their plan. And we, as the, the partner, to see whether the plan is is aligned with the achievement of the 17 SDG and the 169 target. Thank you. So I call upon all the delegates here, please partner with us, with UN Habitat, partner with UNACR and partner with IOM so that we can help more people, the people that we serve. Sometimes we want to do more, but we have a very, very limited resources. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Great uh, call for action. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Jasser, in the humanitarian sector, we use a strange term about the humanitarian development nexus. 
And sometimes you wonder, what does this mean, actually? <laughs> I don't know if it is an excess or a continuum, or what do we need to call it? But we always ask ourselves, how can we capitalize on the capacities of development organizations? And my question to you is, there's something that we can do better as humanitarian organizations to improve this cooperation? And if there is something that development organizations can also do better to increase this cooperation in an innovative way with the humanitarian sector. <clears throat> Thank you, Khalid, for a very uh, good question. The first thing is that we, as representatives of all of these organizations, official, public, humanitarian, philanthropic, whatever we are, first we have to realize that we have to transcend our differences. There are differences, but we have to transcend them because those who are trying to help, those who are trying to serve, cannot wait for us to resolve those petty differences between organizations. I think that's the first lesson and the first advice I would give to myself and to my colleagues on this panel and beyond. Second, we have good lessons also. We have proven that we are capable of doing some of that. I'll give you a couple of examples. We have been involved with the King Salman Relief uh, uh, and Humanitarian Center and with the Qatar Fund for Development and the Gates, Melinda and, and Bill Gates Foundation to create, in 2016, to create what we call the, the Lives and Livelihoods Fund. This one, we use to finance very important things. For example, fighting Ebola, fighting uh, uh, polio, f a lot of poverty and health issues that were very, very devastating to the communities where they were. And we successfully implemented that. Syria refugees with Spark. And, 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 and others. We've done some very good work on education of Syrian refugees in their, uh, in their refugee areas. There are one of my favorite stories. One of the philanthropists that have put money with us and asked us to be guardian of the money and to use them as best as, uh, as we can. In Somalia, with all of the drought and all of the civil war and all of that, we found some human settlements, or call them villages, or whatever you want to call them, where they wake up their daughters to go and walk four hours to the nearest well to fetch water and come back four hours again. Eight hours every day to fetch water for the, for the families. We dug some wells in the village, built a school next to it, so you can imagine how transformational that operation has been. We have dug 65 wells in Somalia under that program, which was a philanthropic contribution by a, a philanthropist to, uh, to help with that. There are so many stories. I mean, we have actually, this conference has been, has been a, a providing a spark for, for a lot of uh, activities. And we're going to have, with I think the, the uh, UNHCR and with the uh, King Salman Relief Center, a conference on refugees. And that should be uh, something that I call everyone to, uh, to, participate, uh, to participate in. So there is, I mean, the recovery in these societies that have suffered from man-made and nature-made disasters really need all the help we can provide. So let's, let's really do the best we can. I mean, that is really, I mean, it hurts when you see some places that are not getting the help for sometimes simple reasons sometimes for political problems in the countries they are in, sometimes for logistical difficulties. We have to do our utmost. We have no excuse not to go and deliver. Thank you. Thank you. Very well said. <laughs> Hi, Commissioner.
the question about burden sharing and what could make burden, burden sharing. sharing and what could make the next global refugee forum more successful. And we spoke about what we need to do more, what development organizations <laughs> need to do more and better. What do you expect also from regional groups, regional powers, the countries? How can we make sure that we are following a solutions-oriented approach to displacement? Uh, I would uh, maybe take the question in a, in a broad sense and then uh, speak about the region and to say that uh, I just want to basically continue what Dr. Uh, Mohammed said. Uh, I don't know if it is, if you call it nexus, continuum. This is about working together, really. This is about working together in very simple terms. Now, it's not simple to do it, but it is possible and I think we are, I I've absolutely agree, we are proving it. In a way, you know, Let's be very frank. We humanitarians in particular um, work in an environment that attaches much, and understandably, much uh, importance to uh, visibility, to mandate, to uh, each organization having uh, uh, its own space. Uh, Donors want to have that visibility because they need to justify the use of their resources to their taxpayers. So all of this is, is normal in a way, but the magnitude of the challenges where we have been talking about even on this panel, ranging from conflict to crisis to uh, climate, um, natural disasters, they are such that uh, we actually live, we should not live in the era of individual action but in the era of partnerships in terms of how we do our work and uh, I have seen myself I also want to echo others I have seen amazing work done when these partnerships are realized you know in in a place like Kakuma in Kenya this is a, a refugee area uh, near South Sudan until a few years ago, this was one of the most difficult, challenging, derelict areas where people really struggled. And now, because of partnerships, we, are, uh, we have launched uh, pilots, projects, ideas that are really changing uh, lives, the lives of everybody not only of the refugees, but also of the local communities. But that was only possible through cooperation, first and foremost, the leadership of the national and local authorities that gave that space, then of course the humanitarians, then uh, uh, naturally the development organizations, but also the private sector came in. We are cooperating with the IFC, the, the the private sector branch, if you wish, of the World Bank Group, and they are doing what Robert was describing earlier. They are helping us de-risk investments for private sectors in a very fragile areas, and this has attracted in particular, through some appropriate incentives, uh, the national private sector, the Kenyan private sector, that is investing there and creating employment and progressively taking people away from dependency of humanitarian assistance. I'm giving that example and there's others that we are doing elsewhere to stress that this is only possible through uh, uh, cooperation, through partnership. And of course, through the, to, by putting in the center, in the middle, the people themselves. Because in the end, it's not anymore about giving them, but about making them self-reliant and able to lead and, and, and sustain their own lives. I think that this is burden sharing in the end. This is true burden sharing. Of course, on a, ma on a much broader scale, I have to say what most uh, is say, that uh, they are the ones uh, carrying the biggest burden in terms of displacement. 
they are the biggest donors because they make available land and resources and water and space and political capital in order to host refugees. So their claim is we need more than just some payment to balance the sharing of that responsibility. I agree, but I would add that, that the best of that burden sharing is through this uh, 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 multi-partner uh, uh, approach that uh, really can offer more sustainable solutions. And I do hope that that will happen at the next uh, uh, Refugee Forum. And before I close, if you allow me one more minute, is simply to say, to go to your other point, you know, I want to, like I did a bit this morning, but with more time now, uh, appeal to this region in which we are now. We are, many of us, international organizations, um, UN, NGOs, and others are increasingly working in, the, in this region. Uh, this region has a wealth of energy, of uh, uh, resources, of uh, new approaches, of philanthropy, of solidarity. It has a lot more even to offer the world. And I really want to appeal to organizations that are present here. Uh, representatives of civil society in this region, governments, uh, uh, foundations, you know, come on board in what we have described in this, in this new model of partnerships because your energies, your resources, your solidarity, your culture of philanthropy are very much needed by the whole world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And uh, Mr. Vitorino, uh, all the factors that the speakers and yourself spoke about lead to movement of people. People move because of persecution, they move because of violence, they move also because of economic situations. And that's what we jointly in the system call mixed movement of, of people. How do we work together as a humanitarian system to make sure that the protection needs of everybody are met? Not only people who are forcibly displaced, but people who also move out of economic uh, difficulties. I believe that today movements are in its vast majority mixed movements. As I said before, it's very difficult to distinguish what is the main driving force for someone to move. Yes, we know there are legal categories, refugees, asylum seekers, economic migrants, but then you have a large group of people that moves due to the interaction of different drivers. And as I said also before, I strongly believe that climate change is a multiplier and accelerator of movement because of other reasons, because uh, inequalities, uh, poverty, lack of governance, lack of security are uh, drivers of uh, mobility. And uh, when people are on the move, they are prone to the same risks and they have the same needs. Risks of traffic, risks of abuse, of gender-based violence, of uh, sexual exploitation and abuse, of uh, labor exploitation, but also they are in need of humanitarian assistance and life-saving assistance, and particularly for those who are internally displaced, there is a need to provide uh, uh, accommodation, shelter, basic uh, necessities, hygienic necessities, and then, of course, if they settle, there is a need to provide education and access to health care. So, these needs need to be taken on board by the entire UN system, building on the capacities of the different actors, the different players. And that's why I agree with Filippo when he mentioned that uh, we need to move beyond the mandates and we need to find the most articulated solutions, bringing on board to the solutions what each stakeholder can bring best. And this involves not just the UN system, this involves the multinational, the multilateral financial institutions that have a key role to play. This involves also the private sector. This involves the civil society. This is the joint endeavor 
if we want to keep human values up there in our societies. Great, thank you. Uh, need the need for more partnership, and my question is for Mr. Mardini this time. Uh, ICRC works with everybody, states and non-state actors, and at the same time tries to uphold the humanitarian principles. How could ICRC coordinate with other agencies in the field and at the same time maintain its privileged access in disaster areas, especially in compounded crises? No, thank you, Khaled. This is a very important question. And I think the, the macro equation is rising humanitarian needs because of unresolved conflict, shrinking aid budget. So the gap, unfortunately, is widening. Uh, and I can only join um, Filippo by saying how important it is to invest in partnerships. I mean, for ICRC, partnership starts within the Red Cross, Red Crescent family, with uh, 192 national societies, 15 million volunteers on the ground. Uh, but I think there is no question that uh, partnership should be extended across uh, the aid sector, among UN um, agencies, NGOs, but also local actors. Um, and, uh, and other actors, uh, the multinational uh, development banks, IFIs, it is clear that today there are many positive stories of that collaboration. If you take, for instance, a project in Goma, where in the outskirts of Goma today there are 300,000 people who have been displaced by the conflict in the eastern DRC, uh, who have no access to, to water. Uh, there is no question that a humanitarian organization can address a project of such a magnitude. Uh, and I think the work uh, that ICRC has done with Régis Desaux was to encourage the World Bank uh, to come. Um, uh, we did the study and today the project will be, uh, is, is underway uh, and it will be implemented by the World Bank and other actors. And that is leveraging uh, for people affected by armed conflict without uh, doing it ourselves. I think it's about also playing sometimes a catalytic role, creating a spark so that other actors can feel comfortable and overcome maybe the, their institutional reflexes and discomfort to be able to operate in those difficult places because the clock is ticking, uh, conflict is not being resolved, there are more conflicts, and the only silver lining is to uh, foster collaboration in those difficult places and create solutions for uh, people affected by conflict, climate change. I think another big challenge is the fact that, uh, let's face it and let's be honest, there is almost zero climate action and zero climate finance reaching countries affected by armed conflict. So I think much more needs to be done in order to create the comfort for those critical funds to reach also communities at the very local level and support uh, the locally led uh, action of communities that will help them reach or being on the path of uh, self-sustainability. Very much so. And this was the spirit of the localization agenda during the uh, World Humanitarian Summit as well. Which uh, brings me to the last question in this uh, panel to Mr. Kohler. And we spoke uh, about the increasing demands also on donor uh, agencies. Increasing needs come with increasing demands and increasing expectations. How does the European Union, how does ECHO deal with such an increase in humanitarian demands year after year? Well, the, the short answer to your excellent question is uh, just focus on it. But how do you do that? First, indeed, we need money. We need resources. There's never enough of it. <clears throat> and I can only, like uh, Robert, I can only echo, um, obviously, what Filippo said about n more resources that are required for that. But at least when you start at home, you need to do something uh, with your own resources. And in the European Union, 
we have dedicated 10% of our development assistance to displacement and migration issues. 35%, and here we're speaking about, about 30 billion euros until 2027, uh, is dedicated to uh, climate-related issues. And in my department, we have a specific budget line for uh, disaster prevention, which again adds uh, about 100 million or so. So first you need money. Then you need to find out what do you want to do with it. You need to conceptualize. Uh, and therefore, last summer, we have given ourselves a strategy on disaster and climate-related displacement. This is a policy paper that brings together humanitarian and development aid in the nexus spirit that uh, uh, colleagues here described so well. And thirdly, I think you need to bring about international cooperation, coordination, and advocacy. This is why uh, DG ECHO, on behalf of the EU, accepted to take the co-chair of the International Platform on Disaster Displacement in Geneva, together with our co-chair, Kenya. Uh, in this platform, we provide advocacy. We bring international uh, donors, countries, uh, stakeholders together uh, for better coordination, to put the issue on the international agenda, to do research and data collection, but ultimately also to come with concrete proposals on how the Nexus methodology could work out in given scenarios. Um, our presidency, our chairmanship of this platform will end uh, in half a year, and we're very keen for other countries to take over, because only if this becomes a perpetuous, coordinated international effort, then the scarce resources that we have can be used in a coordinated way, and we want to pull our weight behind that. Thank you very much. And uh, before I close this uh, discussion, I will give every speaker 30 seconds exactly to uh, send a message to the millions of people who need our assistance and who need the assistance of uh, many actors around the world. If you have 30 seconds to send them a message, what would you say? So we start from Dr. Jesser. <coughs> Me? Yes, you raised okay. your hand. Okay. Uh, <laughs> humanitarian help and development are inseparable, but they cannot be done by one organization as big as it may be. It can only be done by all of us, all the international organizations. Let's transcend our differences intensify our coordination, and be generous at this time of need. Very good. Ms. Maimouna? Yeah, I try to, to be short. Um, from what I can see from the trend just now that we have discussed, that urbanization of humanitarian crisis. And uh, urbanization of humanitarian crisis here is also involved resident, Refugee, IDPs, and migrant. Everybody. We are not only talking about refugee and, 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 and also the role of cities as an urban solution. Okay. And not forgetting the rural areas. So I think this is very important. And again, I would like to call to action on sustainable urbanization. Let flip the narrative that urbanization is bad. Let's flip the narrative that urbanization, sustainable urbanization, sustainable development is the solution to the urban crisis. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Mr. Mardini, 30 seconds. It's working. Yes, yeah. my message to people affected by conflict and compounded crisis those people living on the front line of, of these compounded crises, that the ICRC and the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement's support is unwavering and will continue to do everything we can to come up with the most sustainable uh, solution for their, for their needs and upholding their dignity in the worst of circumstances. Thank you. Mr. <coughs> Kohler? Uh, we want to make every effort not to treat you as subjects of our assistance, but as partners, so that we listen to your needs, 
and help you either to integrate where you are now or to go back safely and in a dignified manner with the help of the international community. Thank you very much, Mr. Vitorino. Well, no matter how large, big, smashing are the challenges, we truly believe that the agency and the empowerment of the communities are uh, at the center of the solutions because the international system is there to help them, to support them, to work to their benefit, but they need to be the protagonists of the real sustainable solutions. Mr. Grandi, the last 30 seconds are yours. And I will uh, start like uh, Antonio did, no matter how big the challenges, and believe me, if you sit in some of our seats anyway, most, all of our seats actually, you can see how big they are, those challenges. Please don't give up. And we all have something to contribute, whether we are governments <coughs> or international institutions and organizations, civil society, NGO, uh, philanthropic groups, individual citizens, we can all make a difference and we owe that hope, that giving hope to those that are really impacted in the, in the front line of being impacted by all the difficult crises that we have spoken about. So please, don't give up. But Last message, don't give up. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Testing. Hello all, we're starting the session right now on the achieving of sustainable development goals through the humanitarian development and peace nexus, aka the triple nexus. Please all the speakers come to stage.
Menschen. Thank you to all the speakers. Starting the session right now. Thank you all for coming to this session focused on achieving the sustainable development goals through the Humanitarian Development and Peace Nexus, AKA the Triple Nexus. This topic was recognized as a priority during the previous forum. The sustainable development goals have an unprecedented scope. It's a plan of action for the people, planet, and prosperity. In 2015, the 17 goals were established and are aspired to be achieved by the year 2030. While the triple nexus refers to the interlinkages between the humanitarian development and peace actors, specifically, it aims for these areas to work together more coherently in order to effectively meet people's needs. This session is very timely as we're witnessing an increasing crises unfolding globally and persisting conflict drivers. Furthermore, the SDGs have gone backwards due to the COVID-19 pandemic. According to figures, countries that are facing the biggest struggle in achieving the SDGs are in fragile contexts. And in 2030, more than 80% of people living in extreme poverty are expected to come from these fragile contexts. This fragility has transborder implications on a regional and global level. Today with us to discuss this critical topic is a distinguished panel of senior leadership, representatives, and experts from the United Nations Agency's funds and programs, Qatar Charity, and the Saudi Arabia Ministry. I have the pleasure of introducing them to you all. We have with us Mr. Peterson, the Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund. Ms. Zena Ali Ahmed, the Resident Representative of the United Nations Development Program in Yemen. Mr. Ahmed Saad al Rahimi, Director of External Affairs and Qatar Charity. Dr. Adham Abdel Minam, the, uh, the World Health Organization representative in Saudi Arabia. Ms. Yara Sindi, the general manager of monitoring and reporting for sustainable development at the Ministry of Economy and Planning in Saudi Arabia. Mr. Giovanni Cassani, senior advisor on internal displacement in the International Organization of Migration. And Dr. Hakim al -Wa'ar, the Food and Agriculture Assistant Director General and Regional Representative in MENA. And I will be moderating this session. My name is Jude Wasal Harthi, previously Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs in the United Nations and the Executive Secretary General Office, Rule of Law Unit. Now I will go around to ask our distinguished panel questions, but we will open it up to the Q&A session to the audience. If there are any interesting points that are raised, that you would like to elaborate on, please take note of it so that you can raise that question during the Q&A session. Starting us off today will be Mr. Peterson. Can you please share with us, with us what is UNFPA's value proposition in the Peace Nexus, please? Yes, it be my pleasure. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to be in this panel. Thank you to KS Relief for the leadership and uh, the government of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is very important, by, and I, I think it's very timely to have a bit more operational discussion in a way after the very good analysis we heard this morning. We know that we are in a situation with many, many conflicts, um, uh, increasing number. For UNFPA as an agency, that has also uh, meant uh, total change, or not total, but significant change in the way we are working. Last year, 45% of our non-core funding was actually for humanitarian activities, which is a huge increase just over the last eight, 10 years. 
And we have talked about the Nexus for a number of years, and we try to then make it into uh, actual way of working. In our current strategic plan for the 2022 to 25 uh, period, um, we have actually integrated our human intern activities as one of the strategic outcomes uh, of the strategic plan. This is new. Previously, it was seen as something in addition to our long-term developed uh, work, but now we have totally integrated it. It also springs from our mandate and the, what we call the three transformative results in our strategic plan. Uh, zero maternal death for preventable reasons, zero um, unwanted pregnancies, and zero gender-based violence. If we look at these three uh, results that we want to achieve with our partners, a lot has to be done then in conflict-ridden or disaster string areas because we know, for instance, last year there was around 121 million unwanted pregnancies globally and 65 million were in uh, refugee or uh, internally displaced settings. We know gender-based violence increases with, uh, with, uh, with wars, with conflicts, uh, so it's somehow in our DNA, you can say, in terms of our, um, our strategic plan and our goals. And then we have to deliver, and we're doing that internally by strengthening uh, the capacity, integrating uh, the analysis as well, but we're also doing it uh, in, uh, externally with, with partners, um, building upon the, the long-term uh, relations, network partnerships in certain times of crisis. Um, Afghanistan is an example, for instance, because we have been there for many years, 30 years, and, uh, and, and we have worked and we are working uh, with local family health centers in providing support for, for women and, and adolescent girls in particular for, for reproductive health uh, related uh, uh, and family health uh, issues and, and child uh, issues. And that network we have been able to use as, as uh, the platform or the partnerships to scale on in terms of a sudden crisis that, that we saw. Uh, so we actually been able to, to maintain uh, delivery of services for women, by women, and also to scale on based on the network we have. Uh, so I think this is part of the, um, the work that needs to be done. It goes for capacity building of our own staff. It goes for with partners we work with. And it goes also, of course, for the partnership within, within the UN family and within the, the broader uh, international society and civil society. One last point, <laughs> actually, we are working very much through uh, uh, it's, uh, implementing partners and very much through local organizations. That's where, as was also mentioned this, this morning, where you get the long-term resilience by building up the local capacity. And that's why we are focusing a lot, almost 40% of our work with uh, uh, civil society implemented partners is with local uh, organizations, uh, so we are able to, to scale up the capacity in a longer term and use that when we need to respond very quickly to a sudden crisis. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. And what is the United Nations Population Fund um, perspective on the financing and funding mechanisms needed to strengthen the humanitarian development and peace nexus? Yeah, first of all, more funding is needed, as has been uh, underlined uh, several times this morning, and as has also been underlined already, more flexible, more durable, long-term financing is needed uh, more core financing to the organizations would be the best because that allows us for actually very flexibly shifting uh, when uh, priorities or activities when needed. The COVID pandemic is an example of that. If we didn't have this uh, uh, institutional basis from our core uh, financing, we wouldn't have been able to, to react so far. But uh, partnership, we are looking uh, outside of the traditional. We are so grateful for all the, uh, for all the support we still get from the, from the, we can say, traditional donors, but we're also looking outside of there. We're working with the international finance institutions uh, also to see how we can leverage 
our mantra in, in our plan is actually from financing to funding to try to to uh, both do direct funding but also leverage and I think it will be, uh, it's on the way and it's also needed I think we have to talk to our partners in particular government who are donors the world is not divided into budget lines when catastrophes and conflicts happen and we just have now the example I think it was mentioned this morning as well uh, in Syria after the earthquake we, I mean, if you want to address the needs there now, you have to do it also looking ahead and, and, and being in a resilient in terms of uh, infrastructure, water and so on, but also houses. And how can you in that respect try to distinguish, was your house destroyed by war or was it destroyed by earthquake, right? Because we have different boxes, so maybe we don't have. So I think uh, we need flexible funding uh, and we need uh, the possibility actually of uh, of being able to shift priorities without losing the long-term uh, perspective, uh, because it's only through the long-term perspective that we build up the resilience needed. Thank you for the valuable insights, Mr. Peterson. Moving on to get a field perspective is Ms. Zena from the UNDP program in uh, Yemen. Ms. Zena, you have had a remarkable career with UNDP throughout the region, including work in some of the most challenging situations where we see tens of millions of people that have been displaced, either due to conflict, natural or man-made disasters, or simply seeking a better life. As UNDP is a key institution on the ground, where many of these issues intersect. Can you tell us a little more, please? Thank you very much, Trude, and thank you for KS Relief, actually, for a very timely discussion, if I may say, on the humanitarian development nexus. And I say timely, not only because of what we heard from the last session that was uh, being discussed in terms of internal displacement, but because we see that conflicts around the world are increasing, both man-made and natural disasters. We see that they are becoming protracted. We see that they are becoming cyclical. Sorry, Ms. Zena, the volume? We see, is it better? Yes. Is it better? Yes, yeah, I thank think you. It's better. So we see that conflicts actually are increasing in intensity. We see that they are becoming protracted, they are becoming cyclical, and the effects that they have in terms of the development trajectory is humongous all over the world. Crises have also actually, and conflicts have resulted, as we have heard from the last session, in issues related to internal displacement. Over the last decade alone, we have seen a doubling in terms of internal displacement. And here I'm not talking about refugees. I'm talking about those who are internally displaced within their own countries. And as we've seen, there are many, many causes for internal displacement. It is either conflict, it's conflict over natural resources, it's lately climate-induced displacement, where, by the way, the World Bank is estimating that by 2050, more than 200 million people will be displaced around the world only because of climate-induced uh, displacement. Here I have to note, very importantly, that displacement has a differentiated effect on different populations. The effect of displacement on women is different than those on men, on children, on youth, mostly on all vulnerable populations, and that has to be taken into consideration. So if we look at the humanitarian development peace agenda, we can look at the action agenda that was launched by the United Nations Secretary General to look at internal solutions to internal displacement, to protracted internal displacement. And it looks at three main pillars. One is to help those IDPs or internal displaced populations to, to work on the prevention agenda in terms of preventing internal displacement and three is the protection agenda for those who are displaced. So this agenda, global agenda, is actually a translation of the humanitarian development peace nexus in action and, and this continuum of the nexus should look at three things the prevention agenda, 
which I honestly think that as an international community we all fail to address. We address much more the response, which is the second pillar. And then what we need to look at is innovative development solutions to prevent displacement, to prevent conflict, to prevent crisis. Any development solution has to be holistic, it has to be comprehensive, and it has to be integrated. And let me end by saying I'm a deep believer that without a prevention agenda and working on the root causes from the start, we will not be able really to tackle issues related to conflict and crises, and as a result, internal displacement. Thank you for the thorough breakdown of the needs, Ms. Sena. Building on that, it's widely understood that UNDP works closely with the authorities, decision makers, governments, and the community to create and implement the projects that are locally owned and led and are sustainable. Can you go into a little more detail about what UNDP has done in the region and share some examples, good practices? Uh, being a field person, I've never worked in headquarters, I have to say. I've worked in all of the countries of the Arab region. But let me uh, share one success example of what we have done as UNDP with the international community in Iraq to look at what we call the funding facility for stabilization. And it is an exact operationalization of the humanitarian development and peace nexus, and it has been a huge success due to different reasons. If I look a little bit at the context, you know, we all know that there was territorial control of ISIL or so-called Daesh in Iraq that took over around a fifth, even more, of the territory of the country and ended up in displacing more than 6.5 million Iraqis out of their homes. There has been then, of course, the coalition to defeat ISIL, which was a coalition of international, a military coalition of international actors to defeat so-called uh, Islamic State at that moment. However, the coalition also had a good cause and sense of civilian stabilization. So one arm was military stabilization and the other arm was the civilian stabilization. Because the whole idea was if we do not, even if we liberate these areas, if we do not bring people back, it will not stabilize. So the whole stabilization agenda was implemented in Iraq. It was supported by a coalition of 30 partner countries, 3-0, which is humongous, to the order of around $1.5 billion. This has, it is a success story in the sense that after five years or six years, it has resulted in the return of more than five million Iraqis back home through an integrated approach that looked, again, comprehensively at what would bring people back, but then keep them in their lands. So we worked on the rehabilitation of damaged infrastructure and services, schools, roads, uh, health systems, water, sanitation, etc., to ensure that there is access to basic services for those returnees, while at the same time working on local economic development, so livelihoods creation for those who are returning. There was also a fourth pillar that we used to call a window of operation that also ensured that local security actors are also empowered to be able to provide rule of law and security for those who are coming back. And finally, cutting across the whole stabilization agenda was reconciliation and social cohesion. I have to say we're very proud as, as UNDP to be leading on that with other uh, actors, development actors and the sister UN agencies. And it is a success story that I think we will learn from as UNDP. We have been looking at the model and now we are implementing it in Libya, we're implementing it in Mali and in other countries around the world. Thank you very much, Ms. Zena. Diving deeper into the region, we'll move to Mr. Ahmed, uh, looking at perspective from GCC, specifically the Qatar charity. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, reflecting the humanitarian development and peace nexus collaborations on the ground, what are Qatar charities' experiences and examples that you can highlight to us today? 
Yeah, thank you very much, Jude. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'd like to thank King Sama Center for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, conference. Uh, I want to be a bit practical and give uh, proper examples. My colleagues already highlighted crises being protracted and complex and so on. Um, so in QC, we implemented uh, two projects I believe can highlight the nexus in implementation. The first being um, in Darfur. Um, after the peace treaty that was signed in Doha in 2011, um, Kara Charity went in and implemented a project that included the complexes and uh, addressed the water scarcity issue. So in, so in that aspect, we addressed three main issues of the conflict uh, primarily. The first was water scarcity. So we built uh, water wells um, across Darfur um, that enabled access to water, it eased tensions. The second was obviously reconstruction in the area. So we had eight complexes, multi-dimensional complexes built um, to reintegrate uh, IDPs. The third, obviously, is after building the trust with the community itself, we were able to convince them to come back and inhabit these complexes. The second uh, example, being in, in Malaysia, um, obviously it's a bit out of context of, of conflict. However, uh, we went in after the generous um, donations of uh, Qatar Fund for Development, where we're implementing health projects education for the Rohingya refugees. It was at the request of the government. At the start of the project, um, QC um, uh, implemented a basic humanitarian needs of health. We then built PHCs, mobile clinics, etc., for specifically Rohingya refugees. Um, but throughout COVID, the government requested that they utilize these PHCs for Malaysians themselves. So that enabled the harmony between the two communities. Second of all, when it comes to education, um, at the beginning, we were, re we were requesting for the Malaysian curriculum to be utilized by the refugees. Um, now, after building the trust with the government and, and the local community, we're able to, get, to grant that. Um, so I believe these two examples show us why the nexus is, in, is, is needed. It's needed early in implementation. Um, it can be planned. And uh, jointly with our partners, so for example, in the, in the example of Malaysia, we uh, very kindly requested from the UNHCR the proper PACs, where to build them, and so on. So that shows also the collaboration on the ground. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. And then building on that, what could be done then to enhance our current approach to the triple nexus? So if you, if you allow me to be a bit critical and, and tangent on that side, um, I've been in the humanitarian field much less than my esteemed colleagues here. I've been uh, about five years or so. And we're always talking about coordination in, in the humanitarian field. Um, from my experience, I feel that the cluster level coordination is, is very good right now. However, the strategic level coordination is, is a bit lacking. Um, if, we, if we take an example, the earthquake right now or any other um, interventions, it feels like everyone is going in and then we dive back and ask for coordination, etc. Uh, the second, obviously, that links to it is donor agencies demanding um, perhaps a development plan from um, implementing partners. And that could be done perhaps early at the phase. It could be done at the uh, location level. Um, uh, any kind of, of coordination in that sense also assists. Um, third, obviously, being we need to fix the root issues of the cause. So. In the context of Darfur, we tried to build water wells to ad address the issues of the conflict. Um, and if you allow me to also be a bit frank, it seems that usually INGOs and UN partners, etc., always try to go for the funding first and then the planning after. I don't want to be a bit, bit too critical, but in that sense, I feel if we focus on, on the alliances at, at networks that we're in, so um, early in the earthquake, QC, put out a statement addressing the humanitarian needs to Syria. Um, but alliances and networks are there for that factor. So we didn't see alliances being properly implemented in that sense. There is no coalition that comes in early to discuss the needs, um, where we're located, who has access, etc. So I believe these th three aspects will very much enhance the, the nexus implementation. Thank you for the critical insight, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you. Now to highlight to us the, uh, the aspect from the uh, highlighting the health systems is Dr. <coughs> Adham Abdul Minam from the World Health Organization. Dr. Adham, you worked in different complex emergencies. 
and you also worked for years developing health systems in different countries. From your own experience, can you provide a clear example of how the triple nexus can be efficiently implemented in humanitarian settings? Yes. Um, uh, f first of all, thank you, Jude, for the question, and thank you for um, accepting me here uh, on behalf of Dr. Uh, Rick Brennan, who's supposed to be here with us, but he's uh, looking after emergencies, Syrian crisis, so real apologies. Um, let me start by saying that, uh, as you mentioned, I spent maybe 10, 15 years of my life working on health systems, which is basically developmental area of work, strengthening the healthcare services provided to citizens. But at the other side, I spent the last six years of my life operating in Iraq and Yemen, pure emergency uh, um, uh, operation um, that, uh, that also required yeah, or got me a first-hand experience of seeing how the emergency part of business is done. And in all honesty, what I can tell you, since we're here trying, uh, sitting here to find answers, is that the situation to me looked like we are having two banks of a river and we need a bridge between them. And that would be our nexus. On the one side, on the emergency part uh, of the river, the donors, the stakeholders are looking for quick interventions. The, of course, it's simpler and easier to respond to emergencies by you know, throwing in terms of health emergency kits, trauma kits. Very quickly, you can make an impact and show the value of your donation and investment. While, of course, on the other side, on the developmental, you need sustainability. And it takes time for you to realize the return on your investment. Nevertheless, that you need to build health information systems and other tangible uh, things that will enable you to deliver. Between these two, there's numerous examples that I have seen and worked my background on development, injecting some of the developmental interventions into what we do. The, you'll be surprised for all of you to know that a classical example of nexus that we all overlooked was actually COVID-19. In the times where in your country you had a surge of, uh, of cases, this is pure emergency operation where we are all running after oxygen cylinders, uh, trying to uh, look for PCR machines and enough kits to operate. This is exactly what happens during a pandemic or an emergency. But then when the wave goes down, we as, a, we as, uh, as countries and, and, and UN agencies working there try to strengthen health systems by preparing ourselves for the next wave, trying to buy oxygen beds, ventilators, and so on to empower the health system to be able to respond to the next wave. And between this push and pull, there, this is a classical example of how both can work together in rhythm to achieve the intended uh, result. I will, uh, one of the big examples we have here is actually Saudi Arabia, since I am taking over here uh, um, as a country rep. Saudi Arabia did very well during COVID. But mind, and maybe the Saudis uh, joining me here, some applications came out uh, uh, into existence applications, digital apps, virtual hospital, virtual consultations that were developed for the emergency purposes, but with a mindset that they will have a life on its own that will extend and go beyond COVID. Now COVID restrictions are lifted, but still those applications are being used and, and developed more. The key here, Jude, is to think long term, even during emergency settings. Instead of throwing trauma kits, think how to equip primary health care centers properly. Instead of uh, uh, re relying on international NGOs, think of how to use local capacities, capacitate them to take over after we leave, and so on. So that's, I think, are some of the examples that I encountered and can be used as examples of the nexus and how both can work together. Very interesting. And you just spoke about the two riverbanks and the need to develop the triple nexus as a bridge between them. Then can you provide a model that is capable of bringing development and humanitarian actors, donors together for a proper implementation of the triple nexus at the country level? 
Thank you. That's uh, um, a very, uh, you know, I've, I've always thought about it. Working in Yemen, for example, I've always seen that we always mostly work with emergency donors. Developmental donors, you feel that they're waiting at the doorstep for them, what's next? I think the best model is that since we said we need a bridge between them, I think this bridge is easily could be composed of four sectors. The first part, when we look at a country, we always do the mistake that if there is a, a man-made or natural disaster, we always think of this whole entire country as one emergency. That's not true. In many countries which we visited or worked at, there are some places at the, at the front line of a conflict or, or at the place where the earthquake happened or whatever. This is pure emergency, 100%. We go in as emergency, we, we try to stop further deterioration of the situation, and that's the, the first part. But there are other places away from that but being, you know, uh, being affected by that situation where we have um, access issues there, we can still consider it as emergency, but we have to interject some developmental activities into it. For example, if you're away from the front line, but still you have access problem to, the, to areas or governorates that are affected, it is very simple that you can, lose, you can use local NGOs to still maintain hospital operations, to still inject some of your supplies, to, to provide essential health services in these places. It's very easy to do that. So there is a pure emergency operation. There is an emergency operation with small uh, uh, developmental interventions. And definitely there are places inside the same country where, when the, uh, where that, that, that do not feel the emergency, that are living normally. The citizens of these areas need normal services. So you think of a country as all emergency, which is actually on the ground, is not true. And for these people, yes, they are affected partially by emergency. They are affected by the economic conditions of the country, by the ongoing conflict, but still they need to live their daily normal routines. And in these kind of situations, developmental donors should play a role in maintaining essential services, in providing them in that context of some uh, of the basics. So a model would be to, at the onset of emergency, we should break down the country into areas at the front line, 100% affected, partially affected, or non-affected by the emergency. That would be a good model to inject pure emergency donors here, pure developmental donors here, and a mixed hybrid model between the two where they can operate together. Thank you. Very insightful. Thank you very much, Dr. Adham. Now to contextualize to us the SDGs and the triple nexus from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia perspective is Ms. Yara from the Ministry of Economy and Planning. Ms. Yara, what are the major current and future efforts and steps that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is taking to ensure coherence in achieving the sustainable and development goals? Thank you, Jude. I think this is a very important question and I believe that the Kingdom has took several steps and major key decisions to actually achieve sustainability. And we really do see that um, sustainability is within the heart of Vision 2030 since its inception. And um, recently, or actually a, a year ago, we have established the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the Sustainable Development Steering Committee, where 20 key government entities sits on the board and to oversee the full implementation of the SDGs. And through um, this committee, or the governance of this committee, we actually have an advisory board where we invite international organizations, private sector, and the civil society to start engaging on the several recommendations and policies that we are developing within this committee. And I believe this dynamic supports us to understand or get a little bit of a view of what is happening on a local level, as well as an international level and connect these efforts together. So basically to ensure um, that we are really working and addressing the specific SDG challenges, the dynamic or the way that we approach this agenda is through shifting our thinking into a problem-based um, approach. 
and where we regularly highlight the major challenges that we're facing and try to collectively come up with different initiatives to address these challenges. And through this way, we are delivering on the Vision 2030 objectives or targets with a centerpiece of sustainability. And we are designing a lot of, pro uh, a lot of programs that are sustainability focused to cater to different levels within our community and different challenges locally and globally. The steering committee also works on mainstreaming the SDGs into policy making. And this is for the purpose of ensuring that we are really working on better well-being and quality life in Saudi, stronger economic prosperity and social development, as well as ensure environmental protection overall. And one of the major goals that we highlight as um, a key goal to address, which is the partnership goal, and I believe ODA efforts within the kingdom has really been significant to address the specific goal. So ODA is a major source of financing, and this is also really integral within the element of the SDGs. And Saudi Arabia, through its efforts and many related entities, we were able to build a more self reliant, resilient, and peaceful societies. So the inception in April 2015 um, of the King Salman Humanitarian Aid and Relief Center as the country's humanitarian agency was a landmark step in the development of the kingdom's official uh, development assistance, as well as the, um, the Saudi Development Fund, where there are a lot of several projects and development programs that has been really um, yeah, put into place, let's say. So KSA provides several categories of, of ODA, from humanitarian aid to development aid, like economic and social well-being for developing countries, and also charitable aid in the countries. Um, so a lot of these initiatives really are strongly related to achieving specific objectives within the SDGs, and to overall address the main targets within our Vision 2030. Thank you very much, Ms. Seattle, for the concrete examples. And then, how does the Triple Nexus approach then support in achieving the SDGs? So, during the 2016 World Humanitarian Summit, I believe we collectively recognized that conflict is the main driver of the humanitarian need and that the current systems are not sustainable and we really need to collectively work together to make sure that we are accelerating into that um, achievement of sustainability. And KSA provided a lot of humanitarian development assistance of over 24 billion um, for different um, low-income countries as well as the middle-income countries. And uh, what we really want to relate is how are we really addressing these specific issues when it comes to SDGs and the efforts that we're working on. So the sustainable development goals and targets are really efforts to combat poverty, <coughs> hunger, uh, by limiting environmental degradation. And subsequently, this is done by promoting health, education, gender equality, decent work, economic growth, as well as providing clean water, strong global partnerships, and cooperation of peace and justice. So we need to strengthen our collective efforts to be more in sync rather than silo at a local level, national level, and internationally as well by the different integral actors to provide specific solutions um, to address sustainability. And for example, one of the challenges globally that are currently being faced is education. And education transforms lives and every generation should have better access to good education than the last, while ensuring that no one is left behind. And within the kingdom, we really try to put some quality and high-performing education systems that reflects our unique and diverse society. It is modern and responsive com combination of traditional principles as well as innovation and creativity into fresh thinking. We focus on maximizing students' participation, progress and achievements, and responding to the identity and language and culture. 
We aim for a public education system that provides all Saudis with the lifelong learning opportunities so that they can discover and develop their full potential. We also address and continuously will address the gender equality specific issues and we're really working on um, leading that and to, to be able to be more inclusive in our society. Um, so I think um, there are so many different goals that we can really um, touch upon and I believe there are a lot of achievements within the kingdom to really work on uh, sustainability as well as from a humanitarian angle. Thank you, Jude. Thank you for that comprehensive uh, insights, uh, in Ciara. Uh, moving now, as we've heard a lot on fragile contexts and situations, we'll be moving to Mr. Giovanni from the International Office of Migration. Um, Mr. Giovanni, fragile contexts present unique consideration when it comes to the fulfillment of the SDGs. Many have highlighted this in the panel. Why is this? And what can be done to move the dial on SDG achievements in such contexts? Thank you. Thank you, Jude, for the question. And thank you uh, to KSC for organizing this, this event today. <clears throat> Let me just say that one of the principal uh, promises of the SDG is to leave no one behind. However, when we look at the world around us um, and we look at you know, what's, what's happening because of conflict and natural disasters, we must challenge ourselves and see where there are people that are actually being left behind. And if we look at the population of IDPs, internally displaced people, they really represent some of the most vulnerable people out there. They've lost their assets, they've lost their income, they've lost their houses, and they are now in a complete transition um, because their life has been disrupted. If you look at the numbers, uh, we know that there's 60 million IDPs out there at the moment, and this is up as of 2021. If we add the displacement that happened in 2022, for example, the population of Ukraine, where we estimate a displacement of around 7 million, we are clearly moving up, possibly in the range, you know, in a, in a much bigger range. And no country is spared from displacement. Um, if you look at some of the latest reports, 141 countries in 2021 were affected by displacement. A lot of displacement happens in fragile context. According to OECD, 80% of the displacement is in fragile context. And those countries are also receiving 95% of humanitarian aid. And they also host 70% of the world extreme poor, poor people. Um, so clearly, if we don't work on that specific population that is placed, there's going to be an impact on the SDG, a very, very significant impact on the SDGs. Um, if we look at the countries hosting IDPs, in 50% of them, the SDGs are going in the wrong direction. So one of the tools that was developed recently, and uh, my colleague Zain had just mentioned it, is the Secretary General's Action Agenda, which is really an effort um, to change the way we look at this issue. And the agenda says very clearly at its inception that more of the same is not good enough. And displacement cannot be solved with humanitarian tools alone. Actors across the spectrum, and I'm talking humanitarian, development, but also peace, disaster reduction, climate actors should join forces to tackle this challenge. If we can solve displacement, if we can bring those people to a level playing field with their host communities, then there's hopes that the track towards achieving SDGs can be achieved. The, the Secretary General Action Agenda really represents a roadmap to get there, uh, to bring together all those actors, and really to, to focus on several kind of key elements uh, to, to get to that point. One is to ensure that there's a strong government leadership. The government has to be in the driving seat of this exercise. 
there has to be a more, a better organized international community in support of the doc, the government, to set up all the necessary um, kind of systems to provide this uh, system, this support for the government. And there has to be a concerted effort to develop a solution strategy with all the actors involved so that there's a common goal, a collective action that needs to be achieved uh, on this matter. And then, of course, it's important to mobilize the right financial resources. And here we're talking beyond humanitarian. Uh, we're talking development financing. We're talking IFI financing. And I think that's the direction of travel that hopefully we will get once this all Durable Solution Action Agenda is set in motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giovanni. Then, building also on that, how can an access-based approach be used to turn the current challenge displacement poses into a catalyst for the achievement of SDGs in fragile contexts? Yeah, I, as I said before, um, I think we need to move on from an approach uh, that really focused on accompanying displacement uh, to a process that really looks at solving displacement from the start. And really, I th only one way to do this is to work on prevention, I was mentioned before, so reduce displacement to start with, reduce the numbers, <clears throat> then do a better work when we provide a humanitarian response, thinking of solutions from the start, including that since the beginning, and this was mentioned by colleagues before me, and then, of course, focusing on solutions. Uh, very often, we leave the solutions to the future, to uncertain, uncertain actors. Well, you know, we should all collaborate to bring this change forward. And that's how we should all operate um, uh, after the adoption of this action agenda. We need to look at a very integrated, holistic approach. So really um, utilizing the nexus uh, from the start. And, uh, and try to, to insert all of the elements coming from different sides of the house, different expertises across the UN and beyond the UN to achieve those goals. I want to mention a couple of examples of how IOM, my organization, the International Organization for Migration, is trying to change uh, the approach towards displacement. For example, when it comes to data, I think we have a very solid uh, data collection tool. We call it the displacement tracking matrix. You will hear about it next, uh, tomorrow, actually. Uh, this is a, a repository of data, primary data on displacement. And uh, for example, over the course of last year, it was able to monitor 39 million uh, IDPs around the world and 26 million ret uh, returnees in 80 countries. Now, the DTM, which has f uh, historically fo been focused on tracking displacement, is really trying to look at ways in which it can expand this focus and open up to better prevention, working on prevention numbers, and also on solutions, how to help the actors that are working on solutions um, find the right information to support the process. Another example of how IOM is working on these matters is um, in South Sudan, where together with the World Bank, the organization is working on a major infrastructure project uh, that is uh, really focusing on building small and medium scale infrastructure together with governance um, to prevent further displacement or to protect displaced people from, from flooding, from uh, recurring events. So this is a very successful, for example, approach that the organization is trying to put together. And maybe finally, I would conclude with an example from uh, Ukraine, which is an example of how the organization is really trying with other actors, other sister UN agencies, to step up durable solutions even during an active conflict. Uh, so the colleagues on the ground have chosen two separate locations, one in which people have returned and are restarting their lives, and one in which people are locally integrated because they don't see any option to return back home. And these two pilots are going to be very critical because it's in those contexts that tools will be tested, um, approaches will be um, used in the context and adapted to the context of Ukraine. 
to really kickstart the, the durable solution process and be ready for when bigger scale uh, returns can take place. So in conclusion, I just want to say that if we manage to resolve displacement with this new, new approach, if we manage to tackle it earlier on, then member states will be um, in a better position to achieve the SDGs and go back to their developmental pathway. Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive and holistic answer, Mr. Giovanni. And now moving to Dr. Hakim from the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, FAO is mandated to lead on food systems transformation. Where does it see its leadership in terms of the triple nexus? Thank you, Jude, and good afternoon to everyone. And thanks to uh, Case Relief for having this opportunity. Um, food is uh, one of the sectors uh, that, of course, highly impacted by conflicts. And you mentioned about the FAO's uh, leadership in driving the nexus. Now, maybe we need to take a step back and think about you know, what has motivated the whole idea of the nexus. There is this old thought about you cannot have peace if you don't have development in place. But you cannot progress with development if you don't have peace. And then humanitarian aids came in as a way to shift people from the state of no peace or conflict into starting the development progress. And this is where, where the link comes in. FAO started a, a pilot program on developing what we know today as IPC, which is the Integrated Phase Classification. It's an important framework that's used today by um, most of the international uh, donors to identify which categories and communities that require immediate humanitarian assistance and where the development assistance is needed. Very important that the IPC, the Integrated Phase Classification, which looks at uh, acute food insecurity, chronic food insecurity, and acute malnutrition, and classifies them into what we know today as five uh, categories or phases, from uh, no food insecurity issues, to stressed communities, to communities in crisis, and then to communities in emergency, leading to five, which is the catastrophic situation that leads to famine. Um, these are essential because they will allow and inform the decision-making um, institutions, organizations, as well as donor communities to identify which of the community affected, let's say in Yemen, how much is the percentage that needs immediate humanitarian assistance in terms of food and how much that would need uh, development. But the other important aspect where the FAO roles comes in as a leadership is to avoid more of those who are on the low phase categories to move to the other phase if the conflict protracts as, as what we see today. The agri-food systems, as we refer to them in FAO, are built around a number of aspects, including local value chains. And FAO works and have many examples on developing and promoting the local value chains for the communities, affected communities. And I've heard some interesting interventions from the colleagues here, our colleague from UNDP in Yemen, and the uh, other interventions also from WHO, identifies that it's not the whole community affected equally in a conflict situation. There are always people on the front line, and, there, and that's where the IPC classification comes in and tells us that these, piece, these people in this region, they're well, that's where you can invest more on development and there's more immediate need in, 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 in crisis situation. Now, what we try to do is that we try to benefit from that classification in a scientific way to identify where we can be, promote people so that we also reduce IDPs, uh, so we allow people to, to, to come in and, and remain uh, in their lands. And we have recent examples of uh, in Syria, in Sudan, in Yemen, where the efforts that are uh, led by FAO in promoting agriculture, sustainable agriculture for the rural communities to come back to their lands, not only to settle in the lands, but also contribute to produce food for the remaining of the community. And, and that's very important for, for sustaining the, the peace nexus vis-a-vis -vis the development and reduce the demand on humanitarian. So keep the nexus as part of the strategic framework. The FAO strategic framework that aims to build a resilient and efficient and sustainable agri-food systems with better nutrition, better production, better environment, and better life 
leaving no one behind, informs all the programs and the projects FAO undertakes in conflict and non-conflict situations. And that is informed very well or informed very well by the nexus because when we think of better productions, basically maximizing the production, but also keeping better life and better environment, that's where the peace aspect uh, comes in and, and that is where our major programs, especially the regional priorities, inform all the interventions that we do. A very important pillar of our regional uh, interventions is resilience building uh, program. And we believe very much that investment in resilience has a high return on investment. Uh, in a recent study that the FAO did in Sudan specifically, one dollar spent on building resilience through um, early warning and anticipatory actions saves up to seven dollars of uh, avoided losses to the communities by uh, investing on resilience. Another similar situation that was uh, carried out in Syria recently, uh, and that's uh, against development and humanitarian, that one dollar spent on development will save five dollars on spending on a humanitarian. And that's very important. And, uh, and, and this nexus will, will always allow us to move because we cannot avoid having people under crisis situation and we need an immediate humanitarian uh, intervention. However, we need to bear in mind that this must have a time limit where we shift immediately people to uh, sustain them into, into a more development situation by engaging them into carrying out their normal duties, especially when it comes to agriculture. One last point is that we bear in mind in our region we have more than 60% of total populations live in rural areas and practice agriculture as the main uh, job. Uh, so these are the, the highest number of people affected by most of the crisis. And the other aspect that is uh, extremely also uh, sensitive in this, in this regard is that this community needs sustainability for them to provide food for the rest of the communities that are living in the cities or the, uh, by the cities. So that is where FAO takes the lead in providing real data and analysis based on scientific framework that informs all the organizations. Today, 15 organizations join us in the IPC as a reference for identifying people under humanitarian need or development need and uh, use that as a, as a model that would inform the decision makers in terms of response and providing resources. Thank you, Doctor. And Dr. Hakim, pivoting on that since you have highlighted development, then considering um, in terms of future thinking, NFAO's unique focus to end hunger and malnutrition, what are future steps that it will take to follow up to that SDGs? Uh, I mentioned the FAO strategic framework, which uh, starts 2022 to 2031, and it, is to, um, and it is to achieve the agenda 2030 of the SDGs by transforming the agri-food systems uh, to be more efficient and, and more resilient and more sustainable uh, through what we identified earlier, the better, the, the, we call them the four betters, the four production, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. And this structure informs all our future activities uh, in supporting the partnership uh, as well as in, in our programs and, and projects at the regional, at the, at the country level. A very important uh, aspect that we uh, think that we've, we've, we've managed to succeed and, and build on, on the future leadership is the partnership aspect under SDG 70 and working with the other sister agencies but also with the local communities. A very good example, our work with IOM in Yemen where the local dispute over land and water has resulted on people not being able to use water resources like Al Malaka Dam. And, and it was FAO's and IOM efforts that managed to reach uh, an agreement among the local communities through the establishment of the water users associations. And this is the local communities who manage their own water resources. So they allow them to have access to the uh, natural resources, mainly water and land, and be able to reach uh, uh, an agreement. An interesting uh, development here is that we engaged women into leading what we call the Women Water Users Association to manage the water and, and be part to, to uh, mainstream gender as well in the community. A similar practice was followed recently in Syria where the locals has established Water Users Association and, be, and, and, and we're able to use the, the water. Of course, this is complemented with future projects like building the waterways and the canals and the local storage facilities. But without this, you cannot have sustainability of about 8 million cilias that we've managed to 
bring them back to their lands and be able to uh, contribute to their local development. Now, going ahead with the future, we believe very much that our strategic framework built around the four betters will drive uh, the way forward in achieving the SDGs uh, with a focus not only on SDG 16 when we talk about the nexus because that's where the peace governance and, 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 uh, and institutions comes in, but it's actually affected and affecting all the other SDGs. The hunger, the health, the education, and all the others have to come in interacting so that we can move quickly into uh, going back to track to achieve the SDGs. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Hakim. You. Now, opening up the Q&A to the audience, please, if you do have a question, raise your hand, say your name and title, and indicate who it's directed at. No questions. I see a hand over there. I see two hands. I think the mic will be coming in a second. We need to congratulate the if moderator. If you can keep your hand raised, please, miss. Thank you. OK, I see three hands. I think this is the first session where we have uh, participant participation, mm -hmm. right? Three questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this nice conference. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank you for uh, this nice conference. And I would like to introduce myself. My name is Hanan Bahmed. I'm uh, from Mukalla. I, uh, I am a team leader for uh, Women Association. Uh, also, I am a gender consultant. Actually, uh, we came here uh, with uh, very hard circumstances, and uh, I would like to give you some picture about uh, gender in Yemen. We have a lot of challenge, and uh, we couldn't, we are suffering to give our voice for five years. Finally, we can come, me and my assistants, Mrs. Mariam El Bahsani. So I would love to tell you about, uh, we have, we have done many research about violence against women. We have 700 women. Uh, we're doing research, research about uh, the violence in Yemen. And uh, we have also many activities for IDBs. And uh, actually, I'd love the conference, but it was too late to give uh, some pre presentation about ourselves. And I would love if we could uh, find uh, somebody to do the presentation about our situation in Mukalla Hadramut. Thank you for your listening. I think there was also someone right behind you that had their hands raised as well. Um, someone else. Fi wahda waraha. Uh, شكراً جزيلاً uh, زعفران زايد من منظمة المجتمع المدني اليمنية أيضاً uh, كنت أتمنى أن أن أتدخل في الموضوع الـ الـ الأول فيما يتعلق بالآليات والقانون الدولي الإنساني uh, لأنه uh, من الملاحظ يعني للأسف لا يوجد أي تطور بالنسبة لمكاتب الأمم المتحدة يعني في التعامل في القضايا الإنسانية سيست كثير من القضايا خصوصا فيما يتعلق باليمن تحدثتم كثيرا عن النازحين وعن المهاجرين ولكن لم أجد من يتحدث عن المهجرين قسرا نحن في اليمن لدينا أكثر من ألف بيت تم تفجيره من قبل الميليشيات الحوثية وهجر أهل هؤلاء البيوت قسرا إلى مخيمات النازحين طبعا تعاني كثير من النساء والأطفال من آثار هذا التهجير وأيضا النزوح لدينا أكثر من 2 مليون نازح وهناك قصور كبير جدا لمكاتب الأمم المتحدة في اليمن وفي عملها يكاد تكاد تكون محصورة في المناطق التي تسيطر على الميليشيات الحوثية وجودها في المناطق المحررة والمناطق التي تستوعب كثير من هؤلاء النازحين تكاد تكون بسيطة جدا تدخلاتها بسيطة جدا لا ترتقي أيضا إلى مستوى الاحتياجات الحقيقية 
مع وجود كثير من المعاناة في في اليمن خصوصا ما يتعلق بالنساء والأطفال الشراكة أيضا الشراكة مع المجتمع المحلي والمجتمع المدني ما تزال كما هي من قبل تقريبا عشرين سنة نفس الشركاء نفس أيضا تدار كثير من عمليات الفساد وغسل الأموال أيضا هنالك نقطة مهمة جدا للأسف مكاتب الأمم المتحدة لديها كثير من المخصصات التشغيلية تكاد توصل إلى 40% من نسبة المنح الإنسانية المقدمة لليمن رغم أن هنالك ما يقارب أكثر من 34 مليون دولار مقدمة لليمن أو مليار ولكن مع ذلك تفاقم الوضع الإنساني في اليمن أصبحنا نرى اليمنيين داخل العاصمة صنعاء وفي كل المناطق التي تسيطر عليها الميليشيات يأكلون من حاويات القمامة يسكنون في الشوارع يعني الميليشيات أيضا تمنع, تمنع الرواتب رغم أن هنالك كانت في اتفاقية ستوكهولم أن عائدات وبإشراف أيضا مكاتب الأمم المتحدة أن تكون عائدات النفط وعائدات ميناء الحديدة لدفع مرتبات الموظفين في 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 اليمن الى الان ثمان سنوات واليمنيين بدون رواتب نركز على الاسئله لو سمحتي الموجهه للمتحدثين على موضوع الاهداف التنميه وعلى موضوع النكسس لبناء السلام والتطوير وال اشكرك بس حاليا نبغى من الوقت الصراحه قصير السلام عندما لا يكون نركز على بعض الاسئله الموجوده فشكرا لك كيف سيكون هناك شخصين بعد نبغى نعطيهم فرصه من مليون السؤال نازح ومهجر اثنين ف... نازح ومهجر لم ي... اذا لم يكن هناك معالجات كثيرة من الوقت عندنا قصير ونبغى نركز على الاسئله الموجهه سلام. للمتحدثين Please, everyone, um, with the time limit we have, let's focus our questions on the session and what our panelists were able to share with us today in terms of insights, good practices, and lessons learned. I think we have time now to just take two questions. And as I said, please keep it brief so that we can really uh, give our attention and time to the answers. لو سمحتم لكم جميعا الأسئلة اللي تشاركوها معانا اليوم تكون مركزة على المتحدثين عن الموضوع تناقش لنا اليوم عندنا بسبة الوقت يمكن وقت because we are running out of time we can have only one to two please miss go ahead thank you very much hi thank you uh, my name is Marta Valdez I'm Oxfam humanitarian director and I'm the co-chair of a global group in the in the interagency standing committee of the Nexus I wanted to ask a question to uh, Madame Sena Ali Ahmad from Yemen as well as um, to Rasad Abdel Name, but in any case, it can be answered from any of the panel members. Thank you for the views. One of the challenges that we find quite often is that in the context where conflict is protracted, development actors have a different risk tolerance. And therefore, it is quite difficult to speak about the nexus because the humanitarian colleagues, they take a big, big load. So we'd like to hear from your experience any case where development actors have managed to develop a different type of risk uh, tolerance and therefore be more present and proactive in conflict setting. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have time for one last question and I saw someone raise his hands. Uh, one of them, if you want, the last question. If you want, if you want, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. مساء الخير اسمي حصة الثاني مبعوث الأمين العام لجامعة الدول العربية للإغاثة الإنسانية شكرا لجميع المتحدثين على ما أثروه من نقاط مهمة ومنذ بداية اليوم ونحن نستمع لتلك المداخلات الهامة سؤالي باختصار بالنسبة لتريبل نكسز كيف تم تطبيقه مع مفهوم الاستجابة المحلية لكولايزيشن ريسبونس. In response to the local community, this is for the citizens within their own local communities. Building peace is a concept that is widely known in conferences, forums across all levels. Again, in certain local societies and communities, we do know that this has been. 
it has been there and through of course the local response to local communities thank you thank you really that in terms of peace building and we can take it in our context the triple nexus the humanitarian development peace is really well understood in terms of on the level of academics forums conferences but then when it comes to al-istijab al and that's really the local response what have you seen in taking that on locally and if there's any good practices or um, examples that you can share and i leave that open to whichever panelist that would like to take um, maybe first Ms. Zena, if in case you'd like to respond to the question Thank you very much, Thank Shud. You. And I was saying we need to congratulate you as moderator, first for the timekeeping, but second for opening the floor. Thank you very much for the questions. I, to the colleague in terms of Yemen, I will not speak about Yemen, but I will speak about the risk tolerance of my own organization. And I totally agree. Development organizations are by nature more risk averse, if we may say so. However, during the last few years, I have to say, at least from UNDP's perspective, embracing the agenda of the humanitarian development peace nexus has made us an organization that is a bit more open to be uh, an embracing of uncertainty, if I may say so, and peace. And the, and, and the proof is that UNDP used to wait, I think, years, years ago, decades ago, until the humanitarian program is finalized and crisis is over to put feet on the ground. Now we actually advocate for this continuum between the humanitarian and peace and development nexus because our conceptual framework, our understanding, and because of, I have to say, the lessons learned working all around the world has indicated that you cannot wait first the, the world cannot wait. Second, the prevention agenda has to prevail. We need to look, as, my, as Giovanni had said, most of the crises, for example, are in fragile countries, right? And if we continue to work on response only without looking at recovery strategies, but also without looking at prevention and resilience building, as our colleague from FAO had indicated, this, if there's anything, these are lessons learned going forward. So I think that at least from the UNDP side, we have been able to embrace uncertainty and the whole world, if I may say, with a new world order that is governed by uncertainty. So you see us working in Afghanistan, you see us working still in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, etc. In terms of, there was another question on the localization. Maybe, Jude, if I have time, I can give a small example on the localization, or we give to the other panel members, as you wish. Uh, if you'd like to add a point, but we'd also really love to hear from our other panelists on localization as well. Maybe very, very quickly on the localization agenda, uh, we worked very much with other UN agencies, especially IOM, on a program uh, on the return and reintegration of ISIL perceived affiliated families. These are families where one member of the family had been perceived to be affiliated with the, the so-called ISIL uh, militia. So at that time, we worked on local solutions of how to mainstream reintegration into the local agendas through a combination of a comprehensive integrated approaches working from the local solutions uh, themselves and working on the acceptance by local communities to what they believe as their own grievances. But we can discuss uh, that uh, example more. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zainal. I think uh, something was directed to me, right? Please go ahead, Dr. Yeah, Dr. I mean, first of all, let me, uh, let me say that uh, in the most, I mean, you all know in Ch the Chinese yin-yang, uh, in the most developed country, there's a chance of an emergency happening. And look at what's happening now in Turkey, out of the blues. And on, the, on vice versa, in the most emergency country, developmental activities do happen. And between this and that, there's actually, as I said, a model that could be employed that takes into account risk, the likelihood of risk, the impact of risk. And the way we look at it in WHO is that our interventions 
should not be uniform across the country, depending on the level of emergency inside that country and the stability and the access that our staff can access and, and provide their services. But our interventions uh, also rely on a risk model. And if we found, even in the worst cases, if we find that the risk is high, there are methods for risk aversion or employing someone on our behalf in the most affected and risky areas to deliver the service. So yes, we take risk into account, we look into the likelihood of risk, the impact of risk, and we do at the end uh, to, uh, employ that uh, into our calculated steps in providing the essential interventions, either directly through us, or through a proxy, or through someone whom we can communicate with uh, in terms of ensuring at least that sub partially the services uh, is, uh, uh, is provided. The, about localization and local communities, I think there's a session, uh, a whole lo looking into local communities and, and how their engagement could make an impact and not to take much of your time. I think this, we refer that question to them. Uh, they're more uh, uh, prepared to answer such that, but as Zaina said, we do consider that as part of our uh, delivery uh, to the services in humanitarian settings, uh, local communities, localization, to achieve the peace. And maybe the peace is the least word we spoke about today. Peace can never be achieved unless the, every uh, citizen feels just and trust services, good economic conditions, and stoppage of conflict is happening in the area he's living in. And all of these, if you put them in the mixer, means that that citizen should be getting good health, goes to good school, provide good uh, 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 w w working conditions and labor conditions, good environmental packages. So b peace, to achieve the peace nexus, you have to really do well on the humanitarian, developmental, to achieve that peace through the local communities. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Appam. And to further elaborate on Opera and on Opera Jason, the triple nexus and localization, please, ASG Peterson. Thank you. And uh, I would also like to welcome that we have the possibility of having questions from, from, from colleagues sitting out there. In particular, I also, also welcome that we heard voices from uh, from some of them that are impacted uh, in their daily life. Uh, so, so really appreciate that. And to the first question uh, from, from Yemen, uh, I just, I just uh, I, it was more a statement and whether we could have a session on Yemen, uh, that's probably, that's not up to me, but I would love that, but we, that will be some other time. But uh, it's a working for women in particular, providing support for uh, victims of violence uh, and, and uh, also ensuring maternal health is something that we are working uh, through our local partners in, in uh, uh, very much in Yemen and I can't promise uh, money from here but I'll definitely promise that I will talk to my colleagues in the country office and also follow up. It brings focus on a point which is always difficult both in the longer term uh, development work so to speak but also in very uh, acute responses. It is difficult to mobilize funding for uh, women organizations and women process and gender equality. There was an upsurge after the, 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 uh, the events in, in Afghanistan, Taliban take over, but otherwise it's very difficult and it's very ironic in a way because we also know it's the best investment we can almost do in long-term resilience uh, and development is to invest in women's health, in women's uh, education, girls' education, have them involved in, in the local uh, things. So let's focus on that in, in, the, in the way ahead of us. That's an important part of the Nexus, I would say, because it goes both ways. Um, let me just touch on two other points that were mentioned here. Um, um, yeah, Nexus at the local level, the localization. We have actually and I think I mentioned that we, we work a lot through a local orga organization, in particular women-led organization. We have also, for instance, in Tigray, worked with mobilizing, recruiting, in this case, women mid uh, midwives among the IDPs and the refugees and, and assisting them in forming um, uh, clinics, 
with services for the uh, for the women in the in these areas and also for the IDPs. So you kind of build up capacity and also provide the services at the same time at the local level with people and provided by women who have the local knowledge uh, of what is actually the most pressing needs of women here. So that's something that we definitely would like to work on. And it requires that there is a, sometimes also a risk willingness to engage in, in the corporations like this, but they also pay off quite, uh, quite well. And then just the last point from my side to the, to the question of, uh, of uh, government actors and, and uh, how uh, examples of how they were. I used to represent the government for many, many years, so, so uh, maybe not the right to, to, to act, but I do think there's been a chance uh, or a trend there also since the humanitarian summit, but I do also think that for many years the, the discussion, the conversation around the nexus in, in the beginning, the development uh, humanitarian nexus, and now the peace nexus, the peace as well, has been taking place within the humanitarian setting and within the uh, development setting. And I always, you know, wonder a little bit when, when asked uh, and when hearing this conversation, because as I also said in the beginning, I consider myself representing both uh, as this organization. So we need to work on that. And that also goes to the flexibility in how we address, we talked about funding earlier, financing. I had a conversation with a donor representative this morning. They have now for the civil society organization they're supporting, you know, put all the funding together in one pool, both what used to be humanitarian, what used to be development, and then it's left to the organization to uh, provide, of course, live up to the results achieved, uh, agreed, but also being able to respond very quickly in terms of, in terms of uh, crisis, but also in where, when the crisis fades out and and we need to get into a more uh, development mode, mode again, which has happened luckily uh, many times. And hopefully that will come to UN organizations as well. But these are some of the things that we need to see. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. Would you like to further add, please? Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, it's on the risk appetite for development organizations and conflict situations. We have to see the learning curve for these organizations, which is based on data, analytics, and, and the evidence that is that has developed over the years and decades. I recall some over 20 years ago, I had a meeting with someone senior at the World Bank at that time, and we said, oh, we want to do this and that in a, in a conflict country in, in, in Africa. And they immediately responded, our policy, if there is a conflict, there is no intervention. And this is a development institution. Today, in Yemen, for FAO, the biggest donor and contributor is the World Bank. And, and, and they've completely changed the, uh, the, the risk appetite into, into promoting development in conflict situations where it allows also to sustain the peace. Because for, if you're not working on those areas that are not directly affected by the conflict, you are actually encouraging more to be engaged in the conflict itself instead of giving them more sustainable livelihood so that they, 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 they keep away and speed up the peace process. So uh, same for, for most of the UN agencies. They are, they are almost uh, around in all the conflict countries and, and try as much as possible uh, to control and manage the risks so that they can continue provide support to the remaining community. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the audience's engagement. Due to the time frame we have, I'll have to conclude the Q&A here. Moving on then to wrap up this session, um, I'd just like to conclude with three recommendations that really emphasizes the key words and key ideas that were presented to us by the distinguished panelists. And that's really to first better promote the interlinkages between humanitarian development and peace approaches to achieve a comprehensive and sustainable peace to also strengthen the complementarity between the humanitarian action and the Agenda 2030 for the Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, to emphasize the importance of a holistic and comprehensive approach that links the humanitarian action, development, and peace efforts, particularly taking into account the different contexts there are to fragility in a country to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, hopefully by 2030. Please all join me in applauding our distinguished thank panelists you. for their contribution today, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ooh, okay. Yeah. May I have your attention, please? We are about to begin our final session for this evening, afternoon. And it's obviously going to be the most interesting session. I'd like to encourage you to come to the front, if you can, because we're going to open up the session for questions and answers. Uh, and we want to hear from you on the panel, where we're going to be discussing the impact of crisis fatigue on humanitarian action. A lot of today's sessions have mentioned the role of media in promoting action, promoting humanitarian action, and this panel is going to consist of members of the media, experts in the field who have decades of experience collectively. So I hope that you look forward to hearing from us and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Testing, testing, okay, good. You're gonna turn that off, right? <laughs> You're gonna turn that off, right? Turn it off, your phone. Oh, I did. <laughs> so If everybody could make their way to the front, we're going to get started. And we'll have some questions, as Suzanne said, so we encourage everybody to come up to the front. We'll just give it one more minute. Okay, we're going to get started if everybody could take their seats. Thank you. Hello, I'm Elise Labatt, and today we're talking about evolving humanitarian needs and response, the impact of crisis fatigue on humanitarian crises. When news of a humanitarian crisis reaches what is commonly known as a breaking point, we know it receives significant coverage in the media. The television cameras are here. We often see horrifying images, and we hear heartbreaking personal stories from the ground. And the crises are trending on social media, and it all seizes the public interest and our empathy. But it's becoming harder and harder to maintain that interest for extended periods of time. Crisis fatigue sets in, and that's happening now even faster 
in the age of social media where attention spans are even shorter and the next trending crisis consumes us. Or not even a crisis, the next trending story, I should say, consumes us. It's also becoming increasingly more difficult for media organizations to independently cover humanitarian crises. The inherent danger of conflict zones where a large portion of humanitarian crises occur have made media organizations more reluctant to send in journalists to cover these humanitarian crises, as do tighter budgets. And a lack of on-the-ground expertise often hinders, hinders journalists from effectively and efficiently acquiring accurate information. And all of this tends to lead to simplistic surface-level reporting and a disconnect between the international community and those directly affected by a humanitarian crisis and the average media consumer. So we're going through a technological revolution that gives us new formats and technologies to embrace in our effort to tell stories. So we're going to talk about how the media can effectively maintain the public's attention as this crisis fatigue sets in. How can media and humanitarian organizations work better together to effectively inform international stakeholders and the communities affected by humanitarian crises. And within partnerships, how can we ensure the public objectively and journalistic integrity are being maintained? So joining me today are an esteemed group of humanitarian aid officials, journalists, and editors who grapple with these issues at every humanitarian crisis. Rafiq Eloshefani is the Advocacy and Communications Director for UNICEF in the Gulf. Suzanne Kianpour is a journalist with the BBC. Faisal Abbas is the Editor-in-Chief of Arab News. And Brian Rohan is a longtime foreign affairs journalist. So let's get to it. Rafiq, I want to start with you. As someone on the ground, how does this, working in these affected areas of a humanitarian crisis, let's talk about how the first, how did the crisis fatigue, as we're talking about, actually translate on the operations front? How do we compare the first few days of an emergency and crisis compared to the months, weeks, and years after that? Well, thank you, Elise, and really thanks um, to everyone in the room here in your interest in, in, in this session. And I think it shows that fatigue can be overcome just by having everyone around us here interested in this topic. Um, at, the crisis of, at the onset of every crisis, um, the media attention is usually at its peak, uh, unfortunately. And, and that's because of the newness of the crisis. And it's because the interest in it um, at all levels, uh, the public, the politicians, the people affected themselves, and everyone else is at, it's, it, at its highest. And I think this is where also, when we're talking about crisis fatigue, we have to understand, are we talking about fatigue about a single crisis, or are we fatigued from all the crisis, from all the gloom and doom that we see in the media repeatedly every day uh, and, and, and beyond? Um, the second part is probably the most uh, worrying one, when, when people stop um, being interested in... Um, in, in what is going on around them because of this fatigue of the so bad news. But I think the first part is also really important when on a single crisis, let's take an example of, of the Syria-Turkey uh, uh, earthquake uh, two weeks ago, a huge media attention on the first few days on the search and rescue operation, on the immediate effect of this devastating earthquake. But what we worry about is, are we covering the crisis or the effects of the crisis on people? This is the most important piece of the story, in my opinion, and this is what us, as humanitarians, we want to convey. It, the story is not about the crisis itself, it's about the people, the children, the families who have suffered the, that devastation and will sadly continue to suffer weeks, months after that. They have lost their, ho their homes, uh, their schools, um, their hospitals, the water networks, all the public infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt. And that effort will take quite a long time. And that attention and the support from people that the media attention and the story attention uh, brings um, 
will affect that, um, that, that the level um, of speed and action that the reconstruction, the relief items will get to the people. So the faster and the more, uh, sorry, the more uh, media and attention uh, we have on a certain uh, crisis, I think the operation is more efficient. That's the translation. Yeah, let, let's break down what's going on right now in Turkey and Syria, for instance, and the earthquake. There's been a huge attention on the search and rescue, but you know, the search and rescue is just a very small part. What's really to come is really going to be you know, prolonged. Everything, these people have lost everything, schools, water network, everything's been destroyed. And those, these, this reconstruction is not really going to make the headlines, will it? I mean, and the biggest part is really going to be the rebuilding. Absolutely. It's rebuilding the people themselves. Mental health will be a huge priority for us, for children. They have been traumatized by this devastating um, uh, catastrophe. And the, their mental health is pretty much on the top of our priorities as response providers, as people who are accountable to children and for their well-being. Um, and it will not take one day or two weeks or three weeks. It will take a long time, a sustained effort to mitigate the effects um, of this devastating crisis on them. And this is even worse on the Syrian children who have been living in a conflict zone under extreme conditions a new Since crisis on top of crisis exactly. fatigue there. Exactly. And a lot of the children were born refugees. Some of them were born as displaced people, born in tents. All they've known is devastation, and this comes on top of it. And very sadly, um, these stories are not what we often see. And even when we see at the onset of a crisis, they are not there on the long run. So we find it a bit of a challenge to create narratives and to keep the people attentive and appeal for their support um, as we move away from the immediate first day, first week headlines. Yeah. Faisal, let's talk about you. I, I want to bring up just like Afghanistan, for instance. There was coverage of the war when it first started and the invasion. And then for years, there was no coverage. And then there was coverage of the surge, and then there was no coverage for a while. There was coverage of the evacuation in large numbers, and now we seem to have got forgotten about Afghanistan again. We're certainly not covering what's going on on the ground. We're not covering the plight of the refugees. You, as an editor, talk to us about you know, how coverage of humanitarian crises has evolved. You've been with Arab News since 2016. What are some of the factors as someone directing the coverage that dictate how it can be sustained and sustain the public interest? Well, um, in a way, Elise, and um, I would like to point out that you come from a journalistic background also, formerly with, uh, with uh, CNN. Um, so uh, the, the situation in newsrooms around the world is exactly uh, the same. You have an unlimited number of stories and uh, a very limited number of resources. No matter how much resources you put in, you simply cannot cover every catastrophe or every crisis that, that happens in the world. Um, and um, in a way, um, it is a bit um, difficult uh, sometimes to make decisions. Uh, where do you spend these resources? So which catastrophe or which crisis is more worthy of uh, you sending a team to the ground, dispatching a team to the ground. Um, and even if you solve the resource uh, issue, then you have the uh, physical barriers, the logistical challenges of getting into countries. For example, in this current situation, it's a lot easier to send the crew to go to Turkey uh, than go to Syria, um, be, it, uh, with, uh, the, uh, um, be it in the areas that are under the regime's control or um, areas that are, that are not. It's both equally a challenge. Um, this, me this makes it uh, particularly difficult because uh, for us, and then every, I just have to point out, every life lost is a life too many, and regardless of the nationality. But for, for a newspaper called Arab News, um, if I have to choose, for example, at the moment between uh, sending somebody to Syria and somebody sending somebody to Turkey, Syria is an Arab country, it's closer, uh, it's closer to home. But we ended up having to send somebody to Turkey because we couldn't get physical access to uh, Syria. So these are the kind of challenges, uh, resources, um, logistics, access, um, uh, that we have to face uh, on, on, on daily basis. You were talking um, yesterday, we were talking about 
Ukraine and that you had uh, Arab News did a poll and you know there was not a lot of interest in what was going on in Ukraine and from an and as you said from an editorial perspective Turkey and Syria much more immediate let's look at Turkey right now we're still in the immediacy of the search and rescue still I mean thankfully they're still finding some survivors but do you think your audience will stay with that story um until something bigger happens, uh, unfortunately, that is the, this is why they call them news cycles. Um, so at the moment, and we've seen the results, I think in a, in a matter of few days, there's been a, a public donations campaign here in Saudi through the Saham uh, platform uh, that gathered uh, more than $55 million from, uh, from people to, to help. With 55 the, million from the public? From the public, yeah. And that's from media coverage? That's from, uh, well, media coverage plus uh, the government has made it very easy to donate through an application or through a website so it's a, it's a very simple transaction to to, uh, to get that so um, the uh, I think people do care um, it's just the sheer amount uh, and you know unfortunately uh, we are in a plagued part of the world um, I know people who come here to Saudi Arabia or go to the Gulf in general we feel like we are protected from the outside uh, from the wider Middle East but um, if you go around the region um, particularly, for example, in places like uh, Syria, which, you know, it's a number of catastrophes, one after the other, uh, the, uh, the earthquake being the latest, um, or, uh, or Lebanon, or, uh, or Palestine, or these areas. Uh, there is certainly no shortage of uh, news to cover in terms of uh, people going through agony and people going through pain. Now, you mentioned a very important point, and I would like to take a moment to talk about Ukraine. Um, so... Um, as it happens, we did a, um, we did a research with uh, the international polling company, YouGov, covering 3,000 uh, Arabs in, 20, in 19 Arab countries. And this would have been exactly uh, nine months ago from today. It was for the third month anniversary of Ukraine. Uh, an astounding 66% of Arabs uh, said they really don't care or they are uh, neutral when it comes to... Uh, sorry, they are indifferent towards the um, uh, war in, in, in Ukraine. And, of course, this shows a lot of things. Um, uh, first of all, from a news perspective, uh, and you don't need, need me to tell you this, as I said, you are um, a, a experienced uh, journalist. Crises that are closer to home are always... Uh, make the headlines. Um, so by default, we care here more about what's happening, for example, in, in Syria or in Turkey uh, than a place like uh, Ukraine, which for an American audience or for a uh, European audience might be the other way around. Um, I know it sounds difficult, but this is the reality of us as uh, audiences and as human beings. Um, the other thing it shows is people, uh, and this is where I wanted to emphasize because I'm on this panel because I'm a journalist first and foremost. Uh, when 66% peop of people say, uh, say that about a crisis in Ukraine, it doesn't strike me as indifferent as much as it strikes me as people are illiterate or unable to um, uh, digest how significant this war it is. It's only when you put things in context, and this is where it's more important for us as journalists to drive this context to people. Yes, the war in Ukraine might have nothing to do with us, but when you think about the energy crisis, when you think about grain prices in, in Egypt going up because Ukraine is the key exporter, uh, then people start realizing and paying uh, attention. Uh, but of course, the average Joe on the street, you don't expect them to know uh, all of this. This is, this is why our job is more important. So more important than ever. Um, it's not important. I'm going to conclude on this point. Um, what's important is not just to cover the crisis because everybody will have that story. Everybody knows there's an earthquake that happened in Turkey. Our job is to explain to the people sitting at home, wherever they're watching us, how this is going to impact you and how this is going to impact you on the long run. Right. I want to get to that in a minute. I, I want to go to Brian and Susie and talk, you know, as journalists. Um, you know, Brian, we're looking at all the competing issues that the public faces. It's difficult to break through all the competing news and information and crisis that people themselves are facing, um, you know, to getting their attention. We went through COVID. The last time we were all here at Chaos Relief, COVID was you know, the big, the big issue. And there, now there's a financial crisis. And so people are just getting zapped with so many crises and so many stories that it's not that they don't care, but 
their attention is just elsewhere. Yes, it does seem like we're, we're in a particular historic moment when um, we have several global crises, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, global uh, climate change that's affecting many countries. This, these are global issues. Uh, the Ukraine war uh, testing the international system and um, its importance being us deciding whether we want to live in a world where um, naked aggression uh, uh, becomes uh, another tool of statecraft as it once was. Um, I think, yeah, in this marketplace for our attention, we have, um, there's different ways to, to sort of seize the public attention and maintain it, uh, you know, for, for a cause we consider noble or just or, or uh, worthy of it. So we have now, um, I'd say the traditional journalistic example would be uh, uh, trying to find a compelling story angle that's uh, uh, universal in some way. Um, stories about families, about uh, individual uh, 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 triumphs or failures or uh, um, struggles, um, other things like sports, things that can affect a wide audience, uh, sports or animals even. Um, and um, yeah, I, I can think of one anecdote where even uh, uh, in, a, in a, a scene of heavy bombardment, the story that got the most play of the day in uh, Mosul on one day was uh, uh, a video story about a puppy that had been rescued from uh, under the rubble. Um, and you know, from the puppy idea, you build on the, the, the story about what's actually going on. Um, I think also you can be uh, non-political about some of these stories because um, you know, aid donations, humanitarian uh, uh, aspires to be outside of uh, political influence. Um, Aside from that, I'd say also, you know, we have to embrace the new technologies. These, uh, um, we have, uh, they're more entertainment based like uh, uh, um, Instagram, Snapchat, um, TikTok being the new one. Um, it doesn't necessarily help the journalism business model because we don't control this content. And so uh, I would say that those tools are probably best suitable for people uh, directly in the humanitarian world because they can, they can basically cut out the middleman, and I'm speaking against my own profession here, but uh, <laughs> yeah. they can go straight to the public with, uh, um, with their news at a very, at a very low cost. Um, and um, I guess aside from that, uh, partnerships, we could talk about partnerships. Yeah, we're, we're, gonna, get to, we're gonna get to the partnerships. Sure. I, wanna, I wanna go to Susie. You know, pick up on where Brian was talking about we have a lot of crises, we have a lot of stories, we have, and then there's just the sheer amount of content that's out there zapping people's attention. It used to be, you know, when I was growing up, we had three news networks, a couple of papers, and every country kind of had that. Now you have TikTok, Instagram, and it's not just news and information, but it's wellness, it's fashion, it's, I mean, there's just so much content zapping your attention, and you talked about a very, interesting statistic the other day. Tell the audience about this. I mean, it's, it's astonishing how short people's attention spans are now. And when we're talking about these big international crises, it's even hard to break through. Four, in 2004, the average attention span on a screen specifically was around two and a half minutes and now it's 47 seconds. So 47, 47 seconds. seconds. 47 so seconds, and then people are like, all right. And you, st and, you, but in, and you end up scrolling. scrolling. I think the scrolling in factor the scrolling is key because, right. okay, yes, you know, like you say, many of us grew up with three channels, network news, and then suddenly we had cable, but not everybody had cable. So yes, you could channel surf, but if you're going for news, you didn't have that many options. Now you have all kinds of different platforms to get your news from. You have traditional television, you have radio, you have podcasts, you have various social media channels, you have newspapers, you have blog. I mean, you have so many ways of getting your information, which I am trying to be positive on this front and see this as potentially a blessing because actually you can potentially reach the kinds of audiences that maybe we wouldn't have through the evening news. And the wellness and fashion and et cetera can potentially be used as if there's 
partnerships of sorts, potentially be used as mechanisms to also tell some of these stories that can be stories of hope in humanitarian crises that inspire people because, you know, I've had experiences with editors well where we've gotten into debates over, well, good, new, good stories don't sell. Like, good news stories don't sell. People don't click on good news stories. But I don't think that's necessarily true. And if it is true, maybe it's across a generational you know, generational spectrum. The puppy story, the puppies rescued in Mosul, was actually a BBC producer who found these puppies in Mosul. And it ended up on BuzzFeed. I mean, ISIS stories at that time weren't the kinds of stories that would end up on BuzzFeed. So that's a different, you know, that's a, a, a younger generation who then, you know, who knows, maybe they see this story and they start looking into what happened with ISIS in Iraq at the time. Mm -hmm. So, it, we have a very different media landscape, and I think it's going to expand even further with the evolution of artificial intelligence, which again might sound scary like, oh, the robots are coming for all of our jobs. But on the other hand, maybe there's room for some of these you know, resource issues to be solved if some of the kind of busy work is solved by artificial intelligence so right. that frees up journalists to do right. the kind of journalism that we'd all like to be doing right Rafiq so I mean, I mean I think what we're all getting at is like some kind of crisis fatigue is inevitable here given the competing pressures content things zapping our attention how does that have an impact on donor fatigue you know it's easy to say donors just have to stay the course no matter what the public thinks but if people are tired of hearing about Ukraine or Afghanistan or Yemen, um, less public support makes it hard for donors themselves. Yes, absolutely. I think attention and levels of funding are quite well correlated um, in, the, in that sense. The more we see public attention to a crisis and to the ongoing relief efforts, the more that translates into um, into the humanitarian system. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons us as humanitarian community, we, we try to pay close attention to how we communicate our work, but also how we partner with media and how we, we, we present that story of what is going on in, in a certain area with a certain crisis. Present hope because that more, more often translates into, um, into funding because when there is hope, there is an action to be to be implemented for us to 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 get a positive outcome and that will motivate a donation um, and here i think we're trying to influence not just the institutional donors the governments who are very much attentive attentive to the uh, breaking news cycles but also the wider public sector um, at unicef for instance last year our um, budget for the entire year everywhere around the world was about seven billion uh, over two billion were from the private sector, from individual uh, donors, um, anyone from the public, uh, from the private, from the from corporations, foundations, and others, who find us not just through the media cycle, but also through social media, through some of the specialized work that we do, uh, not only via the news, uh, the breaking news cycle, but also through economic news, through, uh, as you mentioned earlier, celebrity and social media spheres. This is why we have goodwill ambassadors, because they help us get to wider audiences uh, beyond the daily news. Um, I'll give you a quick example, actually, if I may. Um, I was just talking to our colleagues from KS Relief uh, and others. The Saudi public, for instance, if you want to analyze that as an audience, and I read it on Arab News the other day, 67% of Saudis are gamers. They play video games. So um, we are teaming up with the Saudi Esports Federation to try and see how can we influence that big segment of the community and involve them in, in humanitarian action. We've done it three years in a row through an initiative that, this, that Saudi Arabia hosts uh, called Games Without Borders. Um, teams compete and the proceeds go to, uh, to humanitarian action, which is a fantastic initiative. And it's pretty much outside of the news cycle. It gets covered by specialized media that cover the gaming news, which is this quite a niche um, area of, uh, of the media landscape. 
but it is important because it touches such a wide um, segment of society, 67% of the Saudi um, public, and those numbers are rising across the world. Um, so it's, it's really a way for us to, to, to target them. Um, so broadening those, those, those partnerships and creating compelling ways to reach the audiences via the breaking news cycle, but also th through the specialized media, helps us maintain some level of attention on the humanitarian uh, emergencies. But at the end, we communicate also to advocate beyond funding. It's also about maintaining political pressure on those who are sometimes accountable or have a certain influence on the perspective, on the future of a, of a, of a crisis or a conflict. Um, in the end of the day, people need peace. Um, they don't need humanitarian relief every day. At the end of the day, myself and a few others of my colleagues uh, in the humanitarian sector, or maybe everyone, ultimately we work every day very hard to get fired because we don't want to be here. Right. We want to do something else. We don't want to be doing this forever. At the end of the day, we want to see that um, humanitarian needs are slowly going away, being replaced by development uh, projects that will reduce the frequency of crisis with preparedness and, and um, another action and this is where actually where we see the funding uh, most impactful when we yeah. invest in the preparedness before a crisis occurs and this is the hardest uh, point actually funding for a crisis is easy but for, for preparedness is actually a lot harder uh, Faisal you know there is about hu providing humanitarian relief and focusing on the humanitarian crisis but I think also audiences you know, there's this attention to a political solution, and if there's not a political solution and there's no movement, people kind of lose interest. Like, you know, with the Arab, with the Arab Spring, for instance. Like, people, you know, followed it to their natural conclusion. Mubarak was overthrown, you know, Ben Ali, or, you know what I mean? Like, le some le Gaddafi was killed. And, and we were able to, like, quickly move on to the other crisis. But if there's no movement in Syria or, you know, somewhere else, um, or, you know, it's pretty much happening in Ukraine too. The long-term struggles in Yemen, for instance, sustaining that interest is, is hard. And even, and we kind of lose sight of the humanitarian aspect. Uh, sure, there's a few issues to unpack here. Uh, first of all, as I said in my opening remarks, we are in an area of the world uh, that is plagued with these problems, and unfortunately, these problems don't go away. According to the United Nations, uh, it takes a refugee a minimum of 15 years to leave a refugee camp. So, um, you know, the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict has been going on for 70 years. Um, Syria has been ongoing since 2011. Um, so, unfortunately, um, the best way for a crisis to be uh, resolved is for it not to happen to start with. Once, once you uh, dive into it, once, once it happens, it's like quicksand and it, ke it keeps bringing you uh, uh, further and further uh, down. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, it's not specific to uh, our conflicts. There's a lot of conflicts in the world that, have, that don't get resolved uh, um, that quickly. Humanitarian uh, crisis in particular is even more difficult because whereas for example, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, is a, a conflict and, you know, there are people, sometimes you are people sitting at the table and, and negotiating. Um, the, the issue with uh, an, an earthquake, for example, is the attention is by default uh, focused on those two or three days or uh, at the incident uh, itself. And then the story will, uh, and th this, is an, this is a normal circumstances and I want to build a little bit on what Susie was, uh, was mentioning. So, in the good days, before social media, it used to last a few, uh, the attention used to last a few days. Um, I actually read even more dramatic figures uh, than the one that Susie mentioned. What I read according to the Thread Marketing uh, Group is the attention span uh, grew, uh, went down to eight seconds um, uh, for, for, for the average uh, human being. Uh, this means that, you know, the, the next worst thing is the goldfish. So we, we literally have the attention of a goldfish uh, now. And um, this is a problem uh, and uh, for us in the media industry. So uh, uh, this is actually a term that uh, is now becoming popular, uh, something called the attention economy. So marketees, 
and um, social media experts and businesses are realizing that this is this is a problem and the new term now is the attention economy so people are actually paid to sit and think how to grab your attention for more than those eight uh, seconds um, but of course uh, this is not the good old days so uh, as as Susie uh, uh, was uh, was mentioning or as yourself was mentioning even um, uh, you know in your days there were three cable news networks uh, or four and uh, you know peop people's days were structured you know uh, at some point people watched the news in the evening read the newspaper uh, in, in the morning and that slot was allocated for news it got people's full attention for the full 20 minutes or for the full 15 minutes that they read the newspaper Today you're in a situation where um, you know you there's irregularity in the time where you access uh, information. Um, let's just be blunt. A lot of people even use their phone in the toilet. Um, so there's you know people in the toilet um, looking at their phone and getting uh, incoming information. Um, We've all done it. Don't <laughs> say you didn't. No, I, I'm just saying. You know, it's that extreme. You know, um, uh, even more extreme is right. like what really kind of uh, what really irritates me is people who do it while they're driving. Um, right. So, um, but what I'm trying to say is that you know the attention or, or the time that you used to be able to pay attention when you give full focus to something, uh, where and your day was structured is right. is long gone. The problem is now we're talking about crisis fatigue and how to get people attention uh, so that donors are not uh, affected. The problem is you're sitting on your phone, be it in your classroom, be it in your workplace, or be it in a cafe, or uh, you know on a toilet seat, wherever you are, looking at the at the phone. Um, you're getting feeds. Uh, yes, you're getting the latest news from Syria or from 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 Turkey, but you're also getting your latest celebrity, your favorite right, celebrity news. Right, as we were uh, saying. You're getting a makeup tutorial. You're getting right, a cooking recipe. Right. You're getting business uh, business um, uh, advice right. from a from a uh, you know known right. investor. Or so um, we're not comparing apples. We're not competing apples to apples anymore. It's no longer the CBS news versus the NBC news at eight o'clock. Um, so you're actually competing as a news provider. You're competing every moment with Netflix, with Google, with Amazon, with uh, you know people share. Uh, the last statistics I want to say is people share a billion um, Instagram reels a day. Um, you know, there's a billion Instagram reels shared every day, and this is like this. The clock sets resets every every midnight. So. Um, with that amount of information, no wonder this kind of attention economy. But the downside of it is, by default, um, we're going to pay less attention uh, to, to crisis because of the sheer amount of things right. being thrown at you. Right. Brian, let's talk about funding. I mean, we all know it's less available than it used to be. And there are no shortage of journalists that are willing to go. But it's not just journalists, right? I mean, when we go, to a, when we, go we need a whole architecture in place, just like the aid organizations do. Mm -hmm. Sure, we're, we're talking about um, on the ground reporting in crisis zones or? or well, if you're going, if, if your organization is sending you, you're not just going as like, Brian, you need security, you need sure, a whole sure. architecture in place. Oh yes, well this, this type of reporting um, is very expensive. You need security teams, you need, um, people monitoring your situation. Sometimes you need to pay off armed groups on the ground. Um, now, I mean, one of the problems with, with traditional uh, legacy media is that uh, we don't necessarily report something unless it's new. So news is something that's new. So um, one of the challenges is uh, with, with these uh, crises, like a long running drought, uh, is how to keep something that's not really new, new. Uh, and this is where people on the ground can, can, can help because uh, uh, finding these little details in, a, in daily life, that can be turned into a story, a feature story that then gets resonance. Um, uh, but uh, I think when, when it comes to uh, uh, assistance for reporting and uh, um, working in crisis zones, especially conflict zones, which as we heard earlier today, make up 80% of uh, all humanitarian crises. Uh, uh, piggybacking on an aid organization uh, is, is often the safest way to work. Um, I know that they have probably the best intentions when they come up with their statistics. And I, I would say that uh, those numbers are often more trustworthy than numbers provided by state organizations. Um, because they, the, 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 the ability to be 
on the ground in different locations and coordinate uh, across territory. I think the aid organizations uh, are better equipped for that. Mm -hmm. Susie, I mean, then we talk about partnerships, right? Like, you know, I want to ask Rafik as well, but but as, a, as an organization, like you say, okay, I'm going to send a team with UNICEF or I'm going to send a team with, you know, into a conflict zone with an aid organization. For, someone like the B, for something like the BBC, yes, you have budget cuts, but then partnering is also difficult because, um, you know, you have your charter and you have your rules of engagement. It's very difficult. It is very, partnering is very difficult because, you know, there's the whole we have to remain impartial aspect, which is building trust with our audiences. And so who we partner with is very important. I mean, I, my series that I host, Women Building Peace, which is about women in conflict zones um, and the work they do in conflict zones, was partnered with Georgetown's Institute of Women, Peace and Security. But that truthfully was difficult to pull off, but we were able to pull, out, pull it off because, you know, they're an academic institution and the goals were aligned and there weren't any other issues. There have been other programs that I've tried to get off the ground, which are similar in kind of countering disinformation, focusing on humanitarian crises and partnering with places that would have a lot of money, bigger organizations that would have a lot of money. Hasn't We haven't been able to get it off the ground precisely because there's concerns about potential impartiality breaches. Uh, Rafiq, talk to us about partnering with um, journalists. And you've said to me that media is part of the aid system. It is. This is pretty much how we see it. We see that the media sector journalists are part of the humanitarian aid system. They're an integral part of it. Um, information, the news, they do save lives. We have to, uh, to, to, to know that and acknowledge it. Uh, the more we cover the stories, the, the, the better job that we do at conveying that information, it actually helps people in a direct way, much more direct than we might think. And this is why, for us, shared value partnerships with the media are so important. You spoke about uh, impartiality. Um, for the humanitarian community, our uh, principles are humanity, integrity, neutrality, and impartiality. And we share those with the media. So it's a natural partnership. Um, and, in, and we try and implement that in concrete ways. Um, Brian mentioned a few, a few examples. Uh, and I think earlier Faisal also mentioned the issues of access. On access, for instance, yes, as a humanitarian community, we are and we do our best to be in the hardest to reach areas, to deliver our aid in the most remote, most dangerous areas. Sometimes you're operating in areas where the regime, where a regime is controlling access and you... Regardless of, of, of who is in access, we do our best to ensure that access is there because in the end of the day, this is how we deliver our operations. A quick example, for instance, um, Sometimes when everything else is shut down, the only way of in and out of a crisis country um, is the UN humanitarian air service or another type of um, logistical route. And it is open only for the humanitarian community plus media. We do actually let journalists come with us on humanitarian missions for this reason. It's because we believe that people need to know uh, what is going on. Um, that will affect not only our funding, but will also bring the attention to what long-term solutions are needed. Um, it will help maintain focus. Um, and I think also it's, it's a way to be accountable to the children and families that we serve, conveying their story to the world, um, demonstrating that we are there, telling their stories. I think it's, it's a powerful way to show accountability to them, to show respect also, um, to tell them that we are here, the world has not forgotten about you. And this is, as a communication officer for a UN entity, I hear that a lot. Um, I, every time I go on a field mission, including in, in the hardest areas, that's, that's something that, that, that always resonates with people. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I went on a mission into a town that had been besieged by military um, entities for months on end. Uh, what we saw are 
staggering levels of, of malnutrition, of deprivation, of humanitarian need. We went in, and I'm sorry, like, uh, when I think of this, it always affects me. So we came in with trucks of food, education supplies, psychosocial uh, experts who worked with us, um, and the traditional relief items that you see and we bring in. And I was there with a the camera, and it was really interesting to see how many people went to the doctors, to the nutritionists, and also how many people came to the camera because mm -hmm. they wanted to talk, they wanted to speak, they wanted to convey their message. It was such a powerful thing. And the other piece of information that I got from out of that mission was a lady who approached me and asked me for a lighter. And like everyone else, when someone asks for a lighter and you don't smoke, you say, sorry, I don't smoke. But then it hit me, and a colleague told me later, she doesn't smoke, probably. She just hasn't seen a lighter in months. <laughs> she needs to light up a fire to cook. And that's not really the traditional humanitarian relief item that you bring as a part of a of, uh, of, uh, of humanitarian convoy. So ultimately, what people need is, is go back to their normal lives. And while we cannot bring lighters, we cannot bring oil, heating oil, and so on, and, and those necessities that all of us enjoy every day, electricity and so on, um, these people had it. Um, it's children, families who had normal lives, they got affected by crisis, they had been forgotten for the longest time, and it is our duty and a part of our accountability to them to, to convey their messages and to bring the attention back to them. So, so I'm going to go to Faisal and then we'll go to you. Um, in our field, the word partner, right, it has a little bit of a dirty connotation, right? Mm -hmm. um, because when it comes to humanitarian work, but when it comes to humanitarian work, and Rafik is speaking so eloquently and passionately, I mean, how do you avoid you want to have the partner, you, you want to be an advocate, not an activist, but I mean, it is, how do you as an editor get the best out of a reporter and the access that you're getting? Sometimes it's not about budgets, it's about access, as, as Rafiq said. But also make sure that there, that impartiality, and you know, you're not drawing a moral equivalence, but that, that objectivity remains. Because we talked about this the other day when we were preparing for the panel. Like, you can't tell me when I'm not going out with UNICEF that I'm not, I'm not feeling as strongly and, and my emotions are not as involved as someone on the ground there. Uh, well, 100%. Look, the short answer is it's exactly the same way you choose any partner uh, in life, be it a business partner, be it a romantic partner. Um, you know, you have to choose the partner carefully. But for a, a more detailed um, uh, answer, uh, this has always been the case with, uh, with journalism. If you remember during the Iraq war, the term embedded uh, journalists came right. in. And the, uh, what the definition of embedded journalists are, um, these are a number of reporters, war correspondents, that in agreement with the US Army, for example, in mm. Afghanistan right. and Iraq, um, they report, but they give up a little bit of the control over the story uh, in return for access and protection because these are very dangerous uh, areas. Um, in the entertainment world, uh, the publicist for um, you know, a, a musician or an actress or an actor um, will exchange the, uh, the currency is the access uh, in return for favorable stories. And it really depends on the journalist or the editor's um, code of ethics and, and values to decide where to draw the line. Um, but, the, in a, but in the world of humanitarian aid, in the world of um, um, crisis such as the um, uh, earthquake, uh, there are times where we say, you know what, um, this is something that we go all out uh, on and we just declare. The, the key issue here is you have to declare and make your audience aware that this story is brought to you uh, in collaboration or thanks to access uh, by uh, UNICEF or by the Red Cross or by the Red Crescent. And as long as you do that, then you're not uh, tricking uh, your audience. Um, but of course, you need to trust uh, the partner you're dealing with. You need to have this sort of gentleman agreement 
uh, before uh, going in. And it needs, you know, if you're going to do that, you need to be ensuring that you're getting the value for your audience or your readers. Susie. So we're television people, right? And so we look at stories through visuals. And there have been multiple times in my career where I've gotten great access to something, but it hasn't been a good TV story. And the editors have kind of not been interested because it hasn't been a good TV story. And so I think there's, I think when you're coming from an organization like yours perspective, I mean, if I were in your communications shop, I would think about like what kind of, because you're competing for journalists' attention as much as you're competing for the audience's attention. So what's going to get a journalist's attention that then they can go and take it to their editor and get their editor's attention and kind of angles and stories that, that you know, maybe we haven't heard of and we haven't thought of in it, then it becomes perhaps less about necessarily partnerships but more about what kind of access do you have. I mean, earlier today I was speaking to someone who was telling me a story about how they, they'd facilitate the transfer of dead soldier bodies between Ukrainian families and Russian families. And I mean, that to me sounded, I mean, I hadn't heard that story before. And that's a visual story. Now, if that's something that, you know, editors would go for, well, if it's on the anniversary of the Ukraine invasion, then yes, maybe because they're all, you know, broadcasters are always planning big days of coverage around anniversaries. That's kind of a one a way of of covering something when you throw all of your resources on one day but then unfortunately the byproduct of that is that they pull resources for the next six months or whatever until there's another anniversary that they can justify spending money on so i think i think access is like what kind of access you're giving the journalists is really important what they're going to see how is that going to push the story forward how is it going to compel the audience and then frankly yes resources are slim but at least in my experience i always hear about how resources are slim and then somebody some some big sporting events happen and there's like <laughs> plenty of money right. to spend so right. you know it's just a food um, for thought ryan you know we've talked about how you know people are very concerned for instance in turkey and syria right now but you know the needs are going to be great for a very long time and people are going to go back to their lives in talking about what kind of coverage we can do to sustain that heightened awareness, um, you know, maybe it's promoting, as Faisal was saying earlier, how, what the consequences are for the individual audience member. You know, whether it's, you know, in Ukraine, you know, food shortages in Egypt or, you know, gas shortages in Europe, like making it making the audience feel more of a connection to the story. Oh yeah, well, we were talking about how uh, local news uh, is often considered more important by people. Um, um, maybe, maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe, you know, it's kind of understandable why somebody in Poland who speaks a dialect similar to Ukrainian uh, uh, will find that news more interesting or why someone in Saudi Arabia would find news about Syria more interesting. Um, uh, that's a question, I think, for the for the aid organizations and how they want to sort of market their um, donor campaigns. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure I heard, I heard the entire question. Uh, are we? Uh, well, how you know? How do we package? How do we sell the story? Is it oh, this person is suffering, or you know, do we do we make the the audience feel more of a connection through how it affects their own lives? Sure, yeah, there's lots of ways to find universal themes that, uh, that affect everybody, that uh, are cross-cultural. Um, stories about families, stories about children. Um, you can go for there's sports angles sometimes, entertainment angles, um, and these, these are things that uh, um, engage a broader audience that, that wouldn't necessarily want to read a, a sad story about uh, an earthquake somewhere. Um, uh, aside from that, also the you know the odd stories are, are always attract attention. I mean, there's lots of different ways to to, to find. I, I think stories that stand out, stories that that that, that seem uncommon, sometimes. Right. Right. Rafiq, what about we were talking earlier about how you package it is really going to determine 
You know, it doesn't, it, it, we, we have to get out of the breaking news component of it and more get ba back to the storytelling aspects. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mentioned it earlier when, um, when talking about the, yeah, the breaking news cycle and going into more mainstream everyday storytelling via uh, multiple channels at once. Um, but I think the, the, the breaking news is, is, is what gets a lion's share from, mm. um, of attention globally. I think these are the stories that resonate the most. So they're still fairly um, important for us to, to chase and pursue and try to package our work around the big headlines. Is it new numbers, new studies that we do um, on ongoing crisis or on recent crisis? So, and we try to, 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 to remain relevant and, and, and proactive in, uh, in coming out with those human stories as part of uh, a bigger crisis. Like, uh, COVID, for instance, was the story for two, three years worth of news cycles. Uh, and we tried to, uh, and, and I think we succeeded in, um, in, in bringing the human element of it um, quite, quite well. And that translated fairly well into um, the amount of funding that we got for uh, vaccine delivery and so on, though the issue of equity in the beginning was a bit uh, of a challenge, but I think the pressure that all of us as a, as a global community of, of media and, and humanitarian development actors, we, we actually made uh, quite a, an impact on, on addressing those inequities in the beginning. Um, but still, uh, COVID will continue to affect people on the long term. A study that we released last year with the World Bank, and this was a, a major headline, and I think everyone here covered it, was that this generation of students will lose $17 trillion in lifetime earnings due to COVID, school closures, and everything that has affected mm -hmm. uh, their, uh, their, their uh, learning. So it's, the effect of that crisis will continue forever for them. Um, but I think we, the, the other ways I think on, on packaging is, is the, the work that I mentioned, for instance, earlier on, on gaming and so on. Uh, but we talked also about celebrities and how we, we work with goodwill ambassadors um, who are from the film industry, art, sports, uh, and so on. We try to build those partnerships um, with, with the broader um, media and entertainment sector who have massive reach. Um, across uh, the world who have the power to influence not just the policy making, the politician, but also the wider public um, who can influence those in, in power, but also can take action themselves. And it's really uh, important for us also to package our stories into an action-oriented, engaging way, because information by itself will not lead to a positive outcome. It has to be associated with a strong and concrete and clear call to action, one that either uh, that policymaker that needs to make a certain decision will understand what the decision is, how to implement it, and what will be the outcome, uh, but also individuals who are reading a story on uh, a newspaper or watching it on TV or scrolling on a phone. Um, I think we have to make it really clear for them that they can play a part. So packaging that story in an engaging way helps address that uh, sh ever shortening attention span. And the cost uh, of inaction, too. Exactly. Um, Faisal, it's really easy, you know, to blame the media. You know, someone got killed because the media wasn't doing their job, or the media mm -hmm. wasn't there, or, you know, people are suffering because of the media. But, you know, there are challenges that we also spoke about, whether it's budgets or attention spans or this. But it's also a responsibility. It's also a responsibility for us to make them care. A hundred percent. And um, look, there is no uh, question about the importance that media in all its forms plays. And uh, I would ask you to take a moment to look at the flip side of that. Um, I mean, you're from the States. You remember the uh, Pizzagate a few years ago. Um, mm -hmm. where uh, a fake news story was published and as, as a result, uh, well, about uh, a pedophilia ring inside a pizza shop and then, which wasn't true, and then somebody took um, a rifle and then and shot the innocent people. Um, I remember a story that came out um, uh, in the same year uh, about uh, finding the CIA agent who uh, leaked Hillary Clinton's emails uh, killed 
Um, uh, that was a case, to, a case study that we studied. And that story, published in a, a newspaper uh, called the Denver Guardian, got more shares uh, than the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, and the New York Times combined. Now, there was uh, two problems there. First of all, the story was fake. And as an American journalist, you know that there's no such thing called the Denver Guardian. So um, what I'm trying to say is, it's very easy to set up a fake news site. It's very easy to share fake news stories. People will always click on uh, the more sensational uh, headlines. And they have real life consequences. Um, but going back to my opening remarks, this by default means that the job for us now as professional uh, responsible uh, journalist is more important uh, than than ever and if we are going uh, you know if we are going to take on the reality of this world which is artificial intelligence which is the um, um, easy spread of uh, fake news uh, then this makes uh, the job what we are doing what we are doing more important than ever the only question now is the tools so how do you compete with actually a, a supercharged engine such as the world of uh, uh, algorithms? It's definitely not with the typewriter and not with the paper print uh, anymore. Um, I think artificial intelligence, especially with the developments now with what we're seeing in ChatGPT, is going to help expedite uh, and help us do our job so that we can support uh, people working in the humanitarian field and uh, allow people to attract, pe attract uh, people's attention to uh, the just causes and the real ones. Um, um, because it's very easy now to mislead people, uh, even get them to donate to a cause that doesn't exist. R Rafiq, do you worry about or are you, or are you in, in enthused by the advent of these artificial intelligence or all of this technology? Is it a do you get lost in it, or is it going to be a tool for you? It's a really good question. And um, it's a, uh, I think it's, there's a massive opportunity there um, from a point of view that children and families who are affected by humanitarian crisis, by, by, by disasters, they're often already suffering from a massive digital divide. And we've seen this, for instance, during what I'm, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the school closures where everyone else went online, but mm. people who were living in, in humanitarian crisis were left a bit behind. Um, so now with the acceleration and democratization of this technology, um, having ways to speed up um, accessibility for everyone, there's a massive opportunity for us actually to, to get education programs wider um, to get um, into the quality of education, improving that. So I think the, the opportunities outweigh the risks here. Uh, but we have to be smart about, about it. The digital divide is a real uh, hurdle, um, not just in humanitarian response, but also towards sustainable development. Um, the key to development will and is the, uh, is, is the digital um, uh, the digital uh, economy that is that is upon us, um, and I think we have to think about it from a humanitarian point of view as well. Uh, we are working with some of the top uh, um, players in the industry, the Microsofts and the Googles and the others, uh, on learning passports and other digital platforms that we are rolling out uh, to to children and to, uh, to to students in in the most difficult humanitarian um, areas, and, and we are trying also to integrate some of that learning into their curriculum, so they're not just hearing about artificial intelligence, uh, about <laughs> all the news and, uh, and, and latest tech, but they also be part of it. Um, and, and we are seeing a huge interest. People are, are born with, with mobiles that they enhance today. Like they, mm -hmm. they, they're going straight into, into, into the mobility, into uh, the digital world. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities there. Now, what worries us is that Internet itself is still not the safest place for children, mm. um, especially those who are already vulnerable um, by poverty and, and, uh, and other risks around them. So ensuring that we keep that Internet, that digital space safe for children is, is a huge priority for us. Yeah. Um, I want to open up the floor to any questions. Does anybody have a question? Raise your hand. Anybody? Sir? We bring him a mic.
Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, discussion. I think uh, all of us uh, must accept the very important role of the media, uh, not only in highlighting uh, human tragedy and human challenges, but also what needs to be done. And in many ways, the pragmatist in me accepts that media often is about the drama because the drama is what attracts attention. But the question I will have to each of you uh, as the panelist, how can media move us from drama to inspiration, from the drama of the tragedy to the inspiration of how we can make the human condition better? Thank you very much. It's a great question. It's a great question, and I'm going to put something on top of on that. Do we want to be inspired? I mean, I, do we want to be inspired, or are we about doom and gloom? And is is that what attracts people? Rafiq, let me start with you. It is one of our guiding principles to prioritize hope in the way we package our information. Because if we communicate only about the negative side, about the state of despair that will actually discourage action, discourage people coming and lending a helping hand. So we want to show that there is hope. We want to show that there is a positive way out of any crisis. And I'm privileged to work at UNICEF, and for us it's fairly easy to do that because we want to say, look, these children, they are in the middle of a crisis. They will grow up. And, they, and this crisis will be behind them. So how can we work today to give them that chance to grow up safe, to recover from the psychological trauma, to catch up on education, to have the healthcare, to have their rights safeguarded in the middle of all of these uh, catastrophes? And how can we ensure that out of all this negativity, we can come together as a community, media, international community to, to, uh, to overcome it. And, and I think this is what the, the story ought to be uh, about hope. Uh, and we see it, I think, in, in the coverage that we all have, including in the, uh, the breaking news cycles. And we should do more of it uh, but by showing that um, in the end of the day, it's not about the crisis itself, it's about the people who are living in the middle of that crisis. Susie. Perhaps it's not necessarily about being inspired. I think inspiration is different for different people. What inspires people is different. I think maybe it's about m feeling moved. Um, and some, when, I was, when you were just speaking, I was thinking about some of the stories that I'd done that were people-focused and the audience response that I got from them. And one of them was a story that I did about Syrian refugee children. They were in the Zatari camp. And uh, I, I believe it was probably UNICEF now, actually, um, who put up a large canvas around the camp and just kind of allowed the children to express themselves through art. And it was just a simple TV package that I did for the BBC. and but it was just pictures really. And the pictures that these five-year-old children had drawn were so gut-wrenching that I, some of the response that we got from the audience was, you know, like they were moved by this one simple television piece. I mean, my series Women Building Peace, the Ethiopia episode was particularly gruesome because I had a survivor of sexual violence. And we have this show which is about kind of audience calls in and we talk about the making of the show. And one person wrote in and said that when they listened to this episode, they had to pull into the driveway because they to continue listening to it because they found it so moving. Now, was that inspiring necessarily? I mean, I don't know. I feel like you probably wouldn't say the word inspiring for that kind of story. But it is about the people. And I think people do create some sort of reaction in our audience, people's stories. I mean, one of the stories from the Turkey earthquake, Turkey and Syria earthquake, that has resonated so much is the 
baby that was found and fed and washed and well, was I think smiling. That's hope, right? That's ins right. that's inspiration, right? That's resilience. That right. is inspirational. Brian, uh, I think it's a very lofty goal to uh, have the uplifting of human imagination as uh, an objective for the media. I don't think it's ever really been a part of the traditional media objectives, uh, which are more sort of focused on shining light where it's not uh, highlighting injustices, putting information out so that, you know, it focuses on the world as it is, not as it should be. Um, huh. That's the world of editorialists, right? Um, uh, that's my view. Uh, I think that said, you can also have solution ideas in voices of analysts. I mean, when you're trying to be neutral in a news story, a written news story, uh, uh, it doesn't have normative ideas. Uh, you, 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 you can add, obviously, a voice of somebody who proposes a solution, and I think that there's a place for that for sure. Um, and, you know, there's also different areas of the media that provide uh, uh, inspiration, maybe the arts, science, uh, uh, certain uh, um, verticals. Ch what do you think? I mean, should oh, we, is I, that I, a cynical view? Or? I, no, no, I agree with Brian. L life is cruel. We need, we, need, we need to show it as it is. Life is cruel. Remember, well, last, well, no, no, wait, wait. Remember last year, the Moroccan boy that fell inside the well and that was live coverage and everybody's inspirations and, and hopes were high? Unfortunately, the boy died. That's reality. That's life. Uh, we cannot airbrush life. We cannot... We can't airbrush it, but could we... Do we have... Should we be solutions-based or should we just, you know... We can be both. We're, we're, we're not can the United, we do both? We're not the United Nations. We, we, we tell the story, we report the story. There are people whose job it is who are much better than me in finding solutions. My job is to give them a platform. Um, but again, life is cruel. If they can't find the solution, it's my job to say they couldn't find the solution. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure people were very frustrated with the World Health Organization during COVID because they simply couldn't find the solution or they couldn't tell people the reassurance they needed uh, to hear. But that's reality. Um, as I said, we cannot airbrush it. We cannot beautify it. We cannot add makeup. Uh, we cannot give Can't it a face. Can't put lipstick on a pig is no. what they say exactly. in the U.S. Sir, in front. اسمحوا لي أن أسأل باللغة العربية. أسعد الله مساءاتكم كل خير. سؤالي هو للأستاذ فيصل وللأخ رفيق ولعل إن شاء الله لما يرد على السؤال باللغة الإنجليزية يستفيد من الأطراف الآخرين أنا أعمل في المجال الخيري من 18 عام كان لدي تساؤل مهم يعني أحتاج إلى إجابة هل نحن في الوقت الراهن بحاجة إلى إعلام تنموي هذا الإعلام التنموي يحدد فيه المدخلات الإنسانية من تعاليم دين الإسلامي والممارسات التنموية ويحدد أيضا الأنشطة والممارسات حتى يخرج منه نتائج ومخرجات وأثر يعود هذا الأثر من الناحية البيئية والناحية الاجتماعية والناحية الاقتصادية التي تتوافق مع أهداف التنمية المستدامة والتوجهات العالمية وأيضا رؤية وطننا الغالي رؤية المملكة 2030 وأتمنى أسمع إجابة شكرا لكم. فيصل، do you want to start and then we'll go to Rafiq. Um, so allow me to summarize and translate the question yeah. very quickly. So uh, the gentleman, the kind gentleman here, works in humanitarian uh, aid, and he was asking, is it now the time to uh, have a specialized, uh, what he described in Arabic as developmental media, uh, which focuses on uh, humanitarian work, which um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. noble causes, uh, and uh, will that have a better impact than the traditional uh, media outlets? I, I have an answer, but maybe Rafiq wants to uh, start with the answer. Uh, first, thank you for the question. Um, I think some of these specialized outlets already exist. Uh, we have the new humanitarian that focuses on on, on humanitarian news, especially from the forgotten marginalized uh, uh, crisis. We have Relief Web, which provides um, the same type of um, services that you're, that you're mentioning. Um, 
the news and updates from the various uh, humanitarian development organizations, and they do try to link it not just to the crisis, but also to um, the outcomes uh, and the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. So, uh, but I think, will that go mainstream? Uh, I don't really know. Though some of the numbers that I saw the other day for Relief Web, they are reaching 20 million visitors a, a year. That's quite, oh, quite good for a hyper-specialized uh, news portal. But now, will it be bigger? Uh, for my case, I hope it will. And, uh, but I think also, I hope that such spe specialized uh, portals can help bring some of those top news um, go mainstream um, to, the, to the big wires, international ones, uh, and, and regional media as well. So any media outlet really um, is a, a triangle of three factors that puts it together. Uh, the audience, the content, and the advertiser or the financier of, of that outlet. So you need those three elements in any sort of media uh, operation uh, to succeed. If, you, if any of them falls, then it will not be sustainable or not be effective. Um, you know, for example, if you have great content but, and, but no audience, it's as good as nothing. Uh, if you want to create good content um, and you have an audience but you don't have the means to produce it, then it's as good as not uh, doing it. Um, so, uh, for me, regardless of if it's specialized or not specialized, um, uh, the focus should always be on uh, the principles uh, behind it. Uh, so, uh, you know, as long as the story is true, as long as you're doing your job and presenting a fair and balanced view uh, of, of the world, uh, th th that's that's what really uh, that's what really matters, and that's what's going to resonate resonate with people. My my issue with the specialized media outlets, um, um, as noble as the cause is, sometimes we get carried away, uh, and um, the issue there is it, you'll be doing the cause itself a disservice uh, if you become overzealous and uh, exaggerate uh, the facts or the harm or uh, etc so uh, this is why I, I go back to what i said which is it's the values and the professional guidelines that matter regardless if it's a general interest media outlet or a specialized media outlet mm -hmm. um i think we have time for one more question over here in the with the, in the green yes Hi all, thank you very much. I have a question and we spoke about uh, technology and how it presents massive opportunities on ground. And uh, from a perspective on development, have we considered that maybe the advancements in technologies that is happening on ground may add to the inequality somehow? Because when we focus on the, the when we leverage only on the opportunities that tech provides, sometimes we overlook do you guys have any plans or ways to mitigate that risk of adding it to the inequality? Same applies to journalism. And with advancements in technologies and stuff, do you see any risks and on how that affects the story that you guys tell? Susan. I mean, I, I think that this is already a problem that we're seeing that's quite unfortunate. And I'm speaking on my personal opinion for this. Um, BBC Arabic Radio has just closed, which is a huge blow for the region um, because, you know, a very large population relies on that and that kind of, that kind of makes the assumption that a large part of the population is going to get this news that they would get from the traditional radio channel elsewhere in a digital form, which we can't make that assumption. That's not necessarily the case. Um, so I, I, I think it is an issue, and I think it is an issue that needs attention. Brian. Yeah, I would say technology has helped in some instances, like you know, mo mobile phones, for example. Um, more people in developing countries have mobile phones and, and can access information that way than could uh, via newspapers or magazines in the past. That said, the most... Uh, um, the easiest form of communication in, for, in terms of news has been radio because that reaches uh, a crowd without uh, uh, having to have any expensive technology. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, the uh, technology uh, advancement. Okay, um, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, thank you to KS Relief, thank you to my panel, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. and, and 
I think we all agree that these type of stories um, are needed. I think w these partnerships are important. I think there are these new technologies that we need to embrace. And we need to go that extra mile in not just covering the breaking news when it happens in the immediacy of a crisis, but continue to find new, different, and evolving ways to not just cover the people affected by the story, but the consequences of inaction for those that are watching the story. Thank you very much.